In less than a minute, the first polls will close across New South Wales and counting will get underway to determine if Premier Dominic Perrottet will win a historic fourth term for the coalition or whether New South Wales is in for a change. The Perrottet leads a minority government wounded by factional fight, ministerial departures and the loss of popular Premier Gladys Berejiklian. If the polls are to be believed, Chris Minns and his Labour Party are ahead, but it's less clear if it's enough to win a majority of seats or if the leader of the state will be picked by those on the crossbench, a group that may well expand tonight. Our chief election analyst, Anthony Green, is standing by, ready to help you understand the results as they come in, booth by booth, from across the state. We have reporters monitoring all the key contests too. They'll bring you analysis from the seats that will help decide tonight's result. Live from the ABC Election Centre in Sydney, I'm David Spears. And I'm Sarah Ferguson. Welcome to New South Wales Votes. Just gone 6 p.m. in New South Wales, which means that most polling places across the state have closed and the vote, vote count is getting underway. Now, if the opinion polls and political history are any guide, the coalition is facing an uphill battle to win a fourth term. But Labor's pathway to a majority is far from assured. So strap yourselves in at home, it's going to be a <laughs> fascinating night. To set the scene like only he can, let's begin with the ABC's chief election analyst, Anthony Green. Anthony, you're going to be a very busy man tonight. Yeah, it's 32 years since my first New South Wales election in the old showgrounds. <laughs> wow. In your park, so. have a cake. <laughs> yeah, you used to go outside, but yeah. Anyway, um, on to this election. Uh, this is the Chamber, the Legislative Assembly of the uh, New South Wales Parliament. Let's look at our starting position for this election, which is taking account of redistributions and by-elections. We're saying the coalition has 30, uh, 46 seats, so they're one seat short of a majority. The Labor Party has 38, the Greens three, and the six independents on the crossbench. You need 47 seats for government. The task for the, uh, for the current government is it has to actually win seats to stay in office or get a good deal with the crossbench. Labor, needs nine seats majority in our government in its own right, about five for more seats than the, co the, co the coalition. And if it gets six seats, there's the chance of forming government with the Greens in the balance of power. But so there's a lot of possibilities tonight. We'll wait and see what the numbers unfold. 47, that magic number, Anthony, thank you very much for that. We've also got two of the most experienced politicians in the state with us on the panel this evening. The Treasurer and Deputy Liberal Leader, Matt Keane, good evening to you. G'day. And Labor's leader in the Upper House, Penny Sharp, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Matt Keane, just early expectations. How are you feeling about tonight? Is there really a path to victory? There's certainly a path to victory. I think the Premier and the team have run a good campaign. The Premier is a Premier for Western Sydney and um, my focus has been on the teal seats, obviously. So if we can hold real estate in Sydney's West and also protect uh, sort of the traditional heartland, uh, that is the path to victory for it. So it's about limiting losses in Sydney's West. And Penny Sharp, we saw the polls in the final 24 hours or so improve for Labor. Was it your sense that Labor's chances lifted in the final stage of the campaign? I'm very um, superstitious about these things. I won't <laughs> believe anything until we start seeing some numbers come in. But the big issue for us tonight is we, I, we actually need to win 11 seats. There's, you know, there's two seats there, Leppington and Heathcote, that we're not putting automatically into our, um, into our win columns. So no, notionally. Notionally Labor, but yes, we've got sort of 11 seats. Not in the bag yet. Till I've seen some of those figures, we won't be doing that. Yeah. We need to understand Labor's only won from opposition twice since World mm. War II. We've got four seats under 5% including Goulburn, which we haven't heard, we haven't held since the 60s, and Upper Hunter, which we have never held. And there's, of course, there's Penrith with Stuart Ayres, a very popular local member there. So we think it's a really tough task for us tonight. We're going to be going to all of those seats throughout the evening. The ABC state political reporter, Ashley Raper, is also here to help us make sense of the results. Uh, Ash, you've been following this campaign from day one. Um, you, you know what both sides have been pitching to voters. What has really 
cut through has really hit the minds of voters, do you think? Well, this has been a very long campaign, and Penny, I blame Labor for that. You came out very <laughs> early. 4th of January. Oh, yes. 4th of January. <laughs> and so, look, this has made it a marathon, and I think it's been hard for both sides to maintain momentum and then engage voters. I think for Labor, you have got cut through on the anti-privatisation theme, so much so that, that the Premier changed his economic plan. and of a lifetime, gone. <laughs> yes, and they ruled out further sale of assets uh, in the next term of government. I think for, for the Liberals, it was the Kids Future Fund that you announced at your launch two weeks out. Like it all or not, and it got mixed reviews, it did capture uh, the attention of the electorate. And policy, has this been a policy campaign? There have been some very interesting policies put forward, but it has been quite a lacklustre ca campaign. And I think a lot of these policies haven't sort of sh shone through and had a proper discussion. There has been discussion around privatisation, gambling reform, the, the public sector wages cap and the merits of that. But there have been some big announcements that I think have been missed. Labor's state-owned uh, energy corporation. Yeah. And I think for the Liberals, a lot of your big policies had already been announced, the stamp duty changes, uh, the universal pre-kindergarten year. And it, then there were some own goals from both sides. Labor, you lost some candidates quite publicly. The, the Liberals, you had some very public and messy fights publicly. And it made it quite hard for a consistent message overall for, for both campaigns. And that they really didn't have that message, you know, you didn't home in on that till, till really the final days of the campaign. Ashley, thank you. Let's introduce you now to our big board tonight and the big man driving it, Jeremy Fernandez. Uh, Jess, you've somehow ended up with a bigger <laughs> screen than Anthony Green. I know, it's pretty exciting, isn't it? Look, welcome to the big board. And if this is giving you tally room vibes, good. That's what it's meant to do. This is a visual representation of all 93 seats that make up the lower house, the Legislative Assembly of the New South Wales Parliament, colour-coded according to which party, or which individual holds it. So the dark green here, that's the Nationals. The blue for the Liberal Party. On this side of the board, it's the Reds, the Labor Party. And then in the middle, this is the crossbench. The Independents coloured in grey and the Greens in light green. Now, let's talk you through how we've sorted the board. Firstly, important to note, we've accounted for all the distributions, redistributions and defections that have taken place over the last four years. Now, the safest seats are on the furthest ends of the board. So Northern Tableland, safest for the coalition. And on this end, it's Walls End, safest for Labor. As we get towards the middle of the board, we find the most marginal seats. Let's talk about the four that are sitting on a margin of less than 1%. Labor's got one of these, Colgara, on a margin of 0.1%. This is Chris Min's seat. The coalition has Penrith, Upper Hunter and East Hills all sitting on a margin of less than 1%. So that could become crucial as the night goes on. Now, for most of the night, we're going to colour this side of the board blue. Treat the coalition as it is, one team. Let's clear the board and show you how the count will start. At this point, we haven't got any results yet nothing to colour in. But as the numbers start coming through, we'll see these being coloured in according to which party has won that seat. So if Dominic Perrottet is having a good night, he will want to hang on to all these seats and make some incursions onto the crossbench or the Labor side of the board. Conversely, Labor will need to gain an extra 9 to 11 seats, according to what Penny says, to, um, to, to make gains and to form majority government. So obviously this is a big lift for Labor. It needs to gain quite a number of seats in order to form majority government. Let's bring in Cos Samaras and Tony Barry. Cos is a former Labor strategist with Redbridge. Tony Barry, a Liberal Party strategist, also with Redbridge. Cos, how good easy is this job for the Labor Party tonight? Not easy at all. Um, <clears throat> basically, the Labor Party has to secure seats uh, that have a median, median uh, household price of around $2 million, uh, um, per suburb. So basically, they will need to secure seats that other state branches, Labor state branches around the country, don't uh, hold or have never held. Uh, and, the, and Sydney's property market has not made it any easy either. So the trench they need to climb is quite significant. And it's, it's just reinforcing the point that Penny made. But renters will play a big role, Absolutely. we think, in this campaign, right? Yeah, and it's, it is their hope. So seats like Parramatta, for example, where uh, there are significant numbers of renters, uh, seats like Ryde, uh, and, and I mentioned Dremoyne, Dremoyne as well, 
those seats Labor will be looking at picking up tonight off the back of that cohort, that particular constituency that is now renting in Sydney, and that number is growing. They are the biggest uh, dwelling type in the in this in the city, and so uh, they're the seats are going to be hoped to uh, secure in tonight. Tony Barry, this is the last mainland coalition government in New South Wales. Bad result in Victoria, a change of government federally as well. How's the task looking for the coalition tonight to hang on to power? Well, the New South Wales Liberal brand is, is certainly far more better than the, the other state divisions. Um, and hopefully we'll see that tonight again. Uh, but the electoral arithmetic is going to be very, very hard for the Liberal Party. It's uh, 47 seats to win. It's starting at 46, so it's already underwater. And added to that, it's a 12-year-old government asking for 16. Uh, so there's a bit, of a bit of a mood for change out there. Not a latent mood for change, but a bit of a mood for change. Then you've got Mark Latham playing the, the politics of grievance. Uh, in, in, you know, because of the cost of living pressures that people are feeling right now. In seats so like hurting. Penrith. Yeah, and a lot of the western suburbs yep. seats, there's a real centre of gravity there. And then you've got 12 coalition incumbents who are, uh, are not recontesting and the value of incumbency is significant. You know, it can be two, three, four points per seat if they've worked it hard. So that's another disadvantage for the Liberal Party there. So there's quite a few things working against it to, to win tonight. It would be an extraordinary win, um, but, uh, you know, uh, the old saying that, you know, you, the, the Warren Buffett saying that, you know, you sort of you, you never know who's swinging nude until the tide goes out. <laughs> we might just catch that a bit later on tonight. <laughs> Tony Cos, great to have you back for another round of election coverage. We'll touch base with you during the evening. Sarah and Spearsy. Thank you very much. Let's bring in our reporters, Rani Heyman and Kamin Gok now. Rani, you're at the Liberal function in Sydney's CBD, where later tonight the Premier will address the party faithful. Are the Liberals you've been talking to optimistic? What's the mood there? That depends on who you talk to, Sarah. <laughs> Generally, during private discussions uh, throughout the week that I've had with Liberal Party members, there is a sense of pessimism as opposed to optimism heading into this election. We have heard privately that some members of the Liberal Party do believe that reaching a, a majority government is likely out of reach, but they do hold hope that they could potentially uh, form a minority government. Now, the most telling thing has been where we've seen the leader of the Liberal Party, the Premier Dominic Perrottet, travelling to throughout this entire week. He's gone to predominantly Liberal held seats. He is defending these seats. He wants to hold on to them. And most of those, uh, we've gone down to the South Coast in Goulburn. We've also gone throughout Sydney. And particularly while he has put focus on seats like Penrith in Western Sydney, Southwest, marginal seats like East Hills, he's also been concentrating on Northern Sydney. Now, there are a few seats there that are held by the Liberal Party but are being challenged by independents. And while we likely won't see what we've seen during the federal election, even if the Liberal Party does lose one or two of those seats, it could have an impact. Now, as you can see behind me, there is no one here at this function just yet, but we do know that from seven o'clock, people will start coming into this room, Liberal Party faithful, those who've been on the booths all day today trying to get those votes through and extra votes over the line. Uh, we do know that the Premier Dominic Perrottet has been at his home in Beecroft with his family, his wife and seven children this afternoon. We're expecting to see him here sometime after 7.30, but he has been labelled by a number of people throughout the Liberal Party as an underdog going into this election. But as we know, and as Anthony Green knows very well, uh, these elections are extremely hard to predict, so we'll just have to wait and see how things go. And Cayman Gok is over at Brighton La Sands uh, for the Labor function tonight. Similarly, empty room at this stage, <laughs> uh, Cayman. But from those you've been talking to, are they expecting to see Chris Minns declaring victory on that stage behind you a little later tonight? Well, David doesn't quietly confident just to depict the scenario right now because there's certainly no noise coming here, but there is this cautious optimism within the Labor Party. Uh, but make no mistake, this will be no easy feat for Labor to do. As Penny mentioned, uh, well, as uh, Anthony mentioned, nine seats, but notionally 11 they need to claim. And since World War II, they've only reclaimed government twice uh, from the Rand government in 1976 and Bob Carr's in 1995. And they only had a one-seat majority. Never from opposition have they needed to win this many seats. Now, people within the party I've spoken to today who've been out on the polls, uh, out in the booths, and some of them in those marginal Western Sydney seats have said they've received a positive response, in, particularly in seats like Parramatta. However, 
They're very hesitant to make any drastic claims. Uh, they say they're still scarred from the federal election in 2019, where the polls suggested Labor would claim government, uh, but that didn't eventuate. There are people within this party that believe tonight they can form a minority government. Uh, they've stopped short at declaring a majority because they say it's just been a tight contest over the last few months, and they haven't seen that anger to throw out the coalition government. They're also conscious of the number of pre-polls that have gone in, and that then they're unsure how that may impact those those marginal seats. Uh, many, they're, they're also com uh there's also been an extremely long campaign, as Ash mentioned. I remember the day after New Year's Day, Chris Minns came out at a press conference and that campaign has now gone for three long months. He's been traversing through seats across the state and the campaign has really ramped up in this last week. Now, in 2011, Labor was decimated in that election and they've been in opposition now for 12 years. So if they do win tonight, it will undoubtedly be an emotional victory. David? Oh. Cayman, thank you. Cayman, thanks. Look forward to talking to you later on. Let's bring our panel in and starting with you, Matt Keane. Obviously, that is the big number. You've been in power for a very long time. Yeah. Can you do anything to defeat the it's time factor? Well, it would be an historic uh, victory because mm. it's never happened before. No coalition government has won four terms in the history of New South Wales. Mm. So fighting uh, the tide of history is like fighting gravity. The uh, deck is stacked against us here. Um, so it is going to be... Mount Everest to climb. You've also, I mean, you've also got the fact that a number of your own people are leaving, a large, larger number than usual of front benches. They look a bit like they're, they're voting with their feet themselves. Why would the voters pick your side if your own people are on the way out? Well, I think the challenge for us was to present ourselves as a new government, mm -hmm. not the uh, reiteration of a 12-year government. So Lots of reasons for that, right? Uh, indeed. So the challenge for Don Perrottet mm. as Premier and the team was to try and present a new face of the Liberal Party. Mm. A number of those people retiring were there since the, the O'Farrell government was elected in 2011. So um, that, there is always generational change, mm. uh, whether we were able to project that to the community will be seen tonight. Can I just pick up on what you're talking about there, trying to project a new face, a new government after a long time in government. Was it also a conscious decision, and you can talk freely now the polls have uh, closed, <laughs> um, was it also a conscious decision for you and, and Dominic Perrottet to present a more progressive Liberal brand to the electorate, looking at what was happening to the Morrison government at the time, the threat of the Teal independence, Was because it, it's clearly happened. Just tell us the thinking around how you approached the leadership roles. Well, I think when Gladys Berejiklian left, we had to show that we were a new government with new ideas. And Dominic Perrottet and I had come up through the party system together. Uh, we worked very closely together in our respective roles as MPs and ministers. So the opportunity to put uh, his stamp on the government, uh, the first one we really had was the budget. And we really tried to uh, demonstrate that we had fresh ideas. That's why we- uh, And he was viewed as a conservative guy, right? So did you have to address that? I'm just trying to get to your thinking around how to position yourselves? I think that Dom was very conscious of how he would be framed in the public domain. So um, yes, uh, there had been talk that he was a conservative, but I've known him for 20 years and I've known him to be a very pragmatic liberal. Um, so I think getting that message across has been the challenge that we're facing. Can I, can I put that to Penny Sharp? Because I wonder if Dominic Perrottet took you a little bit by surprise, the degree to which he showed himself to be agile and particularly during the campaign, but he showed himself not to be the figure that he had painted to be. I think um, that there was a very close attention to concerns about um, his social conservatism. Mm. And as a result, I think that that wasn't, that wasn't shown um, so much. And, and, it, and they weren't key issues that really came up a lot during the campaign as well. But so it did, make it, did it make it harder for you to, to plan the campaign? No, I don't think so. That we were always running on um, the issue around privatisation and the essential services. They are really the story of this campaign, um, you know, we know we felt that that was right when we saw people coming in today, you know, today and over the week talking about our issues. Coming back to where Sarah began there with, with Matt Keane, this is a 12 year old government. It's had a lot of ministerial departures, you know, ministers heading for the exits, had a whole string of scandals. I mean, this is really an election Labor should be able to win, right? 
Look, I think, as we've said before, 11 seats to win, mm. seats that, you know, seats on the margins of between 5 and 11 per cent, you know, that's a big ask for anyone. We're just very conscious of history. I think there is the 12 years. Um, they've tried very hard and Matt, Matt tried very hard to be a new government. But after 12 years, you own all of the things that are not fixed. Mm. Which is what I'm saying. Is if you can't win in this environment at this point, after three long terms in opposition, what's the point, right? Well, we went very seriously and, and look, Chris really stepped up when he became the leader. He was became very focused. He pulled together a team that's very united. I've never I've been the Labor Party since I was nineteen years old. I've been in Parliament for seventeen years. I've never seen the united and focused purpose that Chris was able to build in our team, which I think really helped. Ashley, I want to bring you in here too, because it was such an interesting term in that you really <coughs> had this reset of both Chris Minns coming in as as mm. leader. And Dominic Perrottet, along with Matt Keane coming in as leader and deputy on the Liberal side, how did that change the game? Oh, it changed it dramatically, especially, I think, Chris Minns came in just before Gladys Berejiklian uh, was forced to resign under the corruption cloud and those ICAC findings haven't, haven't been delivered yet. And so I think, look, it gave Labor a bit of a bounce, thinking that they wouldn't have to go up against Gladys Berejiklian and against Dominic Perrottet. But, but I think Dominic Perrottet's leadership in the Perrottet government was surprising um, in, in the issues that they tackled. The budget that Matt handed down had a, had a, had a whim, woman focus. Look, it took them a number of years in government to, to work out that, that there were certain women's issues that did need to be addressed, Matt. Um, but, but it was a good budget and it was well received in terms of the childcare issues and, and setting up your eco economic task force. So it, it did look like for that, that reset from the budget really gave you some good momentum going in. And then it was really uh, up to Labor to work out how they're going to address that and, and go into that campaign. And look, Labor has run a very disciplined campaign uh, for all the problems they, they were dealt with very quickly, the, the few problems that you had. And, it, and, and you said about early with the education message and then anti-privatisation, the wages, the essential services. And, and no matter what was happening and whether there was the, the gambling discussion, you, you stuck to your line. We'll see if it pays off tonight. Ash, thank you very much indeed. We'll be coming back to, I think, probably all of those points in some <laughs> town. But for now, we've got Lydia Feng is in the southern suburbs around the electorates of East Hills, a very important one, also Holsworthy and Oakley, mm. and the Labour leader's seat, of course, of Cogra. Lydia, you're starting in East Hills. Tell us a little bit about that area and why it's important. Well, Sarah, East Hills is the government's most marginal seat. It sits on a razor-sharp margin of just 0.1%. And in a sign of just how hungry both sides are to win this electorate, the Premier Dominic Perrottet and the opposition leader Chris Minns were out at voting booths in this electorate this morning trying to win voters, um, votes in a last-minute effort. Now, East Hills sits on the northern side of the Georges River and encompasses suburbs such as Panania and Padstow. And it has been a very, it was a very safe Labor seat for many decades until 2011 when the coalition swept to power. It was then able to snatch this seat from Labor and has retained it ever since. Like most voters across the state, the number one issue for residents here in East Hills is cost of living. Everything from toll roads to house prices to even the cost of fuel is front of mind as many of them cast their votes at the ballot box today. For us, it's it's a lot about the elderly and, and what uh, we find that uh, supports them and yeah, that's usually what we try to do at the moment. So. Oh, I haven't really even thought about it. The tolls, cost of living, it's just crazy. The tolls, we start up with, that was a good thing and that was for Labor. So, yeah. It's been Liberal for a very long time. Um, I don't know. I, it, it is very close. I haven't seen anything that would change the minds of most people one way or the other. It's been a very quiet campaign. Yeah, so Labor is seeing this as a must-win seat for them. They are determined to flip this blue seat red, and they think that they will be able to do so with their candidate, Kylie Wilkinson. But she faces fierce competition with the Liberal candidate, Wendy Lindsay, who is well-liked in the community. On top of that, the Liberals did well here in the federal election last year, so it certainly won't be a walk in the park for either party, Sarah. 
uh, Anthony, I think you've got some figures for us. Something's, something's happening. Uh, something. <laughs> Look, uh, something. I'm always excited when I see first figures um, <laughs> because it means the numbers are coming in. This is Clarence. Uh, I haven't looked what polling place it's from, but this is a, a, a seat we'll come back to later. But this is just to say, I haven't had a sense to really analyse this. Let's look at the two-party preferred swing here. It's a 5.4% swing to the National Party. Uh, I suspect that's not very meaningful at this stage. And uh, the other seat was just Coogee, where we got a small mm. external booth in Bondi, which is actually in the nature of all clues and has just come through. Um, let's, I'm not sure we'll get a swing out of this one. 0.7% swing to the Liberal Party. These are just tiny, tiny numbers. Most of them are external booze at this moment. But uh, the great relief I always have at this time of night <laughs> is when the first figures arrive. It's like a it's proof working. of life. It's <laughs> working, it's working. Technology is working. <laughs> now, when we were talking, listening to Lydia just now, Matt Keane here was hunched over his phone, so I think he's got something to tell us. What's going on? Yes, yeah, Sarah, our scrutineers have just told us mm -hmm. that the Electoral Commission's advised that the two big early voting centres in Penrith, EMU Plains, and also the Penrith Paceway won't be counted to Tonight. Now, that's 25% of the vote of Penrith that won't be counted tonight. So if things are looking tight, then we won't know the result in Penrith what? for a while. What's the reason for that? What's, did they give you a reason? Uh, no reason. The Electoral Commission has said we're not counting those two big early voting centres. But what does that, the, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, does that mean a functional thing? Oh, actually, we've got, yeah, we've got Mr Green answer. waving. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, um, what's happening? The Electoral Commission has... Uh, lit, released a list last night of all the polling places, the pre-polls they're counting. In Penrith, they're counting the Penrith Early Voting Centre. And in most districts, they're only counting one. Uh, they, they have difficulty getting staff. They have difficulty not having enough big enough offices. So they just there's no way they could count all the pre-poll voting centres. They are stopping counting at 10.30. So they announced initially which ones. Um, Penrith Early Voting has got about 7,500 votes. Mm -hmm. So that's going to take a while to count. And they couldn't count one of the other ones. So it's, it's not just Penrith. It was, it was the decision made yesterday. But is that about, what did you say, 25% of the early vote yeah. count in that, in that seat, Anthony? Does that sound about right? Yeah, um, look, uh, I can't remember the exact figure for Penrith, but there's been a high pre-poll in that district. Right. Now, hopefully, because we know which sensors are coming in, it helps us get a good understanding of what's happening. But uh, it's, uh, it will be that we will not get a huge count tonight because mm. only some of the pre-polls will be counted. That's, uh, that's one of the seats that we wanted to see resolved. Yeah. No, exactly. Uh, we saw East Hills um, earlier there with Lydia. I had um, uh, someone in the Liberal Party sending me messages just a little <coughs> earlier, Matt, saying they're a bit worried about East Hills. Mm. Very marginal, uh, obviously. The booths where you'd normally be you know, getting in the high 50s, you're just nowhere near that. Yeah, well, I mean, that is uh, the most marginal seat on our side of the column. Um, again, you, you know, we're fighting history. Yeah. Uh, you saw a news poll this morning that said mm. that there's a swing on right across the board. Do you believe that? Um, well, I was surprised by that, uh, the size of the swing. But, um, you know, again, uh, the Premier has run a very good campaign. He's been working relentlessly. He's had big ideas. Um, but again, we'll wait to see as the results come through. All right, we will. Uh, and now our reporter, Nabil Al-Nashar, is covering some of the key seats in Sydney's western suburbs tonight. Nabil, the plan was for you to be on a train. Uh, tell us you're not on the train, you're on the platform. By the train. That's right, David. We were meant to be on the T1 line coming right here from Parramatta to Penrith. Uh, two of the biggest electorates uh, that could absolutely determine the outcome of tonight's election. Uh, but unfortunately, due to major delays that we've just heard, uh, there are no trains coming in or out of the station. Only two trains managed to pass through uh, over the last 40 minutes or so. On the platform across from me over there, there were hundreds of commuters stranded for at least 30 minutes trying to catch a train to the city. We're still stranded on this platform trying to catch a train to Penrith. Now, this is one of the major issues that are definitely on the minds of voters as they were going to the voting booths this morning to cast their votes. Transportation. Uh, there's huge pressure on whoever's going to form the next government to deliver cheap and reliable public transport. Reliable being the key word here, uh, and it's been anything but. Not today, not earlier this month, when a digital uh, radio communication system failure caused delays and stranded hundreds, if not thousands, of commuters uh, through a system-wide network failure. Uh, and, of course, we can't forget about the row between the rail, tram and bus union and the Parité government that led to strikes and further delays and disruptions. Now, people in Western Sydney rely on this lifeline uh, to get in and out of the city, to get in and out of work. And as these suburbs continue to grow over the next 10 years, there's going to be more pressure uh, for better 
uh, systems. And you can bet your bottom dollars uh, that both teams, Labour and Liberal, know this. Chris Minns says he wants to replace the entire Tangara fleet uh, right here in New South Wales. He wants to build it here, says it will create a thousand jobs uh, and it will reduce costs for the state. Dominic Perrottet just announced a cap on Opal cards from $50 down to $40 uh, and for concession card holders from $25 to $20. So they're aware of these issues. In addition, of course, to both camps have promised uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for case studies uh, to look at the metro lines that will connect various suburbs and regions in western Sydney uh, to the Aerotropolis, to the Nancy Bird Walton uh, new airport that's still under construction. More locally, there's the, yeah, there, there's a lot going on here. It's a bit going on. You can see the passengers don't look terribly thrilled about the situation they're in tonight there. Uh, Nabil, look, we hope you do get a ride eventually uh, tonight. Look, thank you. We will come back to you. Yeah, look, uh, Nabil touches there, Penny, uh, on um, what was an issue uh, during the last few weeks. I mean, this disruption tonight, presumably too late to um, change the votes of people affected, but some of those earlier ones did. Can Labor really tell um, the people of New South Wales that you'll be able to fix all the train problems? Look, I think we've been very clear about it. The failures here, though, are great. I mean, we've had light rail that's cracked and was off the road for, you know, off the tracks for, for 12 months. We've got the ferries that are still breaking down and we've got the trains and the on-time running is the worst it's been in, in about 12 years. None of this will happen if Labor wins? It's a tough gig in terms of dealing with transport, but our focus very much is getting the trains to run on time, going back to that local manufacturing, building up the jobs and the skills of the network. We're really concerned that the government's, you know, outsourced too much and we want to bring that, into, bring, bring that back into um, the way in which we deliver services and to make sure that people can get to work on time. Matt, Matt Keane, what, <laughs> what was your honest reaction when you heard yeah. the, um, the train disruptions during the campaign? Give us an insight. How did you how did you react? Well, it was devastating because I mean the reality is these things happen regardless of who's in power, and it happened at a time when everyone mm. was starting to focus in on uh, who they were going to vote for at the election. So uh, it wasn't helpful. Uh, but these things do happen. I mean that's why we're building new metro lines, and in fact Labor are cancelling two of the ones. Um, these are important projects. We need to get on with building things, and they're all at risk. You don't have the money for those yeah, in your metro lines. I, yes, I think that was that's. That sounded suspiciously like a line to me, and we did agree that we were going to steer away from lines. But there is an <laughs> irony here, isn't there, which is that your pitch has been about infrastructure and about the future, but you're getting caught here on the, the management difficulties of, of running trains. Well, I think, as I said, this, these things happen mm. regardless of who's in power. I mean, there wasn't industrial activity. There wasn't, uh, there, there, there wasn't anything that, that caused it. It was just, uh, you know, a system uh, function. These things happen from time to time. Is that a good enough answer, these things happen? No, I don't think so. When you know, when almost all of the purchases are falling apart, I think it tells you there's a much bigger problem here. But I also want to make a point about privatisation of the buses. One of the stories that we were told when I was up at Ride Pre Poll earlier this week was a woman who was in tears because her bus service had been cancelled and she never knew and she sat waiting for a bus one day and actually lost her job because the bus never came. And I think that those kind of stories are the types of things that people remember. And when you have a catastrophe where it all falls down, everyone remembers all of the bad things that, have ha that they've experienced. We're going, to see, we're going to see some of that coming through, obviously, in the um, North Sydney seats where buses have been a huge issue all the way up to the uh, yeah. top of the peninsula. And we'll see. Now, Isabel Rowe is on Sydney's northern beaches covering Manly, mm. Willoughby, North Shore and Pittwater tonight. <laughs> Isabel, you're in Manly right now. Could there be a teal wave across the region this evening? Well, not as big a swell, if you like, David, um, as compared to the federal election last year. Uh, but there has been a real surge towards the independent movement in this part of the world. This is real Liberal Party stronghold, but we're watching seats tonight like Pittwater, North Shore, Lane Cove, Willoughby. They are all under threat from so-called teals. Now, we're thinking that North Shore is probably the best chance for the independents. That seat is held by Helen, uh, is uh, being challenged challenged by Helen Conway uh, and the Felicity Wilson uh, is the Liberal member who is in that seat. Now um, there is also a couple of senior Liberal MPs uh, retiring from this part of the world. Uh, Brad Hazard is leaving uh, his seat in Wakehurst and in Pittwater, Rob Stokes, the planning minister, is leaving as well. Uh, so that does leave um, some big names and some holes to fill. In Manly, the people I've spoken to this evening are still largely supporting the Liberal Party, but there are some people who are saying that they'd like to try something new.
I like uh, the Premier's policy about pokey machines and uh, the card system. I think pokies ruin a lot of lives. So that was mainly my main decision. Too much, you know, vote for the water rat, vote for the koala, you know, people in suits and stuff. So Liberal being an old, I like the local candidate, he's a good fella. And it's going to be a close one, I think. Um, good, solid economy. Um, I guess, you know, there's been a lot of talk around the area of the buses and the issues that people have been having with transport. So that's obviously really super important for the people up here. I went independent because the things that I'm interested in are, are uh, the things that matter to, to our local candidate. The big question, of course, is if any of these independents are elected, who will they support for a minority government? And, of course, most of them, or all of them, have said that they're not picking any sides yet. They will be uh, asking people to put their best offers on the table and see what is in it for them and their communities. Isabel, thank you very much indeed. I want to go straight to Matt Keane because, of course, this raises the very important question of the Teals and the independents with huge ramifications for federal politics. Have you done enough to secure those seats from the, indep the, the appeal of the independents and the Teals? Well, we'll soon find out, but the strategy was to take a lot of those issues off the table before the campaign started, mm -hmm. whether it be climate, energy, things like that. You notice in the campaign proper, we weren't talking about those issues because we were focusing on the core equity of the Liberal and national brand, which mm -hmm. is the economy. So from January to election day. It was all about the economy. So hopefully uh, the work we've done on childcare, early uh, preschool education, uh, uh, energy policy, um, and also uh, obviously the environment and climate change, hopefully that will be enough to be a bulwark against the teal onslaught in the Northern Beaches. And, and can I just jump in there? Yes. Just because, just looking though at candidate selection, you had Brad Hazard retiring in Wakehurst, you had yep. Rob Stokes retiring in Pittwater. You had an opportunity to pre-select women into those seats. You failed to do that. And as a result, you have for the whole Northern Beaches, the whole peninsula, from Manly with James Griffin, the Environment Minister, up, up to Palm Beach. It's wall-to-wall -wall young men. Yeah, well, um, again, one of the challenges we face as an organisation is how we can better reflect the communities we're looking to serve. I was obviously a very vocal proponent of uh, providing a pathway for talented women to be our representatives but these were, in the number as, of seats. As Ashley points out so clearly, this was your opportunity to do it and you failed. It certainly was. So it's a great challenge that we have in ensuring that the membership and the party structures mm. are able to deliver the results that uh, the community wants to see. I know the Premier was uh, one of the driving forces trying to get more female representation, particularly uh, so in Sydney what, Northern what went, Suburbs. Wrong? Yeah. Suburbs. Why can't you deliver that? Mm. Well, I think it's about ensuring that our party structures, our membership are buying into the challenges that we're facing so at the macro level. Is it a problem? It's a problem with the membership. No, no, I think there are a number of factors. I mm -hmm. think the structures of the party are not as agile as they could otherwise be. So by uh, that, do you mean the members shouldn't get the final say. There should be no, more no, scope no. for the Premier Definite, to make a call? Definitely not. Definitely what not. What are you saying? What I'm saying is that the party infrastructure uh, is not as agile as it needs to be to mean? respond to some of these things. <laughs> so in, in terms of pre-selection process, it's a bit of an arcane process. You know, there's you've got to be a member for a certain amount of time. The Teal movement, for example, has sort of community primary where it gets like-minded mm. supporters. So people are able to participate in the organisation without signing a membership form and going to a meeting at a drafty scout hall. So we need to be thinking about how we're going to better reflect the mood of the communities and Liberal voters in seats. But that's you, something I think we'll be if you, working through. If you, Matt Keane and Dominic Perrottet can't do it, given, as you were saying before, that you had set off on this somewhat progressive journey, then can the Liberal Party do it anywhere? Yes, I think, I think that we can, and I think that we want to, and it requires leadership. Mm. And I know that Dominic Perrottet was very strong on that, um, but, uh, you know, and our membership also is moving that direction. So we just need to make sure that our party structures are more agile and better reflective of uh, the mood in local communities. And do you, sorry, I was just going to yeah. say, do you think that you've done enough to, have you done enough to hold back the teals in a way that can teach something to the Federal Liberal Party? Well, we'll soon find out. Mm. I mean, this is a big challenge. And the, the big challenge for us is that we're sort of, our vote is being triangulated. You've got One Nation to the right, yes. and you've got the teals uh, to the centre, if you like. And um, 
you know, if we move too far one way, uh, like it presents yeah. challenges. How, how so, hard is that to fight on two flanks at the same time? Well, we saw at the federal level, mm. it was very, very hard. I mm. mean, um, uh, there we uh, got wiped out in the so-called teal seats. Uh, I'm not calling them teal seats. I call them the Liberal heartland. And we also lost to Western Sydney. So mm. we'll see if we got the balance better tonight. See how that squeeze feels in a couple of hours <laughs> uh, squeeze. from now. We'll the David check in. Spears squeeze. In fact, we've got a couple of uh, uh, further results coming in. And yeah, look, this is just to illustrate <coughs> how <coughs> patchy early figures are. This is the election of Riverston. Just to explain, Kevin Connolly has been the member since 2011. He won with a 30% swing. It was the first time the Liberals had ever won the seat. They've held it for three elections since he's retiring. Mohit Kumar's a police prosecutor, is a new Liberal candidate. Warren Kirby runs a big photography business out in West northwestern Sydney. He owns a film studio, which is the only one that can get a fully rigged truck into to take pictures <laughs> of. So he's got a, a bit of a specialist business there. But uh, if you look at the votes we've got, they're very tiny. It's only under 100 votes. And explain, um, because there's been a redistribution, the Commission's created a, quite a number of joint polling places. This is Caddy's Creek Primary, which is no longer in Riverston. It's next door in Winston Hills, but they've left a small joint polling place there. And it's only collected 100 votes, so it's not very meaningful. And the other seat to just got to talk about there is Monero. As you can see, 55 for the National and five votes for the Labor candidate. It's Dalgetty Hall, which I think is right down the bottom of the electorate. Again, it's not a very meaningful figure. So if we're not, the reason why we're not bringing up a lot of figures is these aren't actually telling us very much yet at this stage. No, all right, well, thanks anyway for, uh, at least again, we know the system is working. We're getting more <laughs> results through. In fact, Penny Sharp, you've got some uh, results you're seeing for another really interesting seat to watch tonight, <coughs> Upper Hunter. Yeah, it's a very small one, but it's just showing that um, our primary, I mean, it's only less than 300 votes, so it's, yeah. it's not a lot, but our primary is around 29%, um, and at the by-election, we were on about 21% there. Is that in, in that booth, do you know? Yes, or, I, so think, that booth, I think, believe so, yes. That booth's a little better. Yeah, we think so, but yeah. let's see, it's very early. You thought that perhaps you could win Upper Hunter in, in that by-election. So what do you think, and you didn't, but what do you think would have changed this time around? No, we've never won Upper Hunter. So it's one of those ones that I'm very, very cautious about. Just an early figure that is interesting. But look, let's just see. Upper Hunter is a really tough ask for us. We have never held it. The, um, the Nats don't have a lot of friends. They don't have a lot of preference friends up there, do they? Well, it's, it's always challenging. Mm. The incumbent sitting members, the, the, all the parties seem to gang up on us, yes. uh, both Labor and Liberal. Mm. Um, but again, these are very early counts, so mm. they're not mm. representative of the seat. Just yep, tell us a bit are. about the Nats tonight, um, mm. Ashley, because they did lose ground to shooters and fishers, some of whom have now, well, I think all of them, all of them, all of them, all of them have, have gone have. <laughs> independent, but you know, uh, some of them may well hold on to their seats as independents. Um, what do the Nats need to, need to do tonight? Look, I think they need to hold uh, and they have been targeting their, there's Murray and Barwon that they have been targeting, which are the two those big shooters, states, those yeah, um, to turn shooters, turn independent and they are trying to, to get them back, at least, at least Murray. It'll be interesting. I think they don't really know how, how they are faring in those seats, but Paul Tool has, who is the Nationals leader, has been targeting those seats. It has been a, quite a quiet campaign from Paul Tool. Now, Paul Tool took over from the former Deputy Premier John Barillaro and his leadership style is very different to, to <laughs> John Barillaro. I think, we just, I think we just heard the understatement <laughs> of the night. <laughs> so it has been quite quiet in terms of the, the Nationals have just been going about their business targeting seats. Obviously, they've spent time trying to, to stave off Labor in Monero and Monero is under threat. Mm. Um, from, from Labor. And there's something that's interesting that's been happening in, in Port Macquarie as well. Uh, there, that's been held by a national turned Liberal MP, Leslie Williams. And then the Nationals are running against the Libs. So it's a three cornered contest, which I don't know what you've heard, Matt, but it, it hasn't, it's been a bit ugly up there. Look, uh, we're confident that we'll retain Port Macquarie. Um, Leslie Williams was a national MP who left the National Party over the koala uh, situation. Um, so it is currently a Liberal held seat, but there was a three corner contest. We're confident that she's a very hardworking and popular local member and she'll retain that. If I just take on, take on, take up your point for your viewers at home, mm. if I like, uh, Paul Toole is a very different leader uh, to John Barillaro. John uh, had a big personality and a big presence. Paul is methodical and uh, not as uh, overstated, but he has been working diligently in the bush. And I suspect you'll see tonight there won't be an issue for the coalition in the bush. Thank you very much. I think we're going to go over to Jez and his very big board. 
Yes, indeed. Look, uh, at this stage of the night, we can't show you any results. It's way too early to start giving away seats, but this is the starting line. This is where we're at in the most recent parliament. I want to bring in Anthony Green, though, because we can flip things around a little bit and rearrange the stack on both sides, Anthony, to show the race to power. What are we seeing here? Well, uh, the key thing to point out here is this gold line here. This is the winning post. As you can see, the coalition, all the seats from the safest on that side to, uh, to the more marginal here, and we've coloured them all blue just for simplicity. That's the need to get beyond to get to 47. They've only got 46, so they're short. Labor's down here with 38. They need to push, push these crossbench seats up beyond there and get themselves beyond there. Now, for Labor to win, if they need to, if the East Hills and Pendrith are the most marginal, Upper Hunter is in the country, Gold and Tweed are in the country. If they miss any of those seats, particularly the country seats, they need to go beyond that and pick up Winston Hills on 5.7, Holsworthy, Riverston, Parramatta and Oatley are all above 6%, Camden above 7%, Ride on nearly 9%. Now, that's that arc of outer suburban seats, lots of homeowners, lots of people under the cost of living pressures. They're the seats Labor needs to push into. So they need to push, Labor needs to sort of push up here, get past this line, and they do that by taking those coalition seats there. These independent seats tend to sit in the middle. If you look at the statewide swing, how easy is it to make that leap all the way to this end of the board? Well, it's a statewide, the news poll this morning was 6.5%. It may well be. I mean, do you tend to see bigger swings in outer suburban Sydney? It may be. I mean, the, the country had the big swing last time. It may be there's some correction this time. And it may be that all those areas where cost pressures are biting most are the areas where you're going to see the biggest swings. And that happens to be in some of the seats Labor needs to win. OK, there's a really interesting phenomenon that happens in New South Wales, optional preferential voting. Just explain for us what that means. Yeah, we've got some graphs here. You don't have to fill in preferences on the ballot paper. Now, here we are, we're going to compare federal and state elections. At federal elections under full preferential voting in New South Wales at the last election, nearly 85% of Green preferences went to Labor and only just about 16% to the Liberal Party. Last New South Wales election under optional preferential voting, only 50% of preferences went to Labor. A smaller number to Liberals, but above all, 40%, nearly 40% exhausted. And an exhausted preference doesn't flow to the Labor Party, just exhaust. And that um, brings down the winning post. If Labor is in second place, it's harder to catch up and win in New South Wales because they get fewer green preferences and the exhaustion rate brings down the winning post for a leading candidate. Can I just labour a point here because I've been asked this a lot. What happens to an exhausted vote? Where does it go? Well, it counts for the candidate you voted for. It counts as preferences to any candidate who the, the voters that have filled in the ballot paper for, but otherwise, if it has no further preferences for a candidate remaining in the count, no it's further put vote. on the exhaustion. It's not informal, it counts. And, and so it's not an informal vote, but it just doesn't play a part in the final distribution of preferences. Interesting then, if you take a look at One Nation's uh, preferences and how they flow, because that looks quite different, doesn't it? Yeah, One Nation at the last federal election, 36% to Labor, 64% to the coalition. So they're a regular supplier of votes. They don't get the highest, higher voters, the Greens, and it's not quite as strong to the coalition, but it was still important. It didn't deliver the coalition any seats at the last federal election, but it's still important. They need them a bit more at this election because their first preference vote is down. But in New South Wales, at the last New South Wales election, 71% of One Nation preferences exhausted. They didn't flow. Now, it didn't hurt the coalition that badly last time because they had the higher first preference vote in most of these contests. In Camden, they got 13%. But with the higher first preference vote, that didn't matter. But if the coalition vote is down and the Labor first preference vote is up down, a high exhausted rate from One Nation could cost the coalition seats because, one, they miss out on preferences. You know, there's 40%, 50% of preferences there they're not getting. And also because of these exhausted preferences, brings down the uh, finishing line and if Labor's ahead on first preferences it's easier for them to reach the winning post and win. Anthony, thank you. Sarah, David. Um, Matt Keane, as you were watching that superb presentation from Anthony and Jez, you're shaking your head at those pre preference flows. Is there anything, you know, what do those numbers do to you? What can you do to change that? Oh, what clearly happens is uh, if people voting One Nation, uh, mm. the majority of it just exhausts. So Mark Latham's been trying to get a Labor government elected since 2004. <laughs> and um, if you're seeing that exhaustion rate, it might mm. happen. Mm. He, he might have a, a different view uh, on that. Um, he's, he's trying to attract votes to, to One Nation. Mm. And he's particularly using you to try mm. and attract them. Uh, he's you know, been calling your names like Matt Green. Um, 
Well, I mean, oh, that's... I'm not sure how creative that is, but uh, yeah, tell us about that dynamic. That's straight out of the Mark Latham playbook, you know. Um, he did it to Rosie Batty. He did it mm. to uh, various figures. It's always the politics of division and uh, intimidation and bullying. Um, you know, that, but are you are you a, here. Are you a vote... Um, are you attracting votes to the One Nation uh, column? No, I think, what he's doing? I think what we're seeing is that uh, the One Nation vote is the vote of grievance. Uh, we've just heard Tony Barry talk about it, that earlier. Uh, people that are disaffected because of cost of living pressures. I think the issue with the One Nation vote, and I expect it to be quite high tonight, and it's because uh, people are seeing that there's a 12-year government, they think it's time for a change, uh, they don't like what Chris Minns is offering because it's been a pretty you know, small target strategy from Chris Minns. So I suspect minor parties will do quite well tonight. Is it, is it also just the, the cost? You are talking earlier about a, a progressive form of government, a liberal version of progressive government, that that is the cost of on your left flank going for that, that there is a cost to pay on the right flank if you do that? No, I don't think so. I think that there are separate How can there issues. not be a... There's, there's, no, there's no correlation between those two things. If you go hard one way, you're not going to annoy people on the other side. I don't know how you can have one yeah. without the other. Well, I think what's driving a vote towards One Nation is cost of living pressures, people feeling disenfranchised, 12 years of a coalition government uh, looking for an alternative but don't like Labor. So uh, there are a number of factors driving the One Nation vote and you know that's what we'll see play out. Penny Sharp, let me just ask you about this because Labor for a long time have had to deal with the, the pressures of you know how to hold votes on the right and left flanks, you know, the Greens and, and, and some traditional voters in Western Sydney in, in particular that you're also trying to hold. Um, One Nation does seem to attract people who are fed up with both major parties. Um, how does Labor deal with that and, and try to get some of those second preferences coming back to you? Well, we don't really deal with One Nation. That's a very clear position from the Labor Party. But look, for us, we try to offer a broad range of issues mm. and policies that we think attract the most amount of people. If you want to win majority government, you've got to get 52% of people to think that what you're doing is the right idea. So our approach is pretty basic. It really is. We just want to talk to people um, about the issues that they care about and bring them with the policy and hopefully get them to vote with us with the right policies. Cos, let me just bring you in here. What are you expecting to see with One Nation tonight? What have you been picking up through the campaign about their support? We, we do know that overwhelmingly One Nation voters are largely older, uh, wealthier. There's a misconception, I think, within the media and also, I think, within the general public that One Nation voters come from low-income um, mm -hmm. constituencies. That's not true. So um, uh, we expect... Cos, is that... I'm sorry to interrupt, but is that... Is, is Camden one of the examples of that yes. where we're likely to see some of those older One Nation voters? No accident it is uh, a, a, an electorate that attracts a very <laughs> significant One Nation vote. If you look at the profile of that electorate, uh, very, uh, it's very white. Mm. Uh, there's not much diversity out there. But equally, you're not going to get much change out of a million dollars when it comes to buying a house either. So it's not an area that is you would define as an area that actually experiences any financial hardships. Those constituencies actually currently exist in Labor seats. So uh, what we expect with the One Nation vote is it will, it will hemorrhage the Liberal Party on, the, on its right flank. Mm. Um, Tony, can we go to you just to go back to some of those questions we started to talk to Matt Keane about in relation to the squeeze from the teals. This in the end is an existential question for the Liberal Party or certainly a question about the nature of its future. Yeah. Talk, to, talk to us about what this election is going to be. If, if it goes the way we're beginning to talk about, what that tells us about the shape of future Liberal. Well, I think what's happening is, is in the Western suburbs is an entirely different thing what's happening in the Teals. And what we're seeing is a nation of smaller and smaller tribes. So there's great tribalism that's happening, not just in overseas politics, but also domestically here. And so different issues are playing out in different parts of the electorate. So it's harder and harder for political campaigns to narrow cast to all these different constituencies and to have a binding message, which is why they need to get back to the importance of values, shared values with the electorate. And often, you know, policies are an expression of your values. Now, in the case of um, some of those electorates in the Western suburbs, the hurt is very real. You know, cost of living is the number one issue. There's no other issue that comes close to it at the moment. We've got mortgage stress, rental stress and there's a mortgage cliff coming. So what we're seeing there is grievance. We're seeing people who are doing it tough. Uh, they don't want to reward the government. They, they want more help from the government. It always works against the incumbent. 
um, but they don't necessarily see the answer in Labor either. So what's happening there is an entirely different set of circumstances to the, the so-called teal seats. Tony, thank you very much. I'm going to go back to my friend Anthony Green over here, who's got some details of some seats outside Sydney, I think, Anthony. Uh, well, actually, the first one's going to be in Riverson. We just changed it after telling you what we were right going to do. Right there, right <laughs> there. <then. laughs> um, we've actually got three polling places, in, including two within the district. Now, what I wanted to look at is the change of vote here. We haven't got any sensible two-party preferred figures. We've got three polling places, a big drop in the Liberal vote, a hmm. rise in the Labor vote. Now, the one thing I will say about Riverston, there's whole areas there which had nobody living in last time in this completely new suburb. So it's a lot of change in Riverston. But that's the first sort of serious figure we've had from, uh, from the city, although it's Riverston is going to be a complex seat. Wendy Tuckerman in um, Goulburn, Michael Pilbrow's a Labor candidate. She's well ahead at this moment on the first preferences. Again, we can't talk about two-party preferred at this stage, but there's that change in um, first preference vote. The Labor vote up, the Liberal vote down, One Nation vote. There's no One Nation candidate there this time. But I think there's a, sh there's a shooter's candidate this time. We'll see once we've got a... Actually, I'll, I'll see if I've got a swing figure. It's an estimate. There's an 8.5% swing. There's no way we're calling that we are done for preference count at this stage. Uh, Upper Hunter is interesting for reasons I'll explain. You can see there's quite a spray of votes there. Uh, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers candidates got 16%. Dale McNamara, who was the One Nation candidate at the by-election two years ago, has got 12%. If you look at the change in votes there, this is these are figures that are looking like the by-election from two years ago where there was a very low first preference vote for the two major parties. In fact, um, that's roughly what the by-election figures were. So whether that's just an artefact that these are small rural booths and when Singleton and uh, M M um, Musselbrook come in later, it'll change. But we're just we're seeing some consistent swings against the government, consistent mm. swings to Labor, but it's not working into a, a clear picture yet. Anthony, can you just go back and tell me what... Just explain about Riverstone, why that's such a complicated picture. Oh, it's, there is so much population growth there. There's, right. there's a whole... There's, um, suburb of Rouse Hill, there's a whole two polling places there and there was nothing there last time. Mm -hmm. There's a one just south. There's just whole new housing estates there. And so there's a lot of change that's gone on. There's a lot of people voted a pre-poll this time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just got a couple of the small polling places. So uh, yeah, just we'll come back to Riverston, but uh, we're just trying to present some figures in those key seats to give some sort of picture. Penny Sharp, the early numbers there from Anthony, encouraging for Labor. You've also got some encouraging numbers for Labor from South Coast. We um, have. What are, you, what are you seeing? So we've got some early results um, from Kalala Bay. They're not big booths, 350, but we're seeing a 6.8% swing to us. But more importantly, the Libs have had a 22% swing against. A second booth, which is Greenwall Point, big, bit of a bigger booth, 600 640 voters there, 19% swing against the Libs, 2% swing to us, uh, but the Shooters and Fishers have picked up 12% there. Interesting. So does South Coast become a, a possibility? We've had a really great candidate there, mm. Liza Butler. It's from, um, she comes from Borley Point. She mm. really stepped up as a result of the fires. She became a community coordinator when her um, community was cut off for five days during the 2019 fires. So she's really stepped up. She's also on the local council there. She's the deputy mayor. She's run a really great campaign, but she's very well connected. Business owner in, in Ulladulla. Um, mm. We're really hopeful there, but it's a tough seat for us. We're doing well there. We're excited. <laughs> You spent a lot of time, Labor seems to have really targeted. Was that part of the strategy, especially after you won Bega in the by-election, that that was sort of next on the list that you thought that South Coast might be within reach? Look, Shelley Hancock had been a long-term member there, so we need to understand we always thought it was tough while Shelley was still there. I think the Liberal Party made a fatal blow, a fatal error there. They pre-selected one of her staffers, a young man. Um, I think that was an error. We had, as I said, Liza's this an incredible local person who really you know, wasn't a political person, but became politicised through her experience of the of the fires. And I think she just really ran with it in a way um, that we were really hopeful. And we just sort of kept going back because she was really putting those issues out there. And we knew it must have been a problem too, because Dom started showing up too. <laughs> um, Penny, just on some of those booths you were talking about, what are the issues driving that? They're all coastal coastal booths, aren't they? Small coastal, right on the beach. Yeah, small yep. coastal villages there. So, What are the issues there? Yeah, housing is a really mm -hmm. big issue. People mm -hmm. getting really squeezed out of rentals, the mm -hmm. you know, growth of Airbnbs, people, um, rental prices, really big issue there. Would, would a Labor government do more about the, the Airbnb? and the issue that we hear about in some of those coastal towns? Look, it's a very tough issue. I mean, I heard this story that um, 
the South Coast uh, Mayor from, from, from Yurubadala, he's actually not a Labor person, he's an mm. independent, he actually wrote to every householder down mm. in the Yurubadala Shire asking them to transfer their housing from Airbnbs. And apparently they picked up four ho 40 houses that have now become long-term rentals. That's not the solution to the housing crisis, mm. but it is a really, it just shows how tight it is and how difficult it is. <laughs> For us, we've, we've made some commitments around doing build to rent down in the South Coast, mm -hmm. actually getting that supply in place. It'll take a while though, it doesn't fix the immediate issue. Mm. No, but you could, you could go further as some communities have um, in other jurisdictions on the Airbnb issue. Have you, have you looked at it? Have you thought about it? We're aware of how tight it is. It's a long, it's, some of those issues are ones that you really need to get under the hood if you get into government. So in government, you'll look at this? <laughs> I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask our, our, whoever becomes you, our housing you, minister, Rose Jackson. I'm not, I'm, not making, I'm, not, <laughs> right. I'm, not, I'm not making any predictions on her behalf, but we're really aware of the issue. And in seats like this, it's one of the biggest things. The other, the other issues that um, people really worry about, young people leaving access to TAFE, another one that comes through all the time down there. Mm. Just on that, Matt Keane, as treasurer, you know, that get these sort of ideas across your desk uh, from time to time. Um, what can be done about the rental shortage crisis in towns like that? Well, there's no silver bullet on these things, obviously, but one of the key things is more supply, more supply of stock into the system over the medium to long term and the short term providing support for people. That's why both parties went to the election with a big renters package. We know that that's a huge growing electoral cohort. Uh, millennials mm. are making up nearly 50 or 40 percent of those on the electoral roll, as opposed to in 2011, where they mm. were about 18 percent. So renting is a big issue. And that's why even a coalition government went to the election with policies around no-fault evictions and things like that. Did you consider going further with those rental policies? Because as you, exactly as you say, it's turned into a, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge demographic issue as well as an issue of difficulty for people. Yeah, of course, there was pretty robust discussions around the policies, mm -hmm. uh, how you balance, uh, you know, uh, property rights mm -hmm. with also the rights of renters. Where, where were you in that debate? Um, with my colleagues. Mm. I mean, the colleagues, these, these are hard issues. Um, they had to be worked through and that's why you've got a cabinet was there, process was to there any it. Was there any consideration of going further with rent, issues like rent control? I think there was, uh, certainly not down the path of rent control, mm. but certainly the government was, you know, there were diverse views around the cabinet table on these matters. Um, and I think we landed in a pretty good space. It's, it's quite similar to where Labor landed on this thing. But if I could just take up on Penny's issue about the candidate in the South Coast, I mean, this is the candidate that Chris Minns had to apologise for, for her remarks around problem gambling being in Western Sydney due to ethnic groups. I mean, you know, so um, I'm surprised by the swing down there. I think that candidate, I don't know that candidate, but I know Luke Sikora has been basically tied to the hip of Shelley Hancock, who's a very popular local member there. If Luke gets up, he'll be an outstanding member and I'll be very interested to see that result. Mm. All right, well, it has uh, just gone one hour since the polls closed. The count has been underway for, for some time. We've got about 1% of the vote counted statewide, so not a lot. <laughs> a bit more in uh, individual seats than 1%. Anthony Green's going to give us an update. Uh, we'll do the overall vote at this stage. The Liberals are on 31, Nationals just under 6, so about 37. Labor on th uh, just under 37, so roughly equal at this stage. Greens on 10, One Nation 1 1.2, and others 15. Now, the one warning about this is that these are there's a lot of rural figures in here. And if you remember the federal election, the swing didn't really turn up until you saw more, more urban figures. So uh, just look at the two party preferred swing. It's about four point, that's the 4.9% statewide. If I go and look at just, uh, I look at the just regional areas, just the country, which is where most of the vote is, got 1.1% counted. The swings 3% and the, the LNP against Labor, two Labor, sorry. If we look at Sydney, uh, let me have a look at uh, which one's Sydney. The swing is 6.2, but it's only 0.4% counted. But already on these figures, we're seeing a bigger swing in the city than we are in the country. And that's the difficulty, the problem for the coalition. Just, and just to remind us, Anthony, what's the swing Labor needs on a, uh, a standard swing that they need? Because it looks pretty similar to what you got there in Sydney. <laughs> Statewide is 6.5% right now. These, as I said, that's 0.4%. It'll take a while for that to stabilise. But the swing is definitely bigger in Sydney. The swing is about 49 across the state, which is not enough, but we haven't got a lot of Sydney figures in there. So I think there's some interest to see what happens, but uh, we're starting to get some meaningful figures now. Uh, you certainly can't call it at this stage, but the swing is on. The question is whether it's big enough and whether it occurs in the right seats.
Anthony, um, Matt Keane, you've got something to say. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, our scrutiny is in North Shore. I've just mm -hmm. sent through some results. So there are five booths now we're in, and Felicity Wilson is looking strong there. Helen Conway, the mm. Teal Climate 200 backed independent, she's actually coming in fourth place behind Labor and the Greens. So that's a good sign for Felicity Wilson tonight. And where are those booths? What, what, what? Which particular booths are there? Do you know? No, I don't have that data, but there are five booths that have come in, and this is a good early sign for Felicity Wilson. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I just ask a, a blunt question here? Sure. If the, if the Libs lose government, but you hold off those teals, mm. will Matt Keane be a happy man at the end of tonight? No, um, Matt Keane wants to see us win government, uh, winning both in the West, in the bush, and also in the heartland. So, But, but in terms of a, the biggest consolation prize possible is what David's asking as well, that if you don't win, that it's going to be your strategy that will have paid off if you are able to hold back the teals? No, this is a team. Uh, we have a team strategy on this and, you know, we're trying to talk to as broad a constituency as possible. As Penny said, you win elections by carrying, uh, building a coalition of more than 50% of voters. Uh, they're very diverse and different communities. Mm. Um, we're trying to piece together our pathway to victory, which includes the traditional Liberal heartland mm. with Western Sydney, with the bush, mm. uh, as Labor's trying to do the same. Peter Dutton's going to want to know how you did it though, isn't he? Uh, well, let's see what happens. Mm. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Penny Sharp, I don't know how much Labor is paying attention to those teal contests, but uh, what, what, what do you think? Is there much chance for any of them to win one? It's been the big test. We don't know whether the fact that the you know funding caps have affected them, optional mm. preferential. Mm. <laughs> Just um, explain for the viewers yeah, the oh, yes. funding caps, because federally the teal, uh, uh, certainly the ones that won, some of them spent huge amounts of money. Oh, you yes. can't do that in the New South Wales no, under in the Wh rules here in the in the state. No, that's right. In Wentworth, I think Allegra Spender spent over a million dollars in that set. That's unheard of in Australia. Mm. Um, in New South Wales, we have the caps, and Matt, Matt might need to help me here. I think it's one hundred and thirty thousand dollars per seat. I think it's one hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, it's percent. around yeah. that. So, but it's very, very clear mm -hmm. about how much you can spend. So, if you're not well known, that name recognition is an issue. I think the sleeper on the teals, though, is they had this really motivated base of volunteers mm. that had a really big win at the at the federal election. Mm. If they've been able to get them on the ground, I mean, I think that some of those Liberal Party branches have never campaigned ever, and I think that's a shock for them. So whether they've been able to really get momentum just through that, you know, door by door, bus stop by bus stop, I think that's... When we see at the end of the night how they've gone, I think that'll be a big factor. Yeah, and Ashley, they, they don't have uh, Scott Morrison to campaign <coughs> against, unlike at the, the federal election where the Teals did well. The climate change issue has been uh, far more neutralised than we saw at the federal uh, level. Um, the issues aren't playing in their favour as strongly as they did in May last year. No, they didn't. And it, it was quite interesting when a lot of these Climate 200 backed candidates entered in Sydney, there's four in Sydney and, and one uh, in, in the Southern Highlands, they seem to be running on that same platform, those, those, those three, integrity, the environment and women. And, and yes, the New South Wales Liberals had moved to, to address that issue. So it will be interesting to see how they play out. They've obviously also got the optional preferential mm. voting system working uh, against them. Ash, can you well. explain why that makes a difference, why the situation in New South Wales with optional preferential voting is so important for the Teals? Well, if you look at what happened federally, Every, every teal that won in, in New South Wales, other than Zali Stegall, who was already in place in Warringah, they didn't win the primary vote. They won off preferences. So those preferences are really important. We've actually seen there was a bit of a fight that broke out in the Manly electorate this week because uh, actually the New South Wales uh, Liberals wrote to, to the Electoral Commission uh, pointing out that this, the signage that, that the teal was running there, Jolene Hackman, said don't waste your vote, number all, uh, number all the, the boxes. And they, they, they took issue with that, saying that that's a directive mm. um, and that they, they, they shouldn't be doing that. So, yes, that, the optional preferential is a real issue and could hurt the, the independents who are, who are trying to get over the line. Mm. I want to go to the seat of Parramatta in Sydney's west. We're going to talk to the outgoing MP, Jeff Lee, there in just a moment. First, let's check the count in Parramatta with Anthony. Yeah, well, we've got a very, uh, you know, not very progressed count. We've only got 0.2% count, and I know where it's from. It's the Yates Avenue primary, which is in Dundas Valley. So it's not actually in the electorate. It used to be in Jeff's electorate, but it's now in the electorate of Epping. Uh, and this is just a small external uh, pre, um, external polling place. So uh, 
Labor's well ahead in that polling place. There's like a 20% swing in that polling place. But as I said, it's completely unrepresentative because that Yates Avenue is now in a different electorate. So this is people who've driven from somewhere else. It's not always a good trend. But uh, look, Parramatta's going to be one of those key seats we come back to all the night. And I'm sure Jeff Lee can give a better picture of what the election might look like than me. Yeah, well, Jeff Lee, thanks for joining us. We know Labor have been targeting this seat uh, and pretty confident uh, about this seat. D did the Liberals start to withdraw some of the campaign funding and effort in the seat or have they really fought hard at the end? No, no, I think uh, quite clearly that Dominic Perrette was out a lot of times. We committed a lot of uh, money to Parramatta. We've in fact had record investment over the last 10 years, $7 billion. But as the pendulum swings both, you know, a different way, it'll be you know, tough for us. You know, I've been in, in uh, Parliament now for 12 years. It's hard to transfer that personal following to our candidate, Ka Katie Mullins, who's a fantastic candidate. She wasn't put in the field till fairly late in the piece, and we've had a, against her uh, a mayor that's been campaigning, using that mayoralty position for the last two years, campaigning against us. So it's going to be a tough fight tonight. Jeff Lee, Ashley Rafer here. Do you think the pre-selection issues and getting the candidate in late ha has damaged the chances in Parramatta? Well, I think what we need to do is get candidates, wherever they are, into the field as quickly as possible in a timely manner. Uh, Katie's done a fantastic job, a lot of community support. Will it be enough? We've got to see tonight. It'll be a tough uh, battle. I think Dominic Perrottet has run a wonderful campaign. He's, you know, personally, I think he's been a great Premier, great boss to have, and couldn't thank him more for the support of Parramatta. As I said, record investment in Parramatta over the 10 years. It's really transformed Parramatta. If you look at the landscape 12 years ago, what Parramatta used to be, it was, you know, neglected it. They talked about it as a second CBD. Now it's a city on its own. It's going places. It's a central city. We've moved 12,000 public servants to Parramatta. It's really taking off. When people come to Parramatta for the first time in years, they say, wow, hasn't this changed? I'm very proud of what we've delivered. So why do you think then that investment in infrastructure, the, the light rail, there, ha there has been problems. It has been quite disruptive. Why do you think that hasn't held that seat in good stead to, to, to win that or perhaps not that you're concerned uh, about this seat? Well, I think um, people get very used to what we've been delivering. You know, it's been 12 years since uh, the opposition was in government. What we've seen it through the opposition, you know, in that times there's a $30 billion black hole in, in, in infrastructure. Now, for the last decade, we have rolled out infrastructure. In, in fact, so much infrastructure, the hundreds of billions of dollars that we've rolled out, it's in fact created cr uh, inflationary pressures on infrastructure growth. Uh, I think people get used to seeing the new West Connects. When you drive to the airport for the West Connects, people go, that's amazing. We're you know, next year we're opening Parramatta Light Rail Stage 1. Uh, next year we'll open the Parramatta Powerhouse. There's some f we've opened the stadium. You know, when you go to Combank Stadium in Parramatta, people say, Whoa, wow, this is world class. We're soon to open a brand new pool. There's so many different things. But I think people get used to having delivery of infrastructure and they get used to it. I remember when the trains that used to come to Parramatta Station used to come every 15 minutes in, in peak hour when I first started. Now they're coming every four minutes. You know, just changes like that. Remember the, the queue? that the, uh, the ticket, ticket lines, you know, the machines were like, you'd wait 15, 20 minutes to get a ticket on Monday morning to actually buy your weekly pass. Now with things like the Opal card, people don't just get used to it and think that's the way government has been. I think we've changed the way, and I always say, look back 10, 12 years ago, before the coalition government got in and say, what was life like then? What is it like now? And it's remarkably changed. I'm very proud of that. Jeff Lee, thank you. Nina electorate, what the gang, what a gang did I? Mugum Nawa, Radri, Nolumbang. Radri Nolumbango, Pulu Numpai Bela, Kalari, Wambubu, Yindi. Nina Bela, Bayami go Nalia. Nali in Jimarago, Bababu, Takambu, Babin Weir. This is New South Wales Votes. I'm David Spears. And I'm Sarah Ferguson. It's early in the count. Here's Anthony with the latest. Anthony. Hi. The, um, 
I'll just go into the statewide figures again and just talk about them. Um, one of the things on election night is everyone thinks says, we, know, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know, and suddenly, yes, this is the winner. What we look at is there's actually something that grows and appears during the night. Now, Liberals and Nationals are adding to 36 0.3, Labor's on 36.8, there's nine, 10% with the Greens, uh, smattering with the One Nation, as shooters, fishers and farmers statewide and a big vote for others. That's translating into a statewide two-party swing of 4.7%. Now, um, while the individual seats are not showing up, there's quite some significant swings in seats, but it's varying booth by booth on the early figures. But I think this swing is settling in and if that's the swing, then it's very difficult for the government to survive. Now, we're not calling an election result until we start calling seats and we've got a better handle on all those seats which are currently doubt. But just on, like, consistently we're seeing Labor ahead in a number of those deciding seats, but then there's other odd seats which, like, Liberals ahead in Heathcote. There's just there's figures which just not make sense. And we just got a lot of very early figures. The other thing that's always hard to factor in is whether this is affected by the increase in pre-poll and postal votes. But at the moment, what the statewide picture is looking about, looking like, and, and I'll just have a look at Sydney as well and see where that two-party preferred is 5.3. Now, if that swing is 4.7 to 5.3 statewide, we're either going to get, Labor's going to get enough seats to win with more seats, or the Liberals are going to hang on with tiny margins everywhere. So at the moment, we're not sure which of those it's going <laughs> to hang up with. But I would say it's, it's, the figures are looking good for the Labor Party and they're looking more concerning for the Liberal Party, but it's certainly not, not there to call yet. Anthony, thank you very much. Looking good for the Labor Party. A happy moment for Penny, a less happy moment for Matt Keane. But now we've got reporter Jake Lapham. He's at Green's HQ tonight at the Annandale Hotel. Jake, Green's are hopeful. They could have the balance of power, but not sure based on what Anthony just said. What's happening? Who, who are those people behind you and how are they feeling? They sure are. We're here at the Annandale Hotel, Sarah, where everyone here is focused on that balance of power. It would be the ultimate goal tonight, but there's a long way to go. But the Greens have committed to supporting a Labor minority government, and they've issued a list of seven policy demands with which that support is contingent upon. But realistically, we may actually not know exactly how that balance of power equation looks tonight. And for that reason, everyone here is pretty focused on the seat-by-seat -seat count. The Greens hold three seats in the lower house. Two of those, being Ballina and Newtown, are considered fairly safe holds, but the same can't be said for Balmain, where I am. That's held by the Greens on a margin of 10%, but the sitting MP, Jamie Parker, is resigning, and that's opened up a massive opportunity for Labor. To get some more on this, I'll bring in Greens MLC, Kate Fairman. Kate, thank you. Hey, we saw Anthony Albanese campaigning with Philippa Scott, the Labor candidate in Balmain, today. Yeah. Are you confident you can hold Balmain? Look, I mean, we have basically had a very good campaign there. I have been to Balmain a number of times this week. Basically, the, the, the feedback's excellent. Voters are coming in. They're sticking with us, as far as I can tell. Nothing indicates that this seat is going to go to Labor, but we just have to wait and see. We have run a fantastic campaign. Toby Shetty is a name that is known in almost every Balmain household now. Jamie Parker put in the yards. Toby, I think think is going to be the next uh, MP for Balmain. But of course, we know nothing at this stage. Uh, looking across the state, can you pick up any other seats, do you think? Yeah, look, we eyed off Lismore as well as the South Coast. We don't know how they're going. We just know that on the ground, the Greens were doing very well there. Uh, we're also, I think Summer Hill was also looking quite good for us. We have run a very uh, hard and fantastic hard-working campaigns in a lot of seats. I think what we were concentrating on as well, of course, was our upper house vote to make sure that the upper house stays kind of in the control, if you like, if you like, with the Greens, as opposed to what it could be going to the shooters and One Nation. So a lot of our work across many, many seats is also to build our upper house vote. Finally, I want to ask about cashless gaming. It's a, it's a key part of your policy plank is a mandatory cashless gaming card. It's not that policy of the Labor Party. So how could you back in a minority government, a Labor government, that does not implement a mandatory cashless gaming card? Look, well, I, I would say to Labor, do the mandatory cashless gambling card. Like, that is what we have said. That 
is the key priority, key uh, ask of ours. So what not, we, not negotiable? Well, what we will do, like we can always look at the way in which we can introduce it in the next parliament anyway. A cash scaling card is going to happen. Like really, I can't believe Chris Minns during this whole campaign has not acted on that. So, yes, the cash is gambling card for us, uh, as we said, is a priority. Not negotiable? Let's see. Let's see. Well, we're not, we're not ready to say what is and what isn't neg negotiable at this point. Look, let's see what happens the next few days. But I tell you what, in terms of the mood of the electorate, like... It would be very foolish for Chris Mims and Labor not to come to the to, to the table and support a cashless gambling card. We've all put it on the table as a key uh, demand for us. Uh, if you know, in terms of balance of power, not just us but the independents as well. It's kind of an easy fix. It's one of the easiest ones, actually, that we put out there for Labor to come and say yes, we could do that. Kate Bamman, thanks for your time. Thanks, Jake. Back to the studio. Jay, thank you. Uh, Penny Sharper will ask you about gambling and uh, the Greens, Kate Fairman there, making, a, making the campaign uh, pitch very strong there. But you've got some numbers on Balmain just quickly, which are uh, better ones. for Labor. Yes, we still think it's very tight there, so I'm not trying to make any great claim here. But our candidate, Philippa Scott, um, is from Leichhardt, Kegworth Primary there. She's had a 13% swing to her in, that, in her own home booth, so that's very promising. A couple of other seats we've seen, we're looking at about a 3.5% swing. That's not enough. It's a 10%... It's a 10% seat, but very encouraging. So, why <laughs> won't Labor embrace cashless gaming cards? Well, I think Labor actually has a very clear uh, view about how we're going to do this. We're committed to the, the trial, which is about getting the technology right, testing it between the country and the city, working with um, between pubs and clubs to actually do that in 12 months. It's very focused. It's 12 months. It's also overseen by an independent panel that's supposed to and will give us the roadmap to change. So you think we the believe the electorate, important. though, is, you know, we want more than a trial. There seems to be solid support, even from the Liberals to the Greens. Let's just do it. Well, I think that we're heading in that direction, but we, our, we've been very, Chris has been very clear about wanting to get the technology right and to understand what the impact of it is. That's what he's going to do, and, that, and that's, you know, that's what we've taken to people, and we've really, I mean, we've argued it a lot. I think the best thing about this campaign, though, is that problem gambling has been front and centre, and I look forward to whoever wins actually taking action into the future. But even just justifying the trial, <laughs> it is a very small trial. It's 500 machines mm. out of only, uh, out of almost 90,000 yep. in the state. So that's being criticised in itself, that how are you going to get uh, an accurate reflection of what's happening and whether it works on just 500 machines? Well, it's about getting the technology right. The advice that we've got is that it's not straightforward. There are very old machines, there are new machines. We're also putting in place the cash limit um, on how much the input limit as well. So we believe that the trial is actually very rigorous, that it will be overseen by an independent panel and it will provide us with the advice that we need. Um, I mean, the other point I'd make too is under our, under our package, in, in four years' time, there'll be 10,000 more machines out of New South Wales. The government's only committed to 2,000. Penny, thank you. And I, I'm absolutely sure we're coming back to um, gambling. I know Matt had something to say, but just for now, I think Anthony's got some, some seats, some more results at the touch screen there, Anthony. I've got them full frame, this one's. <laughs> well, well done, you. I'm... Um... <laughs> I think, yeah, we've Sorry. got the seat ah. of Goulburn. Perhaps we can go there and have a look at uh, what uh, results we've we go. got. Goulburn. Um, Wendy Tuckerman, the Liberal MP there, Anthony. Yeah, well, this is, this is, we were doing a couple of seats here, which are those rural seats which Labor needed to win, and they're under 5%. Now, Goulburn's on 3.1%, Wendy Tuckerman against Michael Pilbrow. If you look at the first preferences, Wendy's, she's well ahead at this stage, um, and this is... Uh, and well ahead and the shooters have got 16%. Now, this is a lot of rural booths at this stage. At the moment, we're projecting that Wendy Tuckerman will finish on about 38 and Labor on about 35. We're getting a 3.9% swing, which is just putting Labor ahead. Mm. Uh, but there's a lot more counting to come. This will be decided by the polling places that come in from Goulburn and Yass, which is the two larger centres, which is where Labor actually gets most of its vote. But at the moment, the swing is just putting Labor ahead, but it hasn't fallen. So that's a, one of the more advanced counts at this election. Um, Anthony, I think we've got Upper Hunter next. We've already talked about that a little bit. That's where Dave Lazell, the Nat, 
is the sitting MP. What's happening there? Yeah, we've come to the upper hand just simply because it's looking pretty pretty firm for the National Party. As I said, this is looking like the by-election figures. The Labor vote is just not rising. The Nationals are on about 35%. Shooters and Fishers and Dale McNamara, the Independent Next One Nation, are both polling well. That's translating into a swing to the National Party. And that's, um, we've got nine polling places with a preference count, 14 with first preferences. So that one's really firming up for the National Party. And if Upper Hunt doesn't fall, that means for Labor to win, they need to win another seat in Sydney. And the northern tip of the state, uh, the seat of Tweed held by the Nationals, Jeff Provost. Yeah, well, this is uh, one that Labor's been trying to win. They did hold it with Neville Newell back during the Carr government. Now, at the moment, uh, the figures there are 38 per cent, 28 for Labor, 18 per cent for the Greens. We're projecting on six polling places that the national vote will rise from there. And if we look at the two party preferred, there's almost no swing. So if that continues, Jeff Provost would hold that seat. Now, that's a 5 per cent sweet seat. So I've just done those three rural seats which sit in that nine seats Labor needs to gain, and they're not falling to Labor at this stage. The, the best one for them is Goulburn. There'll be a lot more counties come in both, but none of them are swinging enough at this stage for the coalition to lose them. Uh, Anthony, what about Lismore up in that neck of the woods? Well, this is, this is an interesting seat just simply because it was such a close win last time, but the floods have completely changed the politics of that seat, and particularly Janelle Safin, who's been very popular as a local member there for her work. Her, vote, her first preference vote up is up 18%. Uh, at the expense of the Nationals mainly. And at the moment, we're showing something like a swing of 16%. So uh, Janelle Safin won it at the last election. It was the first time Labor had won Lismore since 1962. Uh, and she's certainly going to make it a safe seat this time. Uh, I don't think it's got much to do with the rest of the state election. That's got a lot to do with Janelle Safin. Safin. That is quite a swing, uh, Anthony. And let's go to Jeremy at the board because we've got a seat that's lit up and it's that one. That's it. It's Lismore. It's the first one on the board tonight. Goes to Janelle Safin, as Anthony mentioned in the candidate, uh, Janelle Safin. Uh, we are in a position not to colour in anything else on the board. You might notice on the bottom of your screen that we have uh, pointed to seats going either way. However, these are the rules of engagement for the big board. We wait for the count to get above 10% before we start lighting up these seats. But this is a good opportunity to bring Cos and Tony back into the discussion here about some of the broader demographic trends that are driving some of tonight's results. Uh, Cos, you've given us a list of three seats that you're keeping an eye on tonight. Mm -hmm. Dremoyne, Parramatta, Ride. I'm interested in how far up the pendulum you're going here, but what is it that interests you about these seats? Before, before I actually answer that question, Jeremy, um, Jeff Lee, the retiring Liberal MP for Parramatta, uh, gave us a bit of an insight as to what's going on in these electorates. So he mentioned that the government has encouraged 12,000 public servants to move to Parramatta. Now, as a former Labor strategist, that is music to my ears, because that we do know uh, that Overall, pub people who work in the public service generally vote Green or Labor. So when you see that sort of migration occur, that's a big tick. Also, as we've mentioned before, very significant numbers of renters in these electorates. Sydney's property market is bad in many ways, but it also is creating a new class of voter, which is that rental cohort. And Labor can no longer win elections yes. without these type of voters and these type of electorates. So it's, it's such, a, it's such yeah. a Sydney thing to talk about property, isn't it? Absolutely. But we can't ignore how influential it is in an election result like this. What is the relationship between home ownership, renting and who you vote for? That's right. It's a good question. So we do know that if you own your home outright, you're more likely to vote Conservative. If you are a renter, you're uh, overwhelmingly going to vote either for Labor greens or teals uh, and if you are uh, on a mortgage there's a bit of a mixed bag there so with that we could see that now um, bearing fruit in the outer western sydney seats like penrith and and, and and so on so hence these electorates and we see them in all our large cities uh, are going to be very very important for for both major parties going forward because that rental cohort is not shrinking Tony, let's uh, bring in some of the seats that you've uh, identified. You're looking at uh, Oatley, Camden, Holsworthy. What is it that draws your attention to these seats? Well, I'm also interested in Ryde and Dremoyne, big Chinese uh, cohorts there in those seats. So it'll be interesting to see if that um, damage that we saw uh, in the federal election with that community, uh, whether there's a legacy effect there or not that's continuing now. If it's continuing, that's a big problem for the Liberal Party moving forward. In terms of the three seats I've chosen, they're more litmus seats for me, because if they're falling or in big trouble, then the Liberal Party's gonna have a very bad night. Oatley is the one I'm most interested in. 
Uh, Mark Curé is an excellent MP, a four-year campaigner. He's uh, worked the multicultural community very hard with David Coleman, who's the federal MP. If that seat falls at 6.8, then it's going to be you know, a very upsetting night. Uh, likewise, Camden, uh, that is the, the, the centre of gravity for the nation party, uh, One Nation. And if uh, they got a 14% vote there last time, there's some expectations it might hit 20%. Um, if that is the case, then it's going to be incredibly hard to hold as well for Little Party. That's bad news. Holdsworthy as well is interesting. The incumbent Mel Gibbons has left. She's actually running in Kiama. Um, but Mel, uh, again, a very well-known uh, uh, candidate with good incumbency. Um, and now with a new candidate there, she's an interesting candidate because uh, she's, uh, her husband is the mayor of Liverpool, which is unheard of for the Liberal Party to, to hold that area. And um, I believe Tony Abbott's been campaigning there as well. So it's a, it's a really interesting seat. It's a should hold, uh, a very good candidate and a good campaign on the ground. Um, interesting that both of you have picked seats on this side of the board, on the government side. Tony, is it an indication that the government's fighting a defensive game here? Oh, absolutely. The, the arithmetic is going to be very hard for the Liberal Party tonight. I don't think there's any real expectation of picking up Leppington. Um, certainly not the uh, Chris Minzer's seat, Cogra. So it's a defensive option uh, and then trying to cobble together perhaps um, some uh, cross benches, the, the ex-shooters and fishers and so forth. Tony Coz, thank you both. Sarah and David. Jez, thank you very much indeed. I think we're going to speak to Greg Piper in Lake Macquarie in just a moment. Uh, first of all, Anthony's going to give us a little bit of background to help us make sense of that. Yes. Uh... Greg Piper, look, uh, uh, no, there's no doubt Greg Piper's going to hold Lake Macquarie. I don't think there's any, been, been any doubt about that. 12% counted, he's on over 50% of the vote. Uh, so there's no difficulty there. And uh, Greg Piper will be easily returned as a member for Lake Macquarie after first being elected in 2007. Greg Piper, first of all, congratulations. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, um, thank, thank you. That's the first I've been getting some figures uh, like that. So uh, thank you very much for that. Well, thank you to Anthony Green. That's a, that's a great moment for our night as well. Just a question. You played a very big role in during the last government as an independent. Uh, how do you think that's going to change if we do get a change of government? Well, it depends on um, just what the numbers are, how it falls out with uh, crossbench or whether there's a uh, majority government. But uh, regardless, uh, I've always been uh, willing to talk to uh, both sides. I've worked well with the coalition, to some people's chagrin, but uh, we certainly uh, have a good working relationship with uh, many people in the, in the uh, Labor opposition. If, and if they form government, well, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Greg Piper, Ashley Raper here. You've made it quite clear, you're less pushy than some others on the crossbench, but you have made it clear that gambling reform and integrity measures, especially around the grants program, are top of your agenda in the next parliamentary term. How will you tackle them uh, if there is a new government, especially a Labor government? Well, Ashley, uh, I think you've sort of seen me operate in the past and I'll be working obviously with uh, other members of Crossbench, namely uh, Alex Greenwich and uh, Joe McGurr, but uh, we have the Greens there. So we'll, we'll have to enter into some discussions about uh, issues around gambling reform, but uh, we've said we're not going to back down. Now, uh, Chris Minns, I think, has been probably a bit weaker than um, not just we would have liked, but many people in his own party. So I'm happy to sit down and talk to Chris, if that's how it pans out, and let's find a way through this. But this is our opportunity, Ashley. I'm, I'm not going to let it go. We've got a really big problem. We've got a gambling addiction in New South Wales. It's harming families. And we've got a uh, Crimes Commission report saying it's going to be a problem for money laundering. We're not going to let it go. Have you had any discussions with, with either side heading into to tonight? Um, Ash, Ashley, it'd be uh, uh, overstating it to say there's been discussions. We have uh, identified the lines of communication, let's put it that way. So no discussions, no negotiations, no deals, but we do know if it comes down to a minority uh, government situation, who it is who's been uh, delegated from those um, parties to uh, have those discussions with. So um, we're, we're, we're not there yet, but I would expect that um, maybe later tonight, but certainly tomorrow, we'll uh, start to have some of uh, a firmer, firmer idea of where we go there. 
Last time there was a, was a hung parliament, 1991, the Griner government, and there was a memorandum of understanding signed with the three independents, Clover Moore, uh, Peter MacDonald and John Hatton. Would you be looking at doing something like that? Do you th think there needs to be a special signing? Um, look, I, I, th I think that uh, agreement maybe needed to uh, be got out of the drawer and uh, the dust brushed off it because I think there's been a lot of slip in the way uh, things have been done in uh, New South Wales. But uh, can I just say some of those areas of reform are really around uh, fairness and equity in the distribution of, uh, of, of, of taxpayer funds, particularly, say, through the grants programs. And we all know um, that the, uh, there has been rorting of them. Whether it's legal or not doesn't come into it. It's really offended many people. And uh, I think that we need to address those issues. There's no doubt many other things as well, and uh, we'll be discussing them. But I think um, Alex and I and Joe uh, and others, we've uh, held ourselves, uh, you know, as, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe overly some sort of a bit, bit, bit righteous. That's not our intention. We're just trying to do the right thing by the people of New South Wales and, of course, by our electorate. Greg Piper, thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much. This is the seat of Epping in Sydney's northwest. It's held by the Liberal leader Dominic Perrottet and has had a major realignment of boundaries. But those boundary changes have had little impact on his margin. It covers places like North Rocks, Beecroft and Carlingford the latest for the latest election news you can head to the ABC News website or download the ABC News app this is New South Wales Votes, live from the ABC Election Centre. I'm David Spears. And I'm Sarah Ferguson. Let's get the latest on the count with Anthony. What have you got? Look at the first preference votes at this stage. Now, this is starting to slip as we get more for the Liberal Party, as more of the urban boots come in. It's now 34.7 against 37.1 for Labor Greens, 9.7, 15.5 there for others. If we look at the swing that's occurring, it's a six and a half percent swing. That's the swing Labor needs. Mm. That's starting to appear now. For, for, and, for a majority. For yeah, a majority. And yeah. I was just looking at, now, one of the difficulties is I've got, already got Labor you know, in our predictive model, uh, gaining four of those key seats they need, but all of them are on counts under 3%. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I could get adventurous and call those seats now, but they're 3% <coughs> first preferences, 1% two party preferred. We admire your caution. I think it is appropriate to wait, <laughs> yeah. but I think the picture is firming up that it's very difficult for the coalition to, to, just, to survive that swing. And if I break that swing down, let's look at in Sydney, uh, it's up to 7.9, and that's difficult. And if I look at Western Sydney, it's only 2.6. I think we just haven't got much figure. So it's a bit hard to work out where that swing's coming from now, see that figure. So let's go and have a look at the primary vote again. That's Western Sydney. You'd expect that to be like that. The chamber, I'll just have a look at the chamber. We don't often fill this in that early, but let's have a go. The seats we've definitely given away, which is a little bit more than what we're showing on the board. The coalition's on 16, Labor's on 17. But as I said, the Labor Party is doing well in seats. It's just that... Uh, Given, given how many seats are under 5% counted, it's a bit hard to call the election, but it's looking good for Labor. OK, uh, and as I say, we admire your caution, uh, a responsible approach. Tony Barry, let me ask you, <laughs> you might be able to lean in a bit, bit heavier. While Anthony was talking just in the last few minutes, count's gone up to 7% statewide now, so we're starting to get something a bit more meaningful and reliable. The swing is now 6.7%, so it's increasing towards Labor. Anthony says it's going to be difficult for the Liberals to survive. How do you describe this sort of figure at the moment? Yeah, well, there's nothing to suggest in any of the numbers we've seen that there's a swing to the Liberal Party or the coalition. Mm. So that in itself, given that we're already underwater at 46 seats, uh, makes it incredibly difficult. But uh, it is early in the counting. Uh, we're yet to see the impacts of the optional preferential voting, which will have a, it'll have a big impact in the teal seats and the western suburbs in particular. So uh, not, not a lot of uh, to be hopeful for, but um, uh, I wouldn't be calling it just yet. Uh, Matt Keane, not a lot to be hopeful for. 
Oh, no. Well, I mean, the overall 2PP uh, numbers there mm. reflect news poll this morning. But yep. what I will say is the Teal vote and also the One Nation vote will distort things. We saw in mm -hmm. Western Sydney just before that there's a smaller vote, a uh, smaller swing against the government in mm. Western Sydney uh, and compared to Sydney overall. So, look, it's too early to tell. Mm. But what we do know is that the big swings that were predicted uh, haven't aren't materialising at the moment. So uh, we are still optimistic at this stage. But, but we've got some results that have come through. Well, just before you get to that, yeah. I mean, this, just to be clear, the swing at the moment is 6.7%. That's a... It's a decent swing to Labor. That's overall. That's in yeah. line with what News Poll said this morning. Mm. But what we saw when Anthony just went to Western Sydney, the small the swing was yes, much smaller. Was smaller now, it's still early days, um, but we're also getting some results like Willoughby, for example. Uh, 10,000 votes have counted. Larissa Penn, the independent, has gone backwards on the, the by-election result. So that looks like holding up for the government. Uh, North Shore, again, the boosts that have come in, Felicity Wilson is holding strong. Four Clues, which is in the seat of Wentworth, uh, that was lost effectively at the federal election. Uh, that is holding up very strongly. But you're talking here about seats the Liberals already hold, mm. that you're doing well in. I mean, that's, that's great in those individual seats, but you need to gain seats and stop losing seats elsewhere. We need to hold on to what we've got. Yes. That, that's basically the equation here. What is that I'm the saying, best you've got at the moment? Yeah. Well, th that's what I'm saying. Well, We're bring, holding our existing Anthony, real can, estate Can we moment. bring you in on this? Is that Western Sydney swing relevant or not, or is Matt Keane holding on to a rope hanging off a cliff? Uh, well, I just had a look there. There's, there's odd things, like there's a swing against Labor in Mount Druitt, uh, but all this, you know, a couple of set prospect, there's a swing against Labor in Prospect. Now, they're not going to lose either of those seats. Mm. What matters is your Riverstons and your Winston Hills and, and, and Heathcotes, those sorts of seats. Now, and Labor is ahead in all of those seats. Now, as I said, um, the, problem, the difficulty is these are all on 3 and 4%. Mm. And, and really, I've got three or four percent. I've got one percent two party preferred. And I, I really would like to stress there are redistributions that have gone on since the last election. Mm. And there are polling places that are coming in that either didn't exist last mm. time or were joint polling places. Now, I think some people, some people, um, as the national broadcaster, I don't think it's my responsibility, but I've been calling on those numbers. It's really leaning towards Labor. Let's have a look. Mm. Let's have a look, though, at some of the seats um, that, that Matt Keane's talking about there. We'll start with Lane Cove, uh, Anthony, the, um, the Minister for Planning, Anthony Roberts, uh, trying to hold on, but you've got a Climate 200 independent running there. Yes, and at this stage, she's finishing third. Now, these are the seven polling places on first preference here, and uh, 45 to 31, an independent third. The problem for like, the Liberals would be if the independent finished second. And at this stage, I don't think on those numbers, uh, the Liberal Party is going to finish, projected to finish on about 43% first preferences. And I don't think they're going to get run down from 43%. So that's looking reasonably good for Anthony Roberts in Lane Cove with, that's four and a half percent. So you want a bit more counting, but uh, that's an encouraging figure for him. What about North Shore, Anthony? There we've got Felicity Wilson as the sitting Liberal MP. What's happening in North Shore? Well, at this stage, 3.2% counted. Um, Eight polling places, though, again, this is issue with these small polling places. These are good figures for Felicity Wilson. Um, Labor's actually second at the moment. Helen Conway sec uh, sev is on 17%. Uh, if I look at the polling places, what matters if you get is when you get the polling places from Mossman and there's nothing come in from there yet, it's highly likely that Helen Conway will do better at that end of the electorate. So uh, we're not calling North Shore at this stage, but I'm sure Felicity Wilson is pleased to see herself ahead on those figures. The seat of Wakehurst uh, on the Northern Beaches as well, Brad Hazard's going at this election. Uh, so uh, Toby Williams, the Labor candidate, an independent, but not a climate 200 independent. Yeah, and the Liberal Party's in trouble here. We've got 15% counted. Michael Regan's on 38%, Toby Williams on 35 If uh, Michael Regan is ahead on first preferences, he will win that contest. Mm -hmm. He will get preferences from Labor and the Greens and Michael Regan would win. So at this stage, um, just looking here, we'll leave it a little bit longer. But yeah, I think Wakehurst is looking very strong for Michael Regan. We've got 12 polling places and from um, a relatively large representation of the electorate. Not many from French's Forest yet, but a lot, of, a lot from along the coast. That... Um uh, final one there, uh, Willoughby, uh, that Wakehurst, uh, just before we get to Willoughby, that Wakehurst mm. result, uh, Matt Keane. 
Terrible for the, for the Libs. Yeah, very difficult from there. Mike Regan is the mayor of the Northern Beaches. Mm. He's been in local government for 15 years. He's not a climate uh, 200 teal. He's a genuine mm. independent, yeah. and it was always going to be one that we would struggle to win. I think he, I think he said that he told his, uh, his workers that he wanted Anthony Green to make him the first call of the night, so he was, <laughs> he was obviously feeling optimistic earlier today. <laughs> uh, and a final one, Anthony, if you can show us uh, Willoughby as well. Now, this is um, the, the seat that was once held by Gladys Berejiklian, of course. Mm. Tim James now holds the seat. And Larissa Penn's running second. She gave Tim James a bit of a fright at the by-election um, in February 2022. Uh, now, she's looked like she's going to give him a bit of a fright again this time. He's on 40.9. We're projecting his first preference will be slightly higher. Mm. Um, I think Larissa Penn, Larissa Penn's running on a number of specific issues that may not run across the whole, whole electorate. So at this stage, we've kept this one in. We've got this one in doubt. I think that's fair enough. But uh, Tim James would be happy to have a four in front of his percentage at this stage of the night. Mm. Um, we've got a preference count in six polling places, which put Larissa Penn ahead. I'm um, looking at the polling places. They're all a couple of small ones, North Sydney boys and girls, which are outside of the electorate. Election manager's office, they're not a good representative sample at this stage. So you certainly can't call Willoughby. All right, Anthony, uh, thank you. I want to go to Goulburn now and talk to the, uh, well, the federal member for Hume and the shadow treasurer, Angus Taylor, who's joining us uh, from the, the party function there tonight. Before we get your thoughts generally about how the uh, New South Wales government's looking at this point in the evening, what about there in Goulburn? Uh, what's your sense? There's a bit of a swing towards Labor happening? Yeah, it's tight, David. We, we always knew it would be tight. Um, Goulburn's generally pretty tight and we've seen some redistribution which probably hasn't been helpful but nonetheless uh, Wendy Tuckerman I think has performed well and uh, she's been a remarkable local member we've seen incredible investment going to this this town and this region and, and it's in a very very healthy state but we'll see how it plays out over the next little while I think like in a lot of places we're seeing a big third party vote a big shooters and fishers vote we didn't have one nation running uh, but the shooters have clearly picked up uh, some extra votes, so it means it's, it's hard to pick at this point, but let's wait and see. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, generally, we're looking at a swing at the moment across the state towards Labor of uh, just over six and a half percent. What do you put that down to? Well, well I, look, David, I'm not going to read too much into early results because we had a big pre-poll and uh, of course, the pre-poll is very important in it. Um, but look, there's no question in my mind that cost of living, inflationary pressures is really tough for incumbent governments. There's no doubt about that. People are looking for who to blame for the fact that mortgage payments have become very tough, uh, paying the, the grocery bills, um, uh, paying uh, the childcare fee, you name it, uh, it. It's become very tough for many families, and, and that, that is a tough time for incumbent governments. But I, I think uh, we've, we've also seen a remarkable performance from the New South Wales Liberal government over 10 years, where we've seen incredible investment in regions like this in Goulburn. Uh, and uh, I certainly think it's a, a government that deserves to be re elected, but let's wait and see. Um, but uh, on these numbers, perhaps not a government that's going to be re-elected. Um, talking about those, what's happened in the economy, should the New South Wales government have responded differently when interest rates started skyrocketing? Should they have been more nimble, taken a different approach in the campaign? Well, I'm not, there's a, I'm not sure there's a lot more they, they, they could have done, to be honest with you, because it's the federal government that has the macroeconomic levers, and it needs to be pulling those. And my view very strongly, you wouldn't be surprised by this, Sarah, is, is, and I've spoken to you about this before, is that they could be doing a lot more to take pressure off inflation and interest rates. But it does make it hard for incumbent governments. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and I think that's a reality that the New South Wales government has just had to face. Should they be doing some of the things the New South Wales Liberal government has, has been doing, uh, you know, putting cash in people's pockets, electricity rebates and things like that? Well, look, the most important thing they can do is, is, is take sensible measures to take pressure off those, those areas like energy, which are uh, very real pressures, but also crucial. Cash, cash take handouts. pressure off fiscal policy, and 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 the question and was well, about well, you, you know, people money. you know, David, giving people cash. You know that Dave, ba badly, you, you know that badly directed, uh, badly directed cash handouts add to inflation. Is this, course, a, is this not a badly to, directed cash handout? If they're badly, if, if they're well, well, I'm saying that I think uh, Anthony Albanese hasn't focused on the things that are going to take Dominic pressure Perrottet off inflation. Matt Keane. No, Dominic Perrottet and Matt Keane. Their cash handouts. Well. I, 
I work at the federal level. What I would say is that an incumbent <laughs> government at a state level, sadly, has to wear some of that pain, and that's the reality we're seeing. Uh, Angus Taylor, can I ask you, what are the lessons that you are going to draw from what you're seeing, particularly the squeeze from the independents and the teals? What lesson are you taking in federal politics for federal Labor? Do you have to rethink about the way you present yourselves? Well, Sarah, can I just emphasise that in country areas like this, we're actually seeing squeeze from parties like the Shooters and Fishers and, and One Nation. We'll see that in, in southwestern Sydney as well. And so it's across the board. I mean, I think the big parties have, have got to mobilise their support bases. They've got to re-engage with the grassroots. Uh, it's something I saw at the federal election. I think it's something that some of the independents have done very well. And I do think it's something we all have to learn a lot more about. It has got easier for a small party to run a campaign than was the case uh, years back because technology has, has made it easier. So, so uh, I does, think the, does the Liberal Party therefore that is really crucial. Does the Liberal Party need to be careful about being too progressive, chasing teal votes at the expense of the, the, the votes you might be losing in places like Goulburn? You know, a lot of people, David, want to make this about left versus right. I think it's about re-engaging always with the grassroots of, of the party and the grassroots of our regions, the communities in our regions. And that's the crucial lesson. lesson. I, I think we will see tonight those local members who did a better job of that will do better. Um, and I think that's a really crucial lesson we've been learning in recent elections, and I think it's probably one we're going to see more of tonight. It's early days. I think there's a lot more counting to be done yet, but I, there's early signs that that's the case. Angus Taylor, enjoy the evening as best you can. Thank you very much for joining us. We're now going to welcome Thanks, Di Lee to the panel, federal member, independent member for Fowler. Uh, welcome to our panel. We're having a great time. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you. Tell me, what are, you, what are your first observations on what you're seeing so far? Um, I was out, in, obviously, in my electorate, and uh, in my electorate it's actually quite different because they were expecting uh, an independent, uh, and of course we didn't have one. Uh, and uh, you know the the major parties candidates there, I don't think, present it as an alternative. Uh, however, we do have a large proportion of um, you know Vietnamese speakers as well as mm. Assyrian kind of uh, speakers. So I think it, it'll be interesting. But I think um, the incumbency is, it's not there either. So therefore, there'll be a margin loss in terms of there's no incumbency uh, in Cabramatta, perhaps a Fairfield and to some extent Liverpool as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I'm sure Labor will probably still retain that anyway. <laughs> what do you think the big issues are driving voting? Um, in, in my area, it's very much around cost of living. Mm. Um, people are on a day, I just said to, on Richard Clovers today, people go shopping every day, the grocery bills have gone up, um, vegetables prices, uh, petrol prices have gone up, uh, mortgage, childcare costs have gone up. So everything's gone up uh, there for small business as well. So it's very much the cost of living is very much a priority in, in front and centre of people's mind. Thank you very much, Di Lee. I think uh, Anthony's got some more results for us, or some more information at least, sorry. Well, the figures are now starting to firm up. South yep. Coast, Shelley Hancock's retiring, Luke Sikora, the new Liberal candidate, Lisa, Lisa Butler from the Labor Party is on local council down there. Just look at the first preferences. Labor is ahead. We've got 14 of the 31 first preference votes. Mm. Um, um, 15% there with the Greens. Amanda Finlay is the twice properly elected mayor of, uh, of the council down there. Two-party preferred swing that's going on is a 16.4% swing. Now, at this stage, we're listing South Coast as a Labor gain. Mm. It wasn't one of the first, most obvious mm. ones, but that looks what it looks like. Parramatta is not nearly as progressed, but I think the figures are pretty, pretty decisive. Labor's on 48%, Katie Mullins. I'll look at the change in vote on these ones just to, to show that shift in first wow. preference vote. And the two-party preferred... Is, is now 15.3%. So these figures of sort of, these were the figures that are now coming in for these seats rather than just the small little tiny polling places we started with. Now, Riverston, if I can get it up, here we go, is 4%. Uh, Again, a rather slowish looking count, but Labour is ahead 43 to 41. Now, I'm less, 17.6% swing. I'd have to look at where those polling places have come from, but that's a big swing. It's a rather patchy electorate and there's lots of new polling places. But again, that's a biggish swing. Oakley in the southern suburbs, 43% uh, to 42.6. Now we've got a matched polling place swing here in four polling places showing an 8.7% swing. The one caveat I'd put on that, we've got a, a bigger first preference vote and um, 
the lead on the first preferences projected is bigger for the Liberal Party than is showing up on that two-party preferred. So while that's a big swing, I think looking at the first preferences, that one, well, that one might come back. Ride, um, the loss of, um, I just did the setup here because it's worth talking about the setup sometimes. Victor Dominello is retiring and he's a mm. big loss for the Liberal Party in that seat. He's been a very popular member. Um, and the Liberal Party, Jordan Lane is ahead. We've got 15 polling places in, 42.7 to 40, 12% for the Greens. That's a close enough margin for the lead to be closed on, on Green preferences. And we have a two-party preferred count in nine of the 33 polling places, and it's an 11.5% swing. So really, the swing is now appearing. Um, 8.3% counted in Kayama. Now, let's ask Shaft, we have to do this one. Gareth Ward won this seat for the Liberal Party in 2011. He's been kicked out of the party. He's got some sexual offences charges coming up after the election, but he's immensely popular in his own electorate. If we look at the candidate bars here, the first preferences, he's only got 8% counted, but he's ahead on first preferences. Caitlin McInerney second. The Liberals have slipped third. They only really only put a token effort into that campaign, having chosen a candidate very late. This swing is not very meaningful. It's 12%, but it's based on an independent versus a, a Liberal last time. So that's not a reliable thing. But the thing I would say, and let's go and have a look at the Chamber. Uh, we're seeing on the Chamber, if I draw the seats we've definitely given away with 12.4% counted, Labor's 33, uh, the Coalition's on 26. If I add a few seats which are likely, um, when Labor's still on 33. Now, of the seats we've still got under 10%, we're getting Labor up above 40 seats now. Now, they haven't reached 10%, so therefore they will not be included in our numbers. But everything is going towards Labor now that the count's more progressed. The early figures, it was just uncertain to me to what was going on. We'll look at the statewide primary vote again. It's probably a, a good move at this stage. Uh, that's now 34 versus 38, 10% for the Greens, and the two-party preferred swing now is 6.4%. I, I think I can say, I, I, having looked at all those numbers mm. now, I think I can confidently say the Labour Party will form government. We do not okay. know at this stage whether it will be majority or minority, but the swings are now consistent. There will be enough seats won by Labor to finish with more seats in the coalition. So there will be, assuming Labor ends up with a few more seats in the coalition, there will be a change of government. So you're calling it Labor is going to form either a minority or majority government? Um, we've got Labor up above 40 seats. The coalition is struggling to get above 27, 28 at this stage. So on those numbers, it, that's not going to turn around. Labor's going to have more seats in this parliament. It looks like the government has been defeated. Penny Sharp, what do you say to that? Well, we're pretty happy about that, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> to hear Andy Green say that uh, Labor's going to get there, either in minority or majority, we will see. Uh, but it does look, um, you know, uh, virtually impossible for the Liberals to be returned. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're, well, I can also say that we're very confident and um, in Heathcote, it's in the bag, as I was worried about it at the beginning, but it looks like it's clear. Mm. Um, so all, all the signs this. you're seeing suggest that Labor's won? It's very hopeful. I mean, the key thing is how many in the end, um, and we'll be watching that very closely. There's still a few that we're waiting to, to get a bit more information on. Penny, you're almost muted. Is it because you don't want to let yourself believe it yet, or you're just being <laughs> extremely careful? I'm still traumatised from 2019. <laughs> you don't need to understand the psyche of Labor Party people after that result. But look, this is obviously really promising. Um, it's gone. You know, I'm feeling much more confident having seen these figures that's not where I was you know an hour and a half ago so look we're really hopeful um, but we'll just have to see as a few more come in. And before we get some reaction from Matt Keane on that the seats where we are seeing I mean South Coast having flipped um, mm. are you a, a little surprised at where the strong gains are showing up at this point in the night? No, I mean, we've sort of had those as, as outside chances. We'd, you know, we'd heard mm. that they, it might be closer than people had thought. Mm. Um, and so it's just a very interesting picture. We've been, you know, South Coast has been one of those ones we've wanted. I'm the Judy MLC for South Coast, so that's a part of the well, world that I love. And so I had nothing to do with it. It was all lizers. But, you know, the key here is that that sort of swing in the regional area is really exciting for us mm. and, you know, very pleasing. If you're winning seats or looking like winning seats like Oatley, does that mean... You're headed for majority, really? It means we're getting closer as the count goes up, but I'm not calling anything, um, 
you know, we're, we're watching how those are going very closely. I would like to add, though, while, while you've got me, that uh, it looks... It, I haven't seen what the full swing's like, but we're calling Cogra, so the most marginal <laughs> seat. Uh, Chris Minns retained um, on the swings we've been saying. He's been getting 20% swings. A 20% swing to him. Yes, helps he's done being very leader. well. Helps very being good. Leader. Let's take very it to pleased. Matt Keane. Earlier on, we asked you if there was a path to victory. It looks like it's closed. It's very hard to see a pathway to mm. government for the coalition. Uh, those numbers are not good. They're hard to look at. Mm. Um, they're reflective of 12 years in government, a number of challenges. Um, you know, we were well behind at the start of the year. Um, you know, there was the Barilaro affair and we've clawed back a lot of ground. But, you know, it's very hard to see a pathway to are you, government. There. Are you angry with your colleagues like John Barilaro for where this has put you? No, I'm saying that there are a number of challenges mm -hmm. that we needed to work through. Every time we got a bit of a momentum, we seem to have it stopped. Um, in order to close the gap, we really needed everything to go our way. And mm. what we're seeing here tonight is that it's just not coming home. And looking at those figures, do you think that's a minority or a majority government in the, in the baking? Look, I mean, I think Anthony will need to pull up a few more seats, mm. but um, it's headed. it looks headed towards a Labor majority based on those numbers that we've just seen. But l let's see what happens. But it is very hard to see a pathway for the government mm -hmm. uh, to hold on. So just to be clear about what you're putting this down to, in part, the tide going out, is it, after 12 years, but also you're acknowledging tonight that the string of scandals have cost you? I think the 12 year factor. No coalition government has ever won a fourth term in New South Wales. The retirements, clearly you're seeing a trend where there's a retirement, be it South Coast, Ride, Wakehurst, where there's been a retirement, particularly a sitting minister, um, that has dramatically impacted our vote. And obviously, internal challenges um, have, have ensured that the momentum that we needed probably wasn't there. Just the be a little more um, specific or descriptive about internal challenges. Oh, well, I, you know, I, only uh, a couple of weeks ago, we saw a couple of ministers um, uh, have to leave leave the portfolios and MPs. Uh, there were just a series of things that was chewed up time that we didn't really have in getting our message out there. So it was a distraction. We were defending ourselves rather than being on the attack and prosecuting the case to get it re-elected. And this, this, this question won't come as a shock to you, but what now? Should Dominic Perrottet stay on as leader? or should the Liberals move to someone such as yourself? No, I think it's too early for that. I mean, Dominic Perrottet has been an outstanding leader. Let's not forget, he had to replace Gladys Berejiklian, who was one of the most loved figures in politics across the country. So, you'd be happy so for that him was to a stay? huge, he had a huge task to try and uh, replace Gladys. No one will ever be able to replace Gladys, but let me tell you, Dom Perrottet was the so best person. So you'd be happy for him to stay on? I think Don Perrottet is incredible. Yeah, I'm a huge supporter. Um, I've supported him the whole way. And You'd be if you happy want to say that's a matter for him. Yeah, absolutely. He'll be happy for him to stay on. I think you got there yeah, in the end. Yeah. But I mean, there's a truth. If there's he wanted a, to, absolutely. There's, there's, a, there's a truth too about what you're saying. I mean, had your party just become too dysfunctional to win this election? No, I don't think so. I think the biggest issue here is 12 years in office. You know, so you accumulate barnacles and, uh, you know, small things become uh, accumulating voters' minds as to why they want to look elsewhere to vote. Uh, you've got retirements of incumbent MPs. I mean, you cannot overstate the impact of losing someone like Brad Hazard in Wakehurst, who'd been the local member for 30 years, Victor Dominello in Ride, who won it off Labor in the original by-election. These were very hard-working local MPs that carried a personal vote and where we had incumbents retire you're seeing that it's had a huge impact on our vote. We'll have a lot more to uh, to pursue uh, with this result that uh, Anthony Green has now called it. We're still to see if it's going to be a minority or a majority Labor government but uh, power is changing hands in New South Wales. We're going to go now to uh, James Griffin, the Environment Minister in the seat of Manly. Let's get a check of the count there though with Anthony Green first. Uh, it's a very, not very well progressed count. Uh, count. We've only got 5% counted. James Griffin against Jolene Hackman. James Griffin on these figures is above 50%. We're projecting he's going to be on about 47 by the end of the count. Uh, Jolene Hack, um, Hackman's on 26%. So she's got to swing to herself, to her. 
she'll get preferences from Labor and the Greens. But uh, the Labor, I think the Liberal Party is going to end up too close to 50% for anybody to catch on, for, on preferences under optional preferential voting. All right, Andy, thank you. James Griffin, uh, welcome. The, um, still a bit to go before you can uh, really can celebrate, James but are you confident enough. you will hold on at this early stage? Yeah, look, the numbers that I'm seeing early on are showing um, a win, but uh, I'm cautiously optimistic at this point because it's still early in the night. Uh, but obviously there are difficult uh, numbers coming in from around the state, which is, uh, which is difficult. Um, and equally, when we're seeing the retirement of giants of the political scene like Brad Hazard uh, in the neighbouring seat of mine in Wakehurst. But look, it's been a tough campaign here in Manly, um, well fought out, uh, but I've been out there on the campaign ground for months now and uh, that hard work is paying off. James, Ashley Raper here. How do you think the Liberal brand is holding up, particularly on the Northern Beaches? Well, look, uh, I think we've put in a lot of work over many years into the environment portfolio and the uh, energy portfolio and credit to, to Matt Keane for the work that he's done on that front. Um, the feedback that I got on the ground during the campaign was very positive when it came to the work that's been going on, whether it was National Park purchase recently, the biggest by any, any government in the history of New South Wales, or our really pragmatic environmentalism where last year we banned single-use plastic items across New South Wales. So it's been a really good response to the environment work that we've been doing. I've been proud to lead that as Minister, uh, but equally some difficult numbers coming in from around the state this evening. But as Environment Minister, you, you were targeted on pre-poll. You had koalas there at one point lying down. I think there was a, a man up a tree threatening not to come down until you were booted from your seat. So, Dean, especially on koala policy and, and perhaps the, the perception that you haven't done enough there, has that been damaging to you in your seat? Well, look, the, uh, yeah, there was koalas there all pre-poll and I note that the gentleman said he was only going to leave when I lost, but he left a couple of days ago, so I don't know how we read into that. <laughs> but, um, look, it, it was uh, an, an interesting pre-poll. Um, koalas with uh, wearing thongs walking around the Corso uh, is not often seen. But, look, we've got the biggest koala strategy in the country, $190 million rolling out, and they were the facts that I was able to talk to people about. Here is the reality in the work that's being done, and once I understood that, uh, they were really happy with, uh, with the work that was being done. But look, it's a difficult night, but uh, I was targeted early on by the Teals uh, front page um, that they were coming after me, and I'm proud of the numbers that I'm seeing early on this evening. James, what I really want to know is that you're under threat uh, from an independent and then you had your mum handing out for the Greens. <laughs> Did she end up voting for you? <laughs> Look, that, you know, that, that is, is still a mystery. Um, I've worked on Mum's vote for a number of years now and uh, she, she has never revealed which way it's gone. Um, but I'm determined to, you know, before the end of my political career to get that vote off Mum and, uh, and I'll do it. But she gave me a lot of curry at pre-poll and, um, you know, on, uh, on Sunday night at dinner, I'm going to uh, remind her of the result that I'm expecting tonight. Well, James Griffin, good luck with your Mum and, and hopefully enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. Cut out of the wheel. How about that? How about no worries. That? Thanks, guys. How about that? <laughs>
on 10, 14.9. There's a 6.6% swing. Now, I thought I'd have a look at the seats that are changing in doubt. We've had a lot of seats which have been changing and in doubt, and the difficulty has been the count just wasn't progressed. Well, a lot of these had now got well-progressed results. So let's look at the changing seats. Uh, yeah, well, we finally got those numbers we're after. East Hills is a Labor gain. Heath Coast, Heath Coast is a Labor win. Technically, it was one they held because of the redistribution. Labor's gained Monero, which makes 28 of the last 31 elections that it's been won by the party that formed government. Penrith's gone to the Labor Party ride. It looks like it's gone to the Labor Party South Coast, definitely. And it looks like the independence has gained Wakehurst. If we look at the seats that are in doubt, um, We've got the Greens ahead in Balmain, so it's been a closer contest than expected. Dremoyne's, the Libs ahead. Labor's ahead in Epping, which is the Premier's seat. I think you've got to wait for more counting on that before you decide. Labor's staying ahead in Goulburn. It was one that the numbers are indicating Labor's going to gain earlier, but that's sort of come back. Labor's ahead in Lane Cove, which we doubt personally. <laughs> it's, we, it's, we've got preference counts which aren't as progressed as the primaries. On the primaries, I don't think Labor's got, I don't think Labor's going to win Lane Cove, but on the preference count we've got so far they are, but um, I'd hold on to that. Labor's ahead in Leppington. We've got Miranda where Labor's ahead, Oatley, Riverston, Independent ahead in Willoughby, Labor ahead in Winston Hills. Um, they're all ahead, so they're not decided. I think the more important thing is these changing seats. There are one, two, three, uh, win, that's a win, but one, two, three, four, five seats. Labor has gained five seats. They will have more seats than the coalition in the next parliament. So they are more likely to form government, especially when you've got three going. So five seats gets them to 43. There are three Greens. There isn't really anybody else who could form government in that parliament. So they did nine to get a majority, uh, right? So they're, they're five. Four to go. Yeah, and uh, I'm just trying to see what our chamber will now grow. We've got, we've got a restriction in the system that we just will not give away a seat until 10% counted. It's yep. the hard way. Thing. No. There's 26, 39. Labor's on 39. So even with that restriction, they're above. If we add some likelies, Labor's now up to 41 and the coalition is still 26. Yeah. So Labor will form government. It's a matter of if they get enough to get the majority government. OK, well, it's a hard enough night for Dominic Perrottet without seeing what happened uh, with your screen there on Epping. I'm, I'm sure uh, that, would, um, <laughs> um, that would... I, I would point out that on federal figures, uh, federal election figures, the result would be down under 1% for the Liberal Party in Epping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a big swing in that part of Sydney in Benelong and Parramatta. A lot of people have talked about the Australian-born Chinese community and the reaction to the federal election. I don't know if that's the issue, but just at the moment he's behind. But uh, it's a different electorate than it used to be. He's picked up a lot of booths, which used to be in Parramatta, which yeah. Jeff Lee got a really big vote in last time. I just haven't, haven't looked, but I'm to be interested to know if they've maintained the Liberal vote now that those areas have been moved into Epping. Uh, Penny Sharp, let me come to you. I know you're texting me. You're texting Chris Minns just to, you know. <laughs> no, I haven't texted him yet. I uh, should though. You should, you should, uh, feel free. Um, so if you're coming into government, firstly, will you be environment minister? Yes. That's locked in? Yes. How many positions have been locked in? <laughs> Really, Chris has talked about the leadership team. So yeah, Ryan right. Park in health, Joe Halen in transport. Um, obviously, Daniel Mulkey is our, as our treasurer. Um, but what, what about energy? Is that going to stay with Jihad Dib or is, is there possibly not a change all of, there? We haven't gone through all of those. It's, the way the Labor Party does this is that it's actually a matter of for the leader. Um, the leader decides how many. And um, Chris has been very superstitious on this campaign. He's really not let uh, any of us know very much about where he wants to go with that. He's just wanted to do one step at a time. Has he let you know at all what now on wages for uh, the public service? This has been one of your cornerstone uh, promises that you lift the wages cap. So what will teachers and nurses now get? Well, they'll get a government who respects them. They'll get a government who understands that the problem isn't just about wages. It's about recruitment and retention. The massive skills, you know, the massive teacher shortages um, across the state. 55% of uh, rural and regional schools have got not enough teachers, nurses, paramedics. It's about actually recruitment and retention. So to go back to the, the point about wages, we've said that we'll sit down with them. Um, we're going to be negotiating around productivity games and we've also put a lot of savings in the budget to, so to help fund this. So how quickly can they expect uh, a decent pay rise? Well, they work through their agreements. So we work through the agreements. There's some of them, and Matt would know this, some of these are coming up fairly quickly, but, you know, but what they really get is a government that will respect them and a government that will work through very closely to deal with the systemic issues of actually making sure they not only get into the system, mm. but we keep them there. Mm. Di Lee, let me just uh, go to you before we lose you for the, uh, the <laughs> evening. 
What we saw in your victory in Fowler at the federal election, uh, now that you can see um, the Labor brand holding up a little better in, in Western Sydney, how much of your win do you think was about the candidate that Labor parachuted in? Mm. Oh, look, definitely it, it's got to do with um, Christina Keneally being parachuted in from um, um, Scotland Island. But uh, me being a local um, you know, councillor also, and, and obviously have a, an independent team and the mayor as well supporting me, that uh, gave us that result as well. Um, so from my perspective, I think what we've done is that we've all made it more competitive in that area because Labor has never campaigned uh, really taken that, those areas seriously. But I think what I did was actually have given the major, well, in particular um, Labor, because the Liberals never want to contest that seriously, those areas, and, um, but uh, it's, it has made it more competitive. So it's great to see people in, in our, um, in the Cameramatta State seat in particular, they're just really fighting for it, which is re really great to see. Yeah. Dali, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll come back to the wages again, Penny. I think we're not done there, but I think in the meantime, <laughs> Anthony's got some more seats for us. Anthony, I think we're starting with Cabramatta. What have you got? Yeah, well, while Dali's here, we thought we'd um, do a couple of seats in her part of town. Um, Labor Party's on 45% camera, and a very safe Labor seat, mind you. Um, I think what is interesting is that Kate um, Ho Hoang, Hoang, I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but um, she, she ran for Labor pre-selection and missed out and has run as an independent. She's actually finishing third at the moment, so she's polled quite well, which means the Labor primary vote's down a bit, but that comes back as preferences and uh, it'll be easily held by the Labor Party with uh, probably about 74% of the two, uh, sorry, about 65% after preferences. What about the seat of uh, Fairfield, uh, Anthony? We've got the, um, uh, there it is, the uh, retiring Labor MP, Guy Zangari. Yeah, well, he's um, always, I, I think, um, I don't know him personally, but from his um, curriculum vitae, he's a bit of a star candidate um, they've got out there, um, who's very well qualified and has got, um, will be a future minister in a Labor government, one presumes. Um, 51.6 against 22% for the Liberal Party. It's not an area where the Liberal Party poll well. A couple of independents got a few percent. But after preferences, um, Labor's going to end up with about 68.6% .6 of the vote, which is roughly the margin they, uh, they hold that seat with normally. I think we've got one more there, Anthony, which is, which is Liverpool with Paul Lynch as the retiring ALP member. Yes, uh, this will be held by the Labor Party. I just, yeah, it'll be easily held. We've got a very low preference count here, which is making it a little, little bit more in doubt. But Labor will hold that seat with 48.3%. We've got, um, it, that, that, that's not meaningful. That's, a, that's an actual preference count on one polling place. I estimate that um, Theresa May will get 54% of the uh, first preference vote. So um, she replaces Paul Lynch, who's the current father of the house, and she'll be the mem new member for Liverpool. And um, while we're down in that part of time, Holsworthy next door has definitely fallen to the, to the Labour Party. Um, Theresa McAleander ran in that the last two elections and missed out. But this time, Tina, uh, we'll come back to it a bit later, but uh, Labour has won Holsworthy. And I think we're probably about the point of calling him um, Winston Hills, mm. Parramatta as well. So the more and more seats are now taking we'll, up the Labour. We'll come back to that. Di Lee, just before we lose you, I just wanted to get your sense on um, the, the lingering impact of COVID lockdowns. It was a big issue in, in these sort of seats. Your, your federal seat, uh, that the Perite or the Berejiklian government, I should be, I should, uh, be clear before that, uh, was, was, you know, there's a perception that they treated Western Sydney very different to other parts absolutely, of Sydney. Absolutely, absolutely. How much of that is still lingering there? That um, look, I think there's still a, sen a sense that, you know, the, 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 the government, uh, you know, really locked us hard. Uh, down harshly um, and and I think at the time we were talking about how we were treated as second-class citizens um, and that I think there's still remnant of that um, in, in our community and so there's the feeling that really we just were neglected by, by, by the government and then at the time as well the major parties I mean the Labour Party didn't come out to really stand up and speak up for our community as well so I think both the major parties were especially in, 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 in the Fowler electorate. I can only speak about the Fowler electorate and to some extent Liverpool as well, but yeah, in particular Fairfield City Council area. Yeah, very interesting, Dai Lee. Really appreciate you joining us. Uh, this Thank second. you. Thank you. Me. Thank okay. you. Bye. I think we're going to Labour HQ now where our reporter, Cayman Gok, is standing by. Cayman, I think you're with the Deputy Labour Leader, Prue Carr. 
That's right, Sarah. I am, and let's just say the mood has changed from quietly confident here. It is much more of a, a scene here. The drinks are flowing. Uh, I, I'm here with the deputy leader, Prue Carper. How's the night been? Well, I think we're seeing some really encouraging signs, obviously, uh, for Labor, and some signs that the people of New South Wales have really chosen uh, a fresh start for the state uh, today and uh, through pre-polling um, and really encouraging some of the seats that are coming out, especially in the outer suburban uh, Western Sydney. Will you form a majority government? Well, that was always been our aim uh, and I think that's what we're heading, um, hopefully, uh, we are heading towards. Uh, but we have a lot of... They can, they can see you on the screen. This is the kind of scenes that we're starting to see here. The mood is very, very positive here. You can hear them chanting our crew. Uh, did you expect a swing by this much? Well, I think we obviously have quite a few seats that we need to actually see uh, the full count for. Um, and it's a very hard task for an opposition to win off a government, a long-term government. But we're definitely seeing some really, really positive signs. And to be honest, I really think at this early stage, we can really say that the campaign, the Labor campaign, was talking about issues that people were concerned about, cost of living, private hospitals and schools, and that is showing tonight. Three months was a pretty long campaign. Do you think, is this the hard work that you think is paying off, or is there something about this government that struck a chord with voters and that's why we're seeing this swing? I think we've definitely seen that what has struck a chord with the people of New South Wales is that we have made the case for change, and we've uh, made the case for change as a team that's done the work, done the kilometres throughout New South Wales, talking about the issues that people, uh, that matter to people um, in areas where we needed to win, um, areas that are still being counted. But the campaign uh, thus far, I think, is showing that we really were listening to people and talking about the bread and butter issues that we, people were concerned about. Do we have enough teachers? Do we have enough nurses? Privatisation is killing people's cost of living, their household incomes, their household budgets. Um, and hopefully we'll see that result tonight. And just quickly, your seat of Londonderry, that's quite, that was on quite a tight margin as well. Are you happy with the outcome or what you're seeing there as well? I actually haven't seen uh, results from my seat. Uh, so I just, I would be very, very, very privileged to be re-elected as a member for Londonderry. So um, I very much hope that's happened. I love my community uh, and it's the best job in the world. And I certainly hope to be doing it in a Labor government. Prue, thank you for your time. As you can see, the, the crowd here, there's a big change uh, from here when I first started and there was no one in the room and now uh, there are hundreds of people uh, lots of red t-shirts and the drinks are flowing every, every time Anthony Green speaks we start hearing these sort of cheers and these chants so uh, <laughs> the response is the vibe is a good here at Labor HQ guys The seat of Tweed in the Northern Rivers hugs the border with Queensland, the state's most northerly electorate. It takes in coastal areas like Tweed Heads, Kingscliff, Hastings Point and Pottsville. For the latest election news, head to the ABC News website or download the ABC News app. This is New South Wales Votes. I'm David Spears. And I'm Sarah Ferguson. It's now, where was that clock did we say? It's 8.17pm and we've got 23% of the vote counted. Let's get to the latest with Anthony Green. Anthony. Yeah, just, just fill in the chamber there to see what it was doing. 41 for Labor. 25 there for the coalition. So lap, that Labor number is going up. I'll just have a look if there's any more which are leaning that way. That gets Labor up to 42 and the coalition's still on 25. Um, so that's a, it's definitely, at the moment, uh, our computer is predicting 50 seats plus or minus three for Labor. So that's wow. somewhere between 47 and 53. So a majority? So 47 is the majority. That's the bottom end of our predictions is 47 at the moment. So they will get a majority? <laughs> I'm talking probability. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> there are 40... Look, it's modelling towards 47. Now, right. I'm talking probabilities here and everyone wants to go yes or no. But, yeah, at the mm. moment it's looking like Labor is on the cusp of majority government and a few more seats will probably decide that. Okay. Anthony, thank you. Matt Keane, well, first of all, uh, are you commiserating with your colleagues or <laughs> expressing something more 
more invective about your colleagues? No, just Which trying to just trying to get a clear line of sight of what's mm -hmm. happening. I mean, mm -hmm. these numbers, they're hard to see. Mm -hmm. A number of colleagues who have been incredible contributors to their local communities and contri incredible contributors to our state mm -hmm. uh, are going to lose their seats tonight. And that's difficult mm -hmm. uh, for all of us on the Conservative side of politics. Yes, it is. Um, just on what Anthony said, he's talking about probabilities. He's been very clear about that. Nonetheless, it does look like he, he's heading towards a saying it's a majority government when this really when the day began did you think that you would end up at that position not even fighting a minority government but a full-blown complete change of government with Labour in the majority? I think we were hoping for the best and mm. preparing for the worst. Mm -hmm. uh, news poll wasn't good this mm. morning and it just showed that it's a traditional Labour v Liberal contest. Mm. All the uh, confected outrage around One Nation being a big player and the Teals being big players, they've both underperformed hugely. Um, and uh, what, it's meant, what it's meant is that this result can be put down to uh, a long-term government, so mm. people looking for change, uh, incumbents that have stepped out uh, and and they've been replaced by Labor MPs or Labor candidates, uh, and also that the government just couldn't close that gap. We were coming from a long way behind at the start of the year. We've closed it, but we just fell short of what we needed to yeah, make sure that it either went into minority or gave ourselves a chance of minority. Penny and also Prue, uh, Prue Carr there, they're still raising issues that were campaign questions. This isn't just about longevity. You made decisions during the campaign. I wonder for you when there must have been negatives coming through on the decision to stick with the wage cap, to not do anything, to not respond when Labor came through saying they were going to lift the wage cap. Was that a mistake? No, I don't think so at all. I think people were genuinely concerned about the cost that removing the wage cap would have on the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, if you blow the budget, then that means you go after other people's budgets. What are so we we're talking being... about? For 1%, what's that? $2.5 billion? Well, um, I mean, if you were to give a wage rise linked with inflation, that was mm. going to blow an $8.6 billion black hole in the budget. That's a huge cost that would have to be paid for either by but, raising but taxes. They weren't, they weren't talking about a, ra a raise at that height, but David. Sorry, uh, Matt Keane, but mm. you're saying what voters were worried about. They've just elected, by the looks of it, a majority Labor government. Didn't they want to see a decent pay rise for teachers and nurses? Well, what we know is what was a key brand equity for the Liberals and Nationals at this election was the economy and financial management. So when we were talking... But was this hard wages cap a mistake? No, it's not about the wages cap. No, it's that's what I'm asking though. Was the, hard wages cap, management. was the hard wages cap a mistake? No, not at all. Not at all. What about the future fund? A brand idea? equity. Did that, did that help what? you? A brand equity for the Liberal Party is always strong financial management, always responsible economic management. And the more we were talking about that, the closer the tracking poll but was coming during the, the campaign. At the same time, Matt Keane, did you misunderstand at some level the relationship that people in New South Wales had with particularly those front, frontline workers with, with nurses and with the incredible job done with teachers during the pandemic? That's where the wage cap comes in. People understood their jobs in ways they hadn't previously. Did you misunderstand that? I think that's a good point. When Labor were able to move the discussion onto the impact it had on our essential frontline workers, mm -hmm. then that drove a vote away from the government. If we were able to move it onto the discussion about being financial responsibility, it drove a vote to the government. So it was a very fine line and it was a very contested space. I just want to get some uh, thoughts from Tony and Cos mm. in a moment too on um, what Matt Keynes just said there, that both the Teals and One Nation have hugely underperformed. I think we were your words, uh, right? So I'll, I'll just test Well, Mark that. Latham was talking about swings of up to 20%, let's not forget, and we're well, not and, seeing that And targeting through. you in your own seat as in, well. In a very personal campaign, mm. backed in by the Minerals Council, mm. people like Stephen Galilee doing push polling in my seat to support- so, What was it, 17% or 26% yeah, actually? 16%. Well, well they, were they were claiming close to 20%. Mm. I mean, that's just way off on these numbers. And mm. it just shows, I mean, there's gotta be some kind of reflection Form where an industry group uh, ha can anonymously do push polling into electorates to back in, uh, you know, a third party campaign or whatever. There's got to be some kind of electoral reform well, around that. I, I, we can tease that out in a moment. The swing against you at the moment uh, looks like it's just over 12%, though. So it's a 
decent swing. Well, the TPP is 60-40. Um, that's, that's in line with the state's I mean, you're fine. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> you're I mean, kind of trouble, I mean the, the, One Nation, the One Nation were predicting up to 20%. It looks like they're getting a 4% swing. I mean, no, so but the swing against that, you, the primary swing against you is 12%, 9% after preferences, the swing against you. So it's, a, it's above average swing uh, against you. Well, look who's getting the swing there. It's the Greens and it's Labor. It's not, not One, one nation, nation, and that's no. the point. Fair point. Uh, let's go to Jeremy uh, over at the big board uh, for a look at the state of play. Uh, David, thank you very much. Uh, look, we've got the coloured pencils out a fair bit since uh, we last checked in with the big board. Look at this. A huge number of Labor seats being hung on to. Some of these ones that are still in black, it reflects the count not being far advanced enough for us to give them away. On the other side of the board, we're seeing incursions by the Labor Party flipping Penrith, Holsworthy, Parramatta, Ride, South Coast, Monero. Just to give you an idea of how significant that is, that's sitting at a margin of 10.6%. This one's on 11.6%. And let's add the aheads in to see who's ahead in the race. We're not in a position to give them away just yet. And that'll flick up in a moment. And what we will see is a lot more of these seats being given away to the Labor Party. So I want to stack these up in a different way. Let's bring Anthony Green across the floor here and take a look at the race to power, how that is shaping up for uh, the Labor Party tonight. We're now talking about a majority or minority Labor government. How's it looking, Anthony? Uh, well, if we can get the graph changed to the uh, Tower of Power, whatever it's called, <laughs> <laughs> the race to power. Right, yep, race to power with the golden line in between. Yeah, I'm just... Um, uh, we can't get the, uh, we thought we were going to get the predicted seats come up, but they're not, so I can't really tell you. But at the moment, what we can say is I think Labor's still ahead in Goulburn, they're ahead in Winston Hills, they're ahead in Riverston. Only they're ahead in on the count, but I'm doubtful that the two-party preferred count is correct. What's happening in Epping? Uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think the, the government will hold Epping. Yep. The preference count that's in indicates that they're losing it, but if you look at the preference flows on the further primary votes, then in fact uh, the, the Liberal Party are holding that seat. So there's a couple of those seats I've had that problem with. Leppington, down here. Um, look, uh, the Labor Party's ahead. The difficulty with Leppington is it's, it's just such a diverse electorate. There's a, I haven't had a really close look at the polling places. There's a bunch of rural booths coming in. There's only 17% counted. And this is, a, a poll, this is a, a, an electorate that cost, crosses three different local govern areas and many, has many suburbs which didn't even exist four years ago. And to what extent are we looking at an expanded crossbench here? Because Wollandilly's been given away. Well, I haven't looked at Wollandilly, so that's, that's news to me. I think Wakehurst has definitely gone. Wollandilly's interesting. Um, the issue in Wollandilly is it's not just about an independent. It's also a bit of a long-standing factional issue within the Liberal Party because um, um, Judy Hannan, who's the independent running there, was a Liberal Party member and was a number of years ago denied the right to actually stand in the election. I just noticed this disappeared off the board. So we obviously just got an update. They're, they're, and, they're regularly updating, yeah. but a few more have been coloured in on that side too. That's right, yeah. So um, I think it was fair. Uh, Newcastle just went there. So these numbers are updating. Um, there hasn't been any more additions over there, but these seats will settle down through the night. I mean, we've given some of these seats away on very low counts. There's a lot more counting to come. We're pretty confident on the overall result, but some of the individual seats may flip-flop. Anthony, thank you. David, Sarah. Hey, Jess, thank you. Well, let's go now to our reporter, Nabil Al-Nashar Al in Parramatta. And Nabil, you're with the Parramatta Lord Mayor and the new, it sounds like, uh, Labor member for Parramatta, Donna Davis. That's right. I'm here with Donna Davis of the Parramatta, the <laughs> Labor camp. As you can see, spirits are very high. Uh, and Donna, as you mentioned, is the mayor of Parramatta. Uh, She's very interested in the community. She's been doing a lot of work over the last couple of years. Donna, you're at 56% right now. Uh, are you still holding your breath or are you finally feeling like this has happened? It's in the bag. Look, I'm quietly confident, but it's still a bit too early. Is it? Yeah, look, I'm holding my breath just for a little bit longer. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of red on the screen. Jeff Lee has held this as a very uh, strong hold for the Liberals, and it remained blue for almost 12 years. How confident were you coming into this tonight that you're going to be able to... Uh, turn it back into red, even though he's handing over to Katie Mullins. Look, it's always going to be a challenge. You know, we've known that this is going to be a tight seat. 12 years is a long time. But also, the community wants somebody that's going to listen. And I feel that they're confident that I've been a strong advocate as a councillor, as a Lord Mayor, and now as their state member. You know, as a state member, I could do that as well. 
I've spoken, I've spoken with Jeff Lee before in the past, and a lot of the boom that's happened in Parramatta over the past few years, he claims credit for a lot of that. What do you say to that? I think that, you know, we always have to acknowledge that governments do good things, you know, regardless of their political stripes. But I also feel that, you know, they were riding a wave, you know, there was a, a wave across Australia at that time. And, you know, now we are in a time where things are a little bit more challenging. Our community is really asking us for help. They know that times are tough right across the world. The cost of living here in, in Parramatta, we have the highest, um, the second highest highest rate of um, rentals anywhere in New South Wales and people are wanting us to be able to find solutions for them so that they can stay here in Parramatta where they want to live close to where the work is. So that's a really important issue. They're also wanting to ensure that you know there is a bright future and we know that Parramatta has a bright future. Uh, another thing is you got a lot of support during this campaign. I, according to what I've read, Chris Minns and Perite both visited Parramatta at least eight times more than any other electorate in the state. What does that tell you and tell us about the importance of Parramatta in this election? Well, I think both parties recognised that it was a must-win seat. And Chris knew very early on that to secure government that he would need to ensure that he had a candidate here that was going to be able to... Um, have that um, recognition and trust within the community. And so I felt quite honoured, you know, that, that the Labor Party had um, selected me, the branch members, and now, um, you know, hopefully the people of Parramatta have, have taken that one step at the ballot box today so that I can hopefully be the state member. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Donna. There you go, guys. The Lord Mayor of Parramatta, soon to be the MP, cautiously optimistic about her chances tonight. This is Coogee in Sydney's eastern suburbs. It was a marginal seat, but Labor is well ahead. It covers a number of suburbs, including Randwick and the beachside suburbs of Clavelli and Bronte. For the latest election news, head to the ABC News website or download the ABC News app. This is New South Wales Votes. I'm Sarah Ferguson. And I'm David Spears. It is just after 8.30 in the evening, so we're two and a half hours into the count. About, well, 29, nearly 30 per cent of the votes have been counted. Anthony, give us an update. Uh, just look at this overall vote again. We've got 33.9, 37.5, very consistent now two-party preferred swing, 7.2%. So it's going up slightly, and that's partly because we're just getting more and more urban urban figures in. If we look at the chamber, see what we're filling indefinitely. We'll go straight to the likely stage this stage this time. Um, Labor's up to 46. Uh, they're on the cusp of majority government. Um, and if I'm just going to look at my screen of the overview, um, We've now got Labor on 51 plus or minus three. So, I mean, it's looking more and more like a majority government. Just a quick question, Anthony. Can you just take us to what's happening in Camden? We mentioned it earlier. There's some interesting numbers there. Uh, I mean, it's going here. Thank um, you. The, the only, look, um, I can understand why people are talking about Camden, but uh, it's only 5% counted. Um, now, they're looking good la figures for Labor. But it is only 5% counted, mm. so... So getting, um, getting a bit ahead of themselves? Well, they're not well, getting ahead. I think we've seen that consistently tonight. We've seen mm. Labor doing well in the seat. But to call it on 5%, it's, I think it's be better off to wait a little bit longer. Um, there's a lot of new polling places in that district. But the one thing I would say, the One Nation's got 14% change in first preference vote. Um, it's what? Labor up anemic. It's anemic. They were predicting huge swings there. It's... Point seven. Oh, do you mean to One Nation? Yeah. yeah. I mean, they basically got the same vote as last time. Yeah. So I think that um, we're seeing there, it's a little, what's the two-party preferred swing? It's 10.7%, it's but again, it's, it's five polling places and 5.1% counted. So I'm a little, little cautious that it's a 10% swing. Has, has One Nation, just off the top of your head, made gains um, in, in any particular seats? Because um, you're, you're right, that's not much of a change on four years ago, right? I will give you... One Nation is polling, what is it, 10% in the seats it's contesting and it's up 1% in the seats it contested at both elections. 
Mm. So it's only up 1% mm. in the seats that it contested That's uh, right. last time around. Uh, the Sorry. Shooters, Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, just have a as comparison, it's down 4% in the seats it's contesting this time, down 7%. They basically halved their vote and most of that is a result of, of those members defending. But, not, but one yeah. nation... 1%. That's so they're not picking up that Shooters and Fishers, all of that Shooters and Fishers oh, vote? Oh, to be honest, look, Shooters and Fishers, I should, maybe shouldn't have mentioned that. That's, that vote has disappeared because of the three sitting yeah, members. Yeah. Mm. Most of the Shooter, Fishers and Farmers vote in the last election was the three members that were elected. So that's why yeah. their votes disappeared. But okay. This is very interesting because, of course, it was one of the narratives that people were talking about before mm. the election started. Obviously, a lot of that swirled around you. Matt Keane made the point earlier that it, this has been overstated. But, Anthony, you were going to say something, otherwise yeah, I was just going to bring Tony in here. They may get the same vote, but the difficulty is if the Labour and Liberal vote swap, if the Labour Party gets ahead on first preferences, then one nation getting 14% and their vote exhausting mm. helps Labour win because the Liberals can't catch up. If the Liberals were ahead, it didn't matter if one nation's mm. exhausted. So it's the change in the major party vote which has actually hurt the coalition. Uh. Um, with One Nation polling well in some of these seats. Tony, can I just bring you in there? Just talk to, talk to us, talk us through what you're seeing with that One Nation vote. What, what do you think it signifies? Well, yeah, I think it's just been a traditional, plain old Labor versus coalition contest mm. tonight. Yeah. Uh, the One Nation party has fizzed. Uh, Teals have not performed nearly as uh, well as uh, some were expecting, and I think a lot of those issues were neutralised. Um, but the big theme that I've seen uh, so far is that a lot of those seats with a high Chinese uh, community uh, population. We've done pretty poorly in. Uh, Ride and Parramatta looks like, you know, we've lost or, or close to losing. And in Oatley, Dremoyne and Willoughby, uh, we've suffered uh, a, a big uh, blood nose. So I think there's a few messages there that some of that, leg some of that damage that we saw in the federal campaign last year, there are legacy effects there in those Chinese votes. Um, we're yet to sort of proper do some proper analysis, but there's certainly a theme there, I think. But your thoughts at the moment, Tony, on why the Liberals uh, ha have tanked where they have, um, what, what would you put it down to? Well, I think it's just been a Labor versus coalition contest and wear and tear, 12 year government, looking for 16, was always gonna be difficult. And, um, and, and we're in a cost of living crisis, you know, which never favors the incumbent. So. I think uh, it's just been a, 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 a typical Labor versus Liberal contest. Can I just jump in, Cos? I wanted to bring you in there because there was some chit-chat in the media about lacklustre campaigns and a little bit of criticism for MINS. It was swirling around over the last couple of weeks. What does 7.2% at this point in the evening <laughs> tell you about those stories? Uh, in part, the wage cap. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, so That's um, interesting. Yes. Mm. So if you, if you look ac across the entire country, particularly the last federal election, uh, the result was shaped by what we define as sort of a middle class, urban professional, usually people working in the health sector, lots of nurses, emergency personnel. Um, we could see that result again replicate itself in, in Victoria last November through those eastern suburbs down the Frankston line. And now we're seeing it again in Sydney in those what I'll call uh, 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 middle urban cosmopolitan electorates swings towards the Labor Party in a seat like Epping, very unusual. Uh, you can go right up and down that entire corridor and it's been shaped by people who work or are associated with that, 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 that rapidly growing industry. Indeed, uh, we're going to get some further thoughts from you in a moment, uh, Penny Sharp, but I want to go to the far north of New South Wales. We're going to talk to Janelle Saffin there in a moment. She has been returned as the member for Lismore this evening. First, Anthony, just give us an update on the count. In, uh, yes, <laughs> there's a lot happening here with um, swings going on, so just uh, give me... Uh, look, Janelle Saffin was having an easy victory, um, a huge um, result for her. Uh, let's look at the figures. Of 18, 19% swing on first preferences. <laughs> and when we look at the swing after preferences, it's a 14% swing to Labor. So I think that's uh, very much okay. down to uh, Janelle Saffin. <laughs> It looks like a Janelle Saffron welcome and congratulations on that big swing and being returned tonight. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and can I say that um, I'm in a bit of shock 
<laughs> and I just want to do a big thank you to my wonderful community. For the last years, we've been through so many major disasters, you know, starting from bushfires to drought to even mice, um, more floods, more bushfires, COVID, and then what was, you know, happened last year, 28th February, 30th of March. So we've been through a lot, and I just feel very, very privileged, honoured, whatever you can say, to be with my community now, and the fact that they want me to stay around with them for the next four years and see them through all of them. <laughs> Now, look, we know it's been a very difficult four years uh, for Liz Moran, for that, uh, that community. Not sure if you can hear me. I was just saying, <laughs> um, I was just saying we, we know it has been a very difficult four years for your community. What are you hoping as a government MP now, as opposed to being an opposition MP, you will be able to deliver for those people? Look, I've delivered a lot anyway, even with being in opposition, and I have to say thank you to the outgoing Premier and the team for that, but also to the Leader of the Opposition, incoming Premier, um, Chris Minns, who backed me every step of the way, and I'll just continue to do what I did over the last period, um, put forward what our needs are, and there are many, and the next big thing, you know, we've achieved a lot, I've achieved a lot, the next big thing is a complete wraparound um, economic environmental sort of package around us to make sure that we recover in the best way we can, rebuild the best way we can, and um, I'm looking forward to some stimulus in terms of our local economy because, yep, we've got environmental repair, but, you know, without building our economy, um, that's, that makes it difficult for us. So they're the things I'm looking forward to. Janelle, uh, actually, Rabbi, you, you did get some of your ideas uh, that was put forward. You know, you got your reconstruction commission that the Premier listened to you on that. Do you think there needs to be a change of approach now under a Labor government? Are there certain things that you want to see done differently now for the recovery in Lismore? <laughs> I want to see communications because, yes, I did get the Northern Rivers Reconstruction Corporation. Great people doing great work. They just don't know how to communicate. So I want to make sure that they can communicate um, better in our community. And as I said to them, you're here for us. And yes, they operate under a bureaucracy, but you know, just some change in thinking because this has to be a community-led recovery right across the whole region. Not everybody was impacted, but we felt it right across the region. And also in terms of, we've got a New South Wales Reconstruction Authority. Um, I really went hard on that, said we needed it, similar to Queensland. I said resilience New South, New South Wales had to go, and it did. And um, we just have to make sure that that works in the way we need it so we get mitigation, adaptation, address all of those things. As someone said to me tonight, Janelle, I trust you to fix the potholes and climate change. <laughs> that is quite a list. Janelle Seven, yes, thank you. Thank in you. fact, we're going to go right now to Anthony because we've got some breaking news. Um, well, we, at this stage, we're saying the Labor Party has reached majority government. If we look at, uh, I'll draw the chamber, and we fill in the definitely ones, we get Labor to um, 45 seats. There it is. Went, just went down one. <laughs> a bit worried about what it's going to do next. The ones we're pretty sure they're going to get gets to 46. We had that 47 one minute ago, <laughs> so it does go up and down. We're confident the Labor will reach majority government. There's enough seats where they're ahead or close to that they will reach majority government. So uh, there's certainly no chance of the coalition catching up. Labor will form government. If they fall one seat, sure, they'll be easily able to govern with a crossbench, either the Greens or the Labor Party, or if they reach majority government, they'll have a comfortable time. And this is significant. This does not happen very often. This is the third time since World War II that Labor's gone from opposition into government. When Neville Rand and Bob Carr did it, they won with just one, one seat. seat. We'll see where the Labor mm -hmm. gets more than a they one seat majority. They tonight. needed two terms to build themselves a healthy majority. Yeah. Let's see where you end up tonight. No, indeed. Uh, so coming back to the point, Sarah, you made earlier about the vindication for Labor and the 
low-risk campaign, as it's been called for, uh, for Chris Minns. Um, just, uh, Penny Sharp, when you look at these results now, the likelihood of a majority uh, government, as, as Anthony has been saying, uh, do you feel uh, vindicated for the approach that was taken? I feel relieved. <laughs> But I think that it was the right approach. I do think that there is a bit of tiredness and fatigue in the community around that very aggressive style of politics. I think that after 10 interest rate rises in a row, people really are under the pump. And I think that speaking to them about the issues they care about and providing a really clear path, and some might say modest plans, I don't think they were modest, but some might suggest they're modest, spoke to them and they could understand them and they understood what it meant for their kids in their classrooms, the nurses in ED, paramedics in the regions. They knew that this actually would make a difference. You will now be the Environment Minister of New South Wales. You won't have to, uh, by the looks of it, rely on the Greens' support. The Greens have been demanding no new coal and gas. Does that mean full steam ahead for the Narrabri gas project? It means that um, it, it's been approved. So um, it's so always yes. been Labor's view that, yes, it's been approved and it will, we're not planning on changing that, it's going to go ahead. What will be your approach more generally to new coal and gas? Well, our approach very much is around the planning system, but it's also really about the three things that we've committed to on climate change, which is we're going to do emissions reductions targets, legislate them straight away, 50% mm. by 2030, net zero. Net zero commission, very important, independent. Sorry to interrupt. The question was your approach on new coal and gas. We have to deal with them as, they're, as that they are approved. We know that they're under pressure about whether they are being approved and we'll be looking at them as they come forward. So you have no problem with them if they stack up going ahead? We have an independent planning system. We support that approach. Um, one of the issues is, of course, that uh, unlike the federal government, when it took government at the last election, you've got an inexperienced front bench. I think there's only one of you who's been in government before the former leader, Michael Daly. Um, it's a very big deal to take over this government at this time with interest rates where they are and no, you know, not, not tailing off yet. Um, how much is that inexperience amongst your colleagues going to hold you back? I think, I, think we're very, I think we're aware that we haven't been in government for a while, but we've also been in opposition for 12 years and we've learnt a lot in that time. And I think particularly over the last couple of years, we've really become very focused on becoming experts in our own portfolios, of having a clear plan about what we want to do if we manage to get back into government. We'll just have to do our best. But, you know, I would make the point that if the government had got in today, there was a lot of inexperience there too. I think, you know, I think someone, one of the commentators at some point said, you know, that's real. I think we're just waiting for pictures soon. I think Chris Minns has left his house. Oh. But one of the things you said earlier, you talked about, um, you talked about discipline. One of the things I read about uh, him is that very unusually for an opposition leader, he did four debate preps with John Faulkner. <laughs> just talk to us a little bit about that. Now it's a real thing and it's paid off the discipline of Chris Minns to bring your party to this point? Look, he's just been extraordinary and I just want to pay credit to him. He's led by example. The man hasn't had a drink, I think, for about 12 months. Mm -hmm. He's been up at 5am running uh, almost every single day. He's been doing the calls um, and I think he's just brought a level of focus and discipline that all of us really sought to emulate. Matt Keane, let me come back uh, to you. I know these moments on election night are very difficult for the losing side, uh, but we still have to ask you some tough questions, mm. right? So we talked a little bit about where to now. Are you interested in being the opposition leader? Well, I think we've got to wait. Uh, Dominic, we've got a leader at the moment. It's Dominic Perrottet. And uh, Dominic Perrottet will have the leadership as long as he wants it. Have you discussed it with him? No. At, so at no point? No. He, he will have it for as long as he wants it. Why is that the best approach given this result tonight? Because I think Dominic Perrottet has uh, done a stellar job pulling the Liberal Party and the National Party together after the loss of Gladys Berejiklian. I mean, that was a huge challenge for us. Mm. And Dom was the one that united the team and was able to put us in the best position to try and win this thing against history. We haven't won from uh, a fourth term ever in New South Wales. Do you, do you, would, would you be more interested yourself, Matt Keane, in making a move to federal politics? No, I'm interested in serving my community of Hornsby. So you will I'm serve interested... Hornsby for the next four years? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. No, I mean, so no, no move to Canberra in the next four years? No, no, I'm, I'm committed to my community in Hornsby. It's an area that I've lived in my entire life and I'm so humbled 
uh, to have been re-elected um, now for a fourth time. Would it have made any difference if Gladys Berejiklian had stayed on as Premier? Would you be in a different position with more of a chance of getting that next term, that unlikely fourth term? We'll never know. I mm. mean, the hypotheticals, mm. um, you know, are hypotheticals. What I know is that Don Perrottet put us in the best position to try and beat history, beat the odds, um, but unfortunately we've fallen short tonight. I just want to, this is a little cheeky, uh, we've got some pictures here. This is Gladys Berejiklian on the ABC panel at the 2015 election. Uh, there we go. We've got also, uh, uh, she went on to become leader, of course. Dominic <laughs> Perrottet on the ABC panel in 2019. He went on to become leader, of course. Matt Keane, here you are. <laughs> 2023, <laughs> sitting on the ABC Looks like election panel. Death. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. These uh, these two uh, did all right. They um, elevated to uh, to leader. So, are, are you seriously saying this is not on the cards for you? Um, what I'm saying is that there are still seats in play. A lot of the pre-polls and early voting hasn't come in. I mean, take Penrith, for example, 25% of the vote hasn't been counted yet. Now, obviously, the trend is not our friend here. But what I'm saying is that it's too early to be definitive about what the future holds. You do know a lot about Dominic Perrottet. What would be your assessment of whether he will want to stay and be opposition leader or go off and have a secondary career? I know Dom's one of the best Liberals that we have in the country. He's devoted his entire professional life uh, to Liberal values and mm. our cause. I mean, he was elected when he was 27 years mm -hmm. old and he's now 40 um, and he's been doing nothing but serving his community and serving our state. So Dom Perrottet's earned the right to choose what he does next. Ash, Ash, sorry, Ashley, you've been listening very intently to what Matt Keane's <laughs> been saying here. I just said, look, federally, there was a lot of soul searching that happened after the loss within the New South mm. Wales Liberals. Now you've lost in New South Wales and there'll be a lot of bloodletting uh, you, you would expect. You have a number of enemies within your own party. Do you think that the, you might be the scapegoat here and they'll look to, to blame you because you have pushed so many policies in this government that they have taken to the election? No, I don't accept the premise of that question. I mean, it's been a cabinet government. We've been a team. We clearly had a strategy to ensure that we held uh, our heartland in the east, uh, had a plan for Western Sydney and also the regions. Um, uh, again, we were fighting against the tide of history. No government, no coalition has ever been elected for a fourth term. We had a number of retirements which had a huge impact on our vote in those local communities. Look at Ryde, look at Wakehurst, look at South Coast, look at Parramatta. Uh, that you cannot deny that's had a huge impact. And uh, we just couldn't get the momentum we needed to win this. And does it look pretty clear to you, just circling back to points you were making earlier, that where the Liberals have lost, it's been to Labor, not to your right flank. Well, that's, that's clearly what we're seeing borne out here, that this has been a traditional Liberal v Labor contest. The Teal threat hasn't eventuated. Uh, the supposed One Nation threat, uh, you know, it's, it seems to have been uh, fizzled out. I mean, the only one hyping it up was Mark Latham and also elements of the media that gave him a platform. I mean, you know, who gives a guy a platform uh, that, you know, does things like he did to Rosie Batty, you know, excused away domestic violence as something that men do when they're frustrated, you know, assaulted it a sounds, taxi driver. Who gives a platform in the mainstream media to that? Well, there's, there's obviously a bit of animosity mm. here, Matt Keane. No, not at all. I'm just saying that sections of the media egged on uh, Mark Latham. They said that they were going to get a thumping result up to 20%, and we're seeing that hasn't eventuated. That's that I, that I, I'm not making a point other than the ones on the computer screen in front of me that those huge swings that were predicted for One Nation haven't materialised. All right, let's go back to our computer screens. I think, Anthony, you've got... I think we're calling this a group of surprising seats is what they're called. Um, yeah, I just... Um, with Balmain, that it's still in doubt. 40.9 uh, mm. to 37, 18% for the Liberals. We've got some preference counts. Um, which is indicating a 9.5% swing to Labor and the Greens are only just ahead. Um, so there's flows of preferences occurring there, which are largely than expected and where, where the information is from. Just look at the change in first preference. The Labor votes well up, the other parties are down. So I think it's Labor's voters improved and the Green voters fallen slightly, which has made it more marginal. There's a lot more counting to come. So probably um, counting, counting that one for a while. But um, that's certainly, that one will be in doubt at the end of tonight. The other one that's a bit of a surprise is terrible. It's, um, I don't think this seat's ever been won by Labor or mm -hmm. and its predecessor, as it used to be called, Gosford. 
always been a, la uh, a Liberal mm. seat rather than a, a Labor seat for a long time. It's east of Brisbane Water along the beach. It's much that, more... That that's a sort of Liberal heartland seat up in Terrigal. What's, yes. what's happening there, do you think? Um, well, it's a big vote for the Green. The change in vote that's occurring there, there's just been a change in vote. Um, Labor votes well up, Liberal vote down, others down up. I mean, it may be down to candidate factors. I think the, uh, there's a 14.2% swing on 16 polling places. That's a very big swing. So there's been a lot happening there in Terrigal. I'll just come back to the candidates for a moment. Sam Borton, I know they named him very early. Uh, and I think he's a, I try to remember, I think he's an ambulance officer or something. So. Penny, do you, do you yes, have anything no, to throw in there? Yeah. yeah, so he's a physio yeah. who works um, at, in aged care up there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he's a really terrific young guy, really involved in surfing, mm -hmm. um, but very, very passionate about the community. Um, and I think that he's just been a great pick for us. And he's worked really hard in a seat that we didn't think we'd ever have a chance in. Mm. Anthony, uh, in your surprise, any more surprises for us? <laughs> no, no, not my surprises. I'm going to just have a look at the changing and in doubts the seats, which are definitely changing. Um, these are firming up now. We have Labor's one Camden. Where, well, the count's very low, but this is following the same pattern as a lot of other seats. It's a low count Labor ahead and then suddenly it all rushes in. So we think Labor's gamed Camden. East Hills Labor's gained Holsworthy. I just, I just point out something here. Camden, East Hills, Holsworthy, Parramatta, Penrith, Riverston and uh, are all seats that were lost in 2011 have been Liberal held mm. three times. So there were, mm. there were Labor seats in 2007 and they've, they've gone back. The, the, for the three terms as state Liberal. But on those other seats, Labor's gained Monero. I said 28 of 31 elections, it's gone with government. Labor's gained Parramatta, Penrith, Riverston, Ryde, South Coast, Chagrill. For the coalition to win government, they need to win at least a handful of seats in Western Sydney. It's not their home territory, but they're probably, I think, going to be reduced to just Badgerys Creek uh, at this election. And that makes it, that's why they can't win elections. You need to win, the Liberals need to win a couple of seats in Western Sydney, and they just don't, aren't winning enough of this election, which means Labor's back in office. Um, now, there's also some doubtfuls. Um, I'm trying to remember where Oatley's ended up. We, Oatley's still the Liberals ahead. I, we had it being won by Labor earlier, and I really doubted that when I looked at the first preferences. So we've got the Greens ahead in Balmain, said Dremoyne, the Liberals are ahead. Goulburn, Labor is ahead. That's just not been given away yet. We've got Labor ahead in Kiama, in Leppington. I've left Leppington where it is because Leppington is just such an odd electorate. It's got so many mm. bits to it. You want to see some of those booths out towards the airport, which are in the, the green belt come in. Miranda, the Liberals are ahead, so that, that's reversed. Pitwater's Liberals are ahead. The Independents are ahead in Willoughby. I haven't looked at that number, so I'd be doubtful of that. And Labor's ahead in Winston Hills. So there's a few state seats still in doubt. All right, Andy, thank you. And it's around this time of night that you would expect a phone call would uh, be made or soon be made uh, from Dominic Perrottet to uh, Chris Minns. We haven't heard whether that's happened yet. Um, Ashley will let us know if, if that does. But Chris Minns has arrived at the Labor function uh, where we will hear him make his victory speech uh, a little later. So um, there, there is movement uh, underway uh, as, as Labor prepares to, um, well, a big moment for, for the incoming Premier, the Premier-elect. And, and, and not least because there were so many experts out there criticising the campaign, criticising the style of the campaign, yeah. and he just kept at it, I guess. No, indeed. So we'll take you to the Labor headquarters when we do see some more movement there. But Chris Minns has arrived there now. He's been watching the count, of course, um, but now has arrived at the function. And uh, I'm sure the uh, Labor faithful will be very excited about <laughs> that. I want to go quickly to the federal Liberal Senator, Andrew Bragg, a New South Wales Senator. He's joining us from a Liberal Party function uh, on the North Shore in Sydney. Senator, thank you for your time. A tough night for the Liberals. What do you put it down to? Well, David, after 12 years, it was always going to be hard to win another term. But I think what you've seen is a very disappointing result in Western Sydney, but a very strong result in the city. Uh, we've held seats in the eastern suburbs, but also here on the North Shore, where Felicity Wilson has held North Shore. Uh, so I think that's a good omen uh, for us, uh, at least as far as our metropolitan status goes as a party. Is there a lesson uh, at all for the federal Liberals in, in what's happened here? Yeah, I think it's a very clear lesson, and that is that you can win city seats if you run a good, strong, centrist set of policies uh, that address the concerns of people who live in cities. And that's what you've seen here with the New South Wales state government, with the policies of Dominic Perrottet and Matt Keane. We've been able to hold 
metropolitan seats that we lost and were wiped out in last year in May. So when you talk about policies that can hold those seats, many of which were lost to Teal independence at the federal election, are we talking about climate change where yep. the Perrottet, Keen government have a 70 per cent climate target by 2035? The federal Liberals, well, you don't even have a target. I think it's a very strong endorsement of policies to address climate change, uh, integrity. Obviously, the government in uh, Sydney had a very strong policy on childcare. So the issues that matter to people who live in the inner cities uh, have got to be the bedrock of our policy offering in Canberra, because it shows that these seats can be won, and these are the seats that need to be won if we are to form a government again across a, the, the country. So winning seats in Sydney uh, is the key to unlocking a national government in the future. And we just need to make sure we have policies that can resonate here in these places. So on climate change, what about The Voice? You're a big supporter of uh, The Voice to Parliament and Government. You've seen the government's final wording now. I need to ask you about this, Andrew Bragg. Are you satisfied with the wording? Are you urging Liberals to get behind it? Well, thanks for that, Spears. Look, there'll be a parliamentary inquiry into that particular proposal, which I look forward to participating in. But I think it does show, as I say, that you can win these seats. Uh, these are traditional heartland Liberal Party seats. These are the seats that we need to win uh, back across the country in Melbourne and Sydney as well, in Adelaide and Perth. And that can be done with the right social and economic policy mix. And I think the Perrottet Keane uh, government, uh, in that sense, did a very good job in holding these seats at this election, although very disappointingly, we haven't been able to hang on to seats, particularly in Western Sydney and other parts of New South Wales. And some very good members are unfortunately going to leave Parliament tonight. Andrew, Andrew Bragg, do you think that Peter Dutton is, is going to be able to learn the right lessons from what's happened here in New South Wales? I'm certain that we will have a very strong position on climate change and emissions reduction. I'm sure that we'll have very strong and differentiated economic policy. And I'm sure that we won't pursue crazy culture war ideas uh, that have damaged the Liberal Party brand in the past. And I think that the Liberal Party brand was hit very hard in 2022. And I believe that there's still some residual brand damage from the Federal Party uh, that is still washing through this result here tonight in New South Wales. Mm. So, you know, that's interesting. You think residual damage from the Morrison government years is partly to blame for what we're seeing tonight? There's no doubt that the Lib Liberal Party's brand took a huge hit at the last federal poll. And I believe that that is still uh, around. Uh, when you talk to people on polling day, a lot of people are still unhappy with what happened in that government, particularly in the inner city areas. And we need to be very careful that we don't pursue marginal issues. And we remember this is Australia, uh, this is not America. We don't want to have uh, you know, marginalised issues or marginal issues in the political mainstream in this country. Andrew Bragg, thanks so much uh, for joining us tonight and uh, yeah, sharing your views of what the Liberal Party federally should be taking from all that, this. Thanks. That, that was a very big concession that uh, you just got from him. But at the same time, I think we're hearing news that Dominic Perrottet has called Chris Minns. It's a very big step, one of the big steps of the evening. The concession speech, we understand, has been made. At the same time that the target has, we think, tipped over to 47 seats. You can see it on the bottom of your screen there. At least that phone call, the two of them get on, right? They get, uh, Would be less, campaign, less not, awkward not than some of these phone call. calls tend to that's be. That's true, that's um, true, but it's a big moment. Matt Keane, you were listening uh, to Andrew Bragg there, your uh, New South Wales colleague. Do you agree the Morrison government brand damage is partly a factor tonight? There can be no doubt that um, there was still residual impact uh, from the federal election. Uh, that said, I think that um, uh, Peter Dutton is trying to take uh, a different path by bringing together uh, the inner city seats with the regional uh, and Western Sydney seats. Uh, What's the evidence of that? Approach. What's the evidence of that? Oh, just the engagement internally. Uh, Peter Dutton offered to come and launch my campaign up in Hornsby, for example. He did, didn't he? Um, wasn't, he, he, he wasn't, he on the, wasn't he on there electronically? He called, got caught away because of the AUKUS deal right. the night right. before. Right. Um, but, but he didn't appear in the New South Wales to, campaign in person at all, did he? But he's someone that wants to reach out across the diversity of our party uh, and has taken that seriously. So I've got why, a lot why, of why, why wouldn't you want the federal leader in, in your setting foot in your campaign? Well, I did. I asked him to come. No, um, but I think he is an asset. There would have been another day to arrange it outside of the AUKUS announcement, I'm sure. Well, to have a...
campaign launch with 350 people like I did. You couldn't just move no, but it any, any No, but he wasn't here campaigning, was he? Three months of yes. campaigning. Uh, well, like, I, I don't organise his diary or, or the Premier's diary. What I do is organise my diary and I ring him up and on I every said, one of do you want to come up to Hornsby and hang out with me? <laughs> and he what a shame, I can't make it today either. So what's the, what is the basis of your relationship with Peter Dutton? How have you found common cause with him, given what you're saying about the impacts of the last election? It's a, it's a, it's a big thing to say to still be saying that there was an impact in this election. You're saying it, Andrew Bragg's saying it. So what is the nature of your, the bridging of the relationship with Peter Dutton? I'm not saying it's a current impact. I'm still, I'm saying that the previous federal election, mm. you can't say it's that felt it didn't now. have an impact. Packed, yes, yes. Uh, there's still some concerns about our approaches to things. Mm -hmm. I see that Peter Dutton is trying to recalibrate on a number of policy fronts, mm -hmm. uh, so that will take time to work through the community. Uh, and I've got confidence that he's taking the Liberal Party in the right direction federally. That said, I don't think the community has seen evidence of that so far. That will take time. Let me go to you, Cos uh, Samaras, because we've now. Um and, and together done the federal election, Victorian election, this election, all of them have seen Liberal uh, defeats, well, Labor returned in Victoria. I don't want to overstate the shift that we're seeing in the um, mm. electoral sentiment in Australia because, uh, you know, Labor has been in government across all states, territories and federally uh, years ago when Kevin Rudd first came to power. But tonight we're seeing Labor uh, take New South Wales, the Liberals are only left in power in Tasmania. What, what, what does this tell us about the shift that's underway, the rise of the millennial vote, for example? What, what do you read into this? It, it's what Andrew Bragg, Bragg touched on, which is uh, you can't win elections without our big cities. I know it's a, an obvious point to make, but it appears the coalition has a very significant problem with metropolitan Australia. It's doing fine in small town Australia, where those population clusters are are reducing in size and political impact. But what, what it's missing at the moment is an ability to talk to that millennial generation. So, you know, uh, since the last time the Labor Party were in government in New South Wales, uh, millennials were 17% of the voters roll, 18% of the voters roll. It's now double that amount. Uh, we've got an, an additional 170,000 renters in Sydney alone. 100,000 apartments were built in the last four years in Sydney, and they've been occupied by this constituency. And when I touched on about wage caps, well, uh, the median age of nurses in this in this state and emergency service personnel um, is exactly that, that constituency that we're talking about. So they've got a lot of work ahead of them to, re to not reconnect, because they actually are not, have not connected with these voters since these voters have actually jumped on the voters roll. So we do know that they only get one in five millennials across the country at the moment, at, at a federal level. A hmm. little bit better in New South Wales, and, and credit to, to Matt and his team for at least improving that margin a bit, but it's, it's pretty dire at the moment. I think we've got uh, Tanya Mahalik from One Nation, a uh, candidate for the Upper House, standing by. Tanya, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Are you disappointed? Hi, hi. Are you disappointed by One Nation's showing today? Well, we've actually done uh, very well. Uh, I've been really delighted with the results that we're seeing in Western Sydney and in Central Coast and up in the Hunter. Uh, it's been fantastic for One Nation. We've got some great people here in the back behind me. <laughs> some great candidates. Uh, look, it's been, it's been a fantastic campaign. Tanya Mihalik, Ashley Raper here. Uh, look, there's been a lot of talk about the One Nation vote in lower house seats, but the main game is the upper house. How confident are you that, that you can increase the seats and increase your dominance in, in the upper house? Well, I think we, we will definitely increase the seats. One Nation right now has two members and I think we'll definitely get four. Uh, I think One Nation's done very well out of this election. There have been people today coming up to me in the booths out here in Camden and South West Sydney saying that they just couldn't vote for the Liberal Party anymore. And, uh, primarily because the Liberal Party has vacated the social and economic conservative space. Uh, they've done it to themselves. I know they're chasing the votes out in the North Shore and Eastern Suburbs, but they've lost Western Sydney, they've lost South West Sydney, and they've lost it because of their race to the bottom with the 100% renewables. It's not what people in Western Sydney want. Uh, they've raised energy bills, cost of living, uh, affordable housing. That were the big issues, and they were just absolutely gutted that the Liberal Party has been trying to outgreen the Greens.
Now, you're a Labor MP and you made an extraordinary declaration when you quit the party that Labor wasn't ready to govern. It's now going to govern. It's now going to govern in majority. Do you regret saying that now? Oh, no, I don't. I, I think Chris Minns is the Stephen Bradbury of, of politics. I think he's won today because the Liberals have lost. Uh, despite having record infrastructure spends, somehow the Liberals uh, ran a horrible campaign. Uh, they've completely imploded uh, and they can't, uh, they can't protect their own base. They're essentially no longer representing their base. And it doesn't surprise me uh, that the people of Western Sydney and South Western Sydney have simply decided not to vote for the Liberal Party anymore. I'm just going to bring so in. I'm just going to bring the, in. The sorry, Party sorry to losing. interrupt. Sorry, I'm just going to bring in Matt Keane. That's okay. Why, well, Tanya? Congratulations! It looks like you'll be back in the Parliament where you should be all along. But um, you know, the, you're predicting swings of 20%. It's just a wild fantasy, isn't it? You just said that the Liberal Party was trying to take on 100% renewables. That's just Matt. blatantly a lie, isn't it? You, you ran your campaign Matt, on a blatant lie. If you are the opposition lie. leader, if you, you are the opposition leader, lie, the Liberals will be out for generations, out for generations. Oh, this, like is, this, is, this is another wild One Nation prediction, which <laughs> will just not materialise like last time. Please be the opposition leader. <laughs> we'll do better. <laughs> well, just what's your response, though, to the point that Matt Keane uh, raised there, that um, this 100% figure is a lie. Huge swings against him. He's had huge swings against him you. in his own seat. Not from he's you. Cost, you were telling me 20%. You have cost your own party government, Matt Keane. You oh, have that's cost a wild, your own That's party. a wild fantasy you from know, you, Tanya. You should be thinking about You should resigning. be writing a you children's fiction about... novel. <laughs> Resign. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's pretty clear there's not a lot of love lost uh, there between the two. Tanya Mihalek, thank you. Unless, Ash, you've got anything else to go back to. Tanya Mihalek, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for joining us. I just, I just wanted to go back just briefly to that uh, issue of the success in the inner city seats being a demonstration that things aren't as bad as they seem. But you're still losing some of those seats. I think Tim James lost. I think you lost Waker. So you're not... It's not like a clean sweep of the inner city. You're overstating. You could have halt grabbing onto the successes in the inner city. Not at all. We were talking about the Teal Wave, the mm -hmm. Climate 200 backed candidates, and mm -hmm. it looks like we've prevailed against all of them. In Lane Cove, in Vaucluse, in North Shore, in Pittwater, in Davidson. So uh, on that basis, yes, we have done the job that we intended to do. But what is it... What what does it leave the Liberal brand looking like? What does it leave the Liberal brand mm. looking like? Well, we've got something to rebuild from. We're going to have to go and have a good hard look mm. at what happened here. Clearly, um, the number one issue driving a vote away from us was the it's time factor. That came through in all our research. That came through in the polling as far back as when Don Perrottet took over the leadership. We tried to demonstrate that we're a different government, a fresh government, but obviously uh, we just got overwhelmed by Labor's disciplined campaign. Now, uh, Penny Shark, I'm going to come, come to you in a moment. I want to talk more about the challenges that the new Labor government is going to face. We're going to check uh, some of the latest count, though, in seats that Labor's gained tonight, Anthony. And we'll start with East Hills, which was the most marginal Liberal seat in Sydney's southwest suburbs. What does it look like now? Well, I mean, it's gone, it's gone home, basically. This was a very... It's, it's, Although I must say it's uh, a little bit closer than it would have once been a time. The electorate has clearly changed over the years. But this was a seat that was one of the last seats gained by the Liberal Party in 2011. They did well, very well to win it in 2015 and 2019. Or rather, um, a lot of um, underhand tactics against the Labour candidate Cameron Murphy at those two elections. Um, with a new candidate this time, it looks like Carly Wilkinson has won the seat for the Labour Party. And uh, Wendy Lindsay, who inherited the seat from the previous Liberal member, or, or won it um, uh, when, they, when they retired at the last election, she's been defeated and Carly Wilkinson is a new Labour member for Eastern Hill, East Hills. The seat of uh, Penrith, uh, Anthony, in <laughs> Sydney's outer west there. Stuart Ayres, the former minister, uh, certainly former minister. Yes, and uh, um, I mean, there was talk that he would come back into the ministry if A, the government was re-elected and B, he won his seat. Well, the first one certainly has, hasn't happened and it looks like he's certainly lost his own seat. He's held it since the 2010 by-election when there was a massive swing in one of those first signs of the fate that, that awaited Labour in 2011. There's a 4.3% swing. Labour's won it with a margin of 3.7%. Karen McEwen, who's... Um, 
She's uh, been on Penrith Council for 20 years, twice de- uh, Mayor of Penrith. Second time she's running this seat and she's now the member for Penrith, defeating Stuart Ayres. It's one of the many seats where you've got a retiring Liberal member and that may have contributed to the seat changing hands. Yeah, and a popular member and also like Stuart Ayres, a man who won his seat at a by-election. That was back in 28, 2008 when uh, John Watkins retired and uh, the week before the by-election, the great ruction that, de- that uh, deposed Maurice Yemmer happened. Now, Jordan Lane is the youngest ever mayor of, um, of Ride. Now, he's 6% behind there on those numbers. We've got preference counts. Uh, look, I'm, I'm, this is still close. Let me see 52. I think it's actually going to be closer than that. Um, it's, we've got Lyndall Howison winning. I think it might be a little bit more in doubt by the time we've got all the preference counts later in the evening. But at this stage, that looks like a Labour gain. I'm just a bit cautious. The Liberals are 3.5% ahead on first preferences. They are getting half of the green preferences. I'm just a bit I'm just a bit doubtful there's a discontinuity there between the first preferences and the re- result after preferences but certainly um, if the liberals hang on to ride it's it's not going to save them in government no and south coast I think this was the first one to flip wasn't it tonight Anthony uh, it wasn't the first because we had such a slow count early on, but suddenly the figures all rushed in and this has been a, a, a big victory for the Labor Party. Um, helped by the Greens, they're getting 16, 15.9%. Amanda Finlay, as I said earlier, is twice popularly elected mayor of Shoalhaven. Luke Sikora, um, he's lost 20% of the Liberal vote. Now, I should say that on the federal election figures, this is in the federal seat of Gilmore and this would have been won by the Labor Party mm. based on federal figures. So, uh, look, the repeat has been here. Labor won it for one term in 1999, Luke Sakura has been defeated, and I'm not sure if it's Lisa or Liza Butler. Um, has Liza? Won Liza. 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 Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, last one, Min- Monero, uh, John Barillaro's old seat. Oh, look, I, I, I think this is just worth talking about. Um, John Barillaro did have a big, mar- big margin at the last election, but it was the first time he'd contested the seat when Steve Wan wasn't the candidate. Mm. Now, in 2011, Steve Wan nearly hung on to Monero against that, that swing. He nearly won it back in 2015. It was a bit of a swing, but certainly it was still marginal. When he wasn't there in 2019, John Barilaro's margin blew out. And uh, with John Barilaro gone, um, there's a 15% swing since the last election. That's still 9% beyond the by-election in February 2022. Mm. So that is a huge vote of endorsement. For, no, yeah. He's got 39% to the Nationals, 379 The Greens have got 8%. Um, yeah, 53 point. that's a big swing. So Steve Wan is back in Parliament and the Labor Party will be happy to have someone who's got previous ministerial well, that's, experience. Well, that's a good yes. point. Uh, uh, Penny, yes. it just takes us to, you've got a bunch of new faces coming mm-hmm. in. Um, I haven't done a count here, but it looked like a lot of women coming in Box, as well. Yes, we're, we've come, I mean, an overall 46% of our candidates were women, but the winnable seats that we've won tonight, I haven't done the ad yet, but I might ask our people who are watching, they yes. might be able to say the three women. What's the what are those, those yep. numbers people out there, you can yep. send me a text. Um, um, but yeah, look, really great. And, you know, something that the Labor Party's worked really hard for for a lot of years. I was at the 1994 conference when we put in place affirmative action. It's taken us 28 years. Well, and he's, uh, he's quick. Oh, here we go. He's, he's quick doing with his stuff. it for me. Quick uh, on the draw. <laughs> what, what on the draw, Mr. Green. <laughs> now, there's a lot of retirements in this election, of course. Yep. Of this. So, Kobe Shetty for the uh, League of the Greens, Sally Quinnell down in Camden, a music teacher. Castle Hills, the new Labor me- uh, Liberal member up there. Richie Williamson in Clarence. <laughs> Clarence, a local breakfast radio announcer, he ran in 2011 as an independent, but this time he's a national. Matt Cross, um, he's a bit of a young up-and-comer in the Liberal Party and won pre-selection in Davidson, so he's won that seat. For the Labor Party, Carly Wilkinson in Eastern Hills, Mary Ann Stewart at her third go has won Heathcote. Uh, Leppington, Nathan Haggerty has won that, Stephen Wan in Monero. For the National Party, Tanya Thompson is a new member for Mile Lakes, replacing the late Stephen Bromhead. Uh, Michael Kemp's won Oxley with Melinda Pavey departing. Don Davis in Parramatta, uh, another ex-mayor in Penrith. Karen McEwen, Riverston, Warren Kirby, Ride, Lyndall Howison, South Coast, Liza, 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 Liza Butler. Um, Terrigal, Sam Borton, uh, which is a real surprise. Four Clues, Kelly Sloan has no difficulty with the independent there. And the two new in, Michael... Regan is the, in Wakehurst. I'm still a little doubtful about that Willoughby right, prediction, yeah. so I'll have a look mm-hmm. at we'll, that. We'll come back to that. And yep. I think we've got a few defeated members 
which I can also show. Oh, we might come back to that, okay. uh, Anthony, because mm. we do need to go to Jenny Leong, who's the um, Greens member for Newtown, joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, the Greens, uh, it's not looks like you'll hold your numbers. Is that the expectation? Look, I think it's very clear when it comes to Newtown that I'm there and I've been re-elected to the Parliament. Ballina is looking very strong. Balmain is still feeling tight. too early. Yeah. It's really tight and we know how many people voted at pre-poll, voted by postal vote. That's a tight race. You know, Jamie Park has been an incredible local member there. Um, Kobe Shetty is an incredible, incredible candidate, but I think it's just too early and too close to be able to make a call on that Correct one. me if I'm wrong, but it, we, this would be the first time the Greens have lost a seat if you do lose Balmain? Well, the first time we've won one. Yeah, for back in a retired member, you mm -hmm. know, like this is the first time that the Greens have seen an, a sitting lower house member retire right. and see whether or not we can hold that seat beyond that. And that is a that's a historic moment for the party, but it's also significant to show the strength, length of time the Greens have now been in the lower house um, in New South Wales that actually we've had Jamie Parker there for 12 years and he's now stepping down. Whether we can retain that seat is, is still up for grabs. It's too, I think it's very, I think Penny would agree, it's probably very close and we think it's too, too, close, close to call. too close to call. I think Anthony's got some green seats information for us, Anthony. Yes, Ballina, um, Tamara Smith, 40%, 25% uh, for the Nationals and the Greens back on, down, Labor down on 22%. You look at the change in vote, the Labor vote down, National vote down, Green first preference vote up. And the two candidate preferred swing there is 4.8% to the Greens versus the Nationals. Mm -hmm. Balmain <clears throat> uh, went up to 40%. Uh, I'd still be surprised if the 4% gap there was closed. Uh, let's look at the change in vote that's occurring in that electorate. Come on. 8% up. It's, uh, yeah, I think I, the retirement and also possible change of government, it always tends to help the Labor Party mm -hmm. when they're winning government to take some votes off, off the Greens along the way. Um, a big campaign there to say vote Labor if you want a Labor government, which the Labor Party have run. That might explain that number. Jenny Leong, 55% um, in Newtown. It's my electorate, so uh, <laughs> certainly, <laughs> certainly not. There wasn't a lot of campaigning in, 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 um, in Newtown. The Labor Party on 30%, the change in vote there. The Green vote up 9%. And, and um, what's the two-party preferred swing now? So the Greens up 62.7% in Newtown. And Summer Hill which was the next seat out beyond Newtown. Joe Halen's got 51.6%. The Greens have finished second there. And in terms of swing, there's a 4.4% swing. That It's a, not quite a correct measure because it was a Liberal there last time, but uh, um, that's the next seat out. But at this stage, I think if you just look at that, that first preferences again, um, there's still, I mean, until the Labor vote starts to drop below 45, it stays a safe Labor seat. Mm. Yeah, Jenny Leong, let me ask you, um, it's not going to be a minority government, so you won't have as much influence uh, over, um, over Labor. They'll be governing in majority. But we did hear the incoming Environment Minister, uh, Penny Sharp, confirm to us that things like the Narrabri gas project will go ahead. What's your reaction to that? Look, I think it's clear if you, you look at the figures overall, and obviously it's it's. It's great to see that that's what we're looking at in terms of change of government in New South Wales and the Greens absolutely welcome that. I think if you look at the declining vote overall though in the old parties and you look at the fact that you're seeing a growing crossbench in New South Wales continues um, to be one of the largest crossbenches we've ever seen. If you, if, you, if you look at that, I think it's very clear when you're talking to the community, people are, are over this sort of winner takes all approach. They actually are wanting people to work collaboratively together and I think when you look at something like the need for action around coal and Gas. The Greens are committed to that, and who, however the the new make of the Parliament sits, we will be pushing and campaigning hard to make sure that we're seeing that reform happen. Do you think? I mean, the, the, the Greens uh, obviously, you know, you've attracted a swing to you, a small one in your seat of Newtown, and there might be agreement with what you're saying on uh, coal and gas there. But in other parts of Sydney and the state. Uh, people are comfortable with where Labor's position themselves on this issue. Look, I think, I mean, I think it's important to recognise that, yes, we've had a really strong support for our work in Newtown and, you know, I appreciate that um, it might not see that there's a, a, you know, the campaign there has been solid, but also we work very hard day to day and you see that with the results for, for Tamara Smith in Ballina in relation to that. When, when Greens members are elected, we work hard and the community tends to support us more in that sense. I think if you look at it across the state, though, the Greens are running across the state and we know that 
regional communities, First Nations communities impacted by coal and gas mines are speaking out and calling out as loudly as they are in the heart of Newtown and the inner west about the kind of need to stop coal and gas. That's a, that's a clear priority. The other priority we're hearing across the state is the housing crisis and rent reform is something we need to see and the Greens are absolutely committed to pushing that. It might have started as an issue in Newtown but it's now clearly an issue across the state. Yeah, Jenny, can I just jump in on that? Totally. Do you feel slightly angry? You have been raising this as an issue last year or, and even before that. You put legislation to the parliament last year. Neither the Liberals or Labor supported it. It was all around, uh, you know, banning uh, no grounds evictions. During the campaign, we've seen both the Liberals and Labor move on this because it has become such a big issue. So are you disappointed that it's taken a campaign to sharpen the focus on this when something could have been done last year? Look, I don't think I'm disappointed. I think who's disappointed are the renters of New South Wales. I mean, they could have seen an end to unfair no grounds evictions before Christmas. Sadly, we saw that the Labor Party wanted to take that to the election campaign, therefore putting a whole lot of renters in high risk of being evicted. We've seen that that has continued. So to me, I feel like the disappointment isn't with me. The anger isn't with me. It's with the two million renters of New South Wales who could have seen that security sooner. At the end of the day, though, the Greens are used to having, you know, campaigns with a long vision for the future. We knew back in 2015 when I won the seat of Newtown that actually we needed to put renters' rights on the agenda. Clearly this election, it's been on the agenda. And we're very committed to making sure that that reform is delivered, but also so that we're addressing the ongoing rent hikes that are happening to people across the state. The housing crisis is real and we saw neither major party deliver a full comprehensive housing policy during this election. We saw bits and pieces of things, but the Greens have put out a full plan and we're absolutely wanting to see that. We're wanting to see the idea of us reshifting and shaping. And that is the hope that people are saying on the streets. We've seen really, really dark days from the Perrottet government. And if this is a, a shift to the future, if this is a genuine fresh start, then we need to be taking both the climate and the housing crisis really seriously. I think Labor did take it very seriously. And I think the fact that you might be going back one shows that people in places like Balmain, where it's too, it is too close to call, but it showed that people actually were listening to it because we know how much of a housing situation it was there. And rental, as you know, it's a big issue there. Jenny Leong, congratulations on Thank your you result. Thank you very much indeed for joining the panel tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank Thanks, uh, Jenny Leong. Now, we're going to go to Liberal headquarters. Uh, Rani Heyman is there. These are difficult nights for a party that's losing in the way that the Liberals are this evening. Uh, give us a bit of a sense of the room at the moment, Rani. Yeah, well, when we first initially heard Anthony Green say that he thought that the Labor government would form either a minority or majority just a little while ago, the mood in this room turned quite sombre. But it didn't seem like there was a sense of surprise. It seemed like people thought that that might happen, and it evidently has. Now we've seen the room really boost its numbers as we're hearing that both the Premier Dominic Perrottet and the opposition, well, no longer opposition leader, but the Labor leader, Chris means have had a phone call and Premier, the Premier Dominic Perrottet has conceded defeat. That's what we've been told from some insiders inside the Liberal Party. We are expecting the Premier to come here to the Hilton Hotel in Sydney where he is expected to give a speech. Uh, after that we will likely hear from the Labor leader but what was really telling uh, not too long ago was we had all the four networks up on this screen uh, just behind me and the screen turned back to blue. So they didn't want to see any more of, of the screens turning red. They want to just celebrate, I guess, the, the 12 years in power that, they, that they've had. You know, a lot of people that we've spoken to here in the Liberal campus said that they're proud of the work that the Premier has done in his time in office. He's, you know, part of a government that's been in charge for 12 years, but he's only been in the top job for not even a year and a half. So he has seen this state through the, the end of the coronavirus uh, lockdowns. He opened up the state. You know, he dealt with some challenges too in terms of the floods uh, up in northern uh, New South Wales and then here in Sydney too, uh, where the devastation was quite bad. So he has had uh, some wins and some challenges along the way, but we will hear from him tonight as to how exactly he's feeling. We know that the Premier is very energetic. He was very keen throughout the campaign. He left no stone unturned. So tonight we will hear from him when he eventually arrives here at the Hilton in Sydney to see what he has to say to all of these supporters and mainly those who have been on pre-polling booths 
throughout the day. And uh, so that's, that's what we're going to hear very, very shortly. Thank you. Why do I get news from ABC Online? Well, it's part of my daily routine. I check it on my phone. I can focus on local, national or world news. I trust it. And it's free. It's free. Go to news.abc.net.au or the ABC News app. This is New South Wales Votes Live from the ABC Election Centre in Sydney. It has just gone 27 minutes past nine. 41% of the vote has been counted. Labor has won a majority in New South Wales. I'm David Spears. And I'm Sarah Ferguson. Let's go to the latest with Anthony Green. Anthony. Yeah, I thought I'd have a look at some of the, the swings in different parts of the state. The statewide swing is at 7%. If you look at Sydney, it's 75 uh, We'll take, take them off one by one and have a look at uh, what's the Hunter in the Illawarra. It's 6.6% uh, in country New South Wales. Let's see, regional. Get rid of that one. Come on. Thank you. And there we are, 5.8%. So it's slightly smaller. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot of talk of Western Sydney. It's actually a much smaller, smaller swing than you expect in Western Sydney. Uh, that's basically everything. Uh, to the west, I think there might be a lot of patchy swings there. And in fact, uh, I haven't had a good look at it yet, but I've got the suspicion that those seats the Liberal Party hung on to for three elections, they're the ones that have swung, is that I think the last two elections, the Labor Party just focused on actually trying to just pick up some of the seats that were traditionally theirs. And the seats which they're picking up now are the seats which are more likely the ones which put them into government. But when they were left with only 20 seats in 2011, they had a long way to come back. They got a bit of a boost in that second, in 2015, by the Liberal Party losing so many members through various scandals on the Central Coast. The Liberals might have won a few extra seats if it hadn't been for that. And then in 2019, they only won two extra seats. Labor Party. But this time, there's a whole bunch of seats where I think having secured 38 as a bench, as a beachhead, they had time to devote the energy mm. to the seats beyond that. And some of these seats, like if you look at the federal figures, Riverston, Parramatta were very clearly seats that Labor could win. Uh, Penrith and East Hills, they had better results at the federal le level. But some of these seats, and even South Coast um, was a, and Kayama were Labor seats on federal figures. Um, I just um, wanted to talk about one uh, little oddity of a seat, um, which just has come up. You were talking about where One Nation has done well. They've done well in Cessnock, where they've got 14.7%, just ahead of legalised cannabis. And the reason that they're there is because Ash Barnum, the National Party candidate, was disendorsed for that bane of modern election campaigners, inappropriate social media postings. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's, that's why that result looks like that. The, the National Party didn't register a out-of-out card they, and they didn't do campaigning. So uh, that's what happens when you uh, get a candidate that stops campaigning. Just back on the Labor swings, yeah. where are they strongest? What part of Sydney are, are they strongest? They, they have run up even in seats they're holding, like Chris Minns's uh, seat of Cogra, run up big swings there as well. Is that but, what's contributing to the statewide 7%? Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't looked at it. Actually, let's, can we have a look at... No, it's too hard to get to Cogra right this minute. But it's certainly... Um, it's certainly uh, I'll have to look at my screen to just get these numbers um, because I do actually have those two-party preferred swings by mm. region. Uh, let me see. We can, we can come back to that. No, no, I've got them. 6.4% um, in the inner city, 86 on the North Shore, where the like, Liberal Party got lots right. of votes to lose. 9.8 in southern Sydney and 6%, 6 in western Sydney. Now, I'm not sure what that swing was that I brought up then. The swing is 6% in Western Sydney. Because that was suggesting only one, one or two. Yes. Yeah, that just, <clears throat> maybe I brought up Western New South Wales. Let me... Because uh, it sounds like a big swing in Southern Sydney to Labor and yep. possibly and Western Sydney. 6%. Just let me check that I brought up the right graphic. No, I brought up Western New South Wales. Okay, okay. Okay. Fail well, yeah. by the operator. It's a 6% swing. No, OK, good to clarify that. So they, they have had uh, solid mm. swings across Western and Southern Sydney as well as other parts. Penny Sharp, let me bring you in here. Um, a, a, another sort of big picture question here with Labor in power now in every mainland state. This doesn't happen very often. Um, what can we expect, of course, in power federally as well? Are we going to see progress made on issues of federation reform, tax reform? What should we expect? 
I think you should expect that Chris Minns will be in New South Wales's corner um, and that's what he will be his priority. I think that, we you know, by having parties at the, of the same type at that level, um, I think there's some more open dialogue perhaps and you can kind of work through those issues. But I don't think anyone should, should think that for a minute... Don't get, that, that, don't, get too, don't get too excited that all of a sudden we're going to do that. I mean, the GST is an issue. I mean, Mark McGowan's already been out saying don't touch our GST. I think Chris will be pretty keen on pursuing that. So, you know, I think... I think what it does allow is that kind of open dialogue. There's a lot of long-term relationships and understanding. People work together. Obviously, Anthony Albanese is from New South Wales. He's well known to all of us. So I think that's that's the hopeful part. Whether we can get at some other reform, we'll just have to wait and What's see. What's going to happen uh, on in energy? You've also got Chris Bowen, the energy minister, who's also from the New South Wales federal seat of Fairfield. So who's he? I asked you before whether Jihad Dib was going to be the energy minister. You say you don't know that yet. But how important is it going to be to have someone working closely with Chris Bowen with those big energy questions Oh, coming? look, it'll be essential. We know that the energy pressure in this state is getting harder and harder. We have need to transition to renewables as quickly as possible. We've got the issue of the ageing coal stations. Um, we need to work very closely together to see how we can make that go faster. I that, think everyone agrees yeah. with that. Do you keep the Araring station, coal-fired power station, going longer? Well, Chris has said he's willing to look at it. I mean, I mm. think it's that serious. Yeah. AEMO, you know, the AEMO tells us that we're hitting a cliff. You can't have the lights go off. You've got to work through. But the real, so you, the longer term it, thing is about, it, the, the real issue here is how fast can we make this massive transition? So as Environment Minister, uh, it is interesting because you, you've, you've, you've said you know, things like the, uh, the gas project Narrabri will go ahead, the extending the life of big coal-fired power stations as well. You're OK with that? I'm not thrilled by that at all. Um, we're pretty annoyed by the whole Araring issue, about the privatisation of it, about the fact that it's not, it's, you know, been coming offline too early. Um, we think that a lot of that is actually about, you know, problems with the government and some decisions that they've made. Um, so no, we're not thrilled about it, but we're also serious about making sure that industry can keep going. But investing, we've, we're putting a billion dollars into our, um, you know, energy security corporation, which is about making and accelerating that transition into renewables as fast as possible. Look, Matt did a pretty good job on that, but you know the renewable energy zones are slow. There's not enough actually getting into the ground quick enough, and that's what we need to do yeah, too. And that's my question. Do you think that the investment hasn't come? You know, your policy ha has been supported by by everybody, and it is a good policy. But is there a feeling from Labor that that investment just hasn't flowed as it as it should have? Look, it's just been too slow. I think that that's just the reality of that. Um, and what we you know what we've got to do is get our skates on and, and do that as quickly as possible. It's the, it's the only long term solution. Penny Sharp, thank you very much. We'll return to that. But we haven't heard from our friend Jeremy for quite a long time. Here he comes. <laughs> What's going on over at the big board? Well, look at the board. It's changed quite substantially. The most notable thing here is that we have given away all the seats on the Labor side. Heffron was the last one to come in. It was a fairly slow count there. But if you think back to earlier in the night when we talked about Labor having to hang on to its side of the board and make gains, it's exactly what they've done. All the seats that it had going into this election, it's kept and it's made incursions onto this side of the board. So that is how they get to a majority. They needed to pick up nine. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's go ahead now and add the seats that they're ahead in. This is just about building Labor's majority. They're ahead in Goulburn, Winston Hills, Holsworthy, Oatley, Kiama. These numbers might shift slightly as the count progresses, which is why we're not giving them away just yet. But just to give you an idea of how far up the pendulum they've reached, Terrigal, 12.3% given away to the ALP. Let's reconfigure this and take a look at the race to power. This expresses the stack on either side and gets Labor to 46. These are the seats they're ahead in. Even if they win one of these, they'll be in majority, which is likely. Um, and on this side, conversely, how far behind the coalition is. Let's bring in uh, Cos Samaras and Tony Barry again. Cos, um, what do you reckon about some of these seats. In this projection, mm. we can see a very particular trend here. I just want to point out East Hills, Penrith, Riverston, Parramatta, Camden, Ryde. These are some of the critical seats in Southern and Western Sydney. Is there anything particular about these seats that kind of makes them all drive the same way? They're ALP pickups, which were Yes, for the coalition. Uh, there, there's, there's an element to, again, I'm going to come back to property prices in Sydney. So uh, you can still buy and live in these areas uh, around one to two million dollars in terms of buying a house. Now that's 
for everyone probably uh, listening to this, listening or viewing this, this, this program will say that's a lot of money, but that's actually quite the norm in Sydney. Uh, anything beyond that is where Labor does get into trouble when it comes to picking up additional seats. So it really is, uh, th there's, there's, a, there's a property market element to, to this result as well, along with all the other points we've made, which is around renters and, and so on. Tony, I want to get your assessment of, you know, that property thing in Sydney. It looms so large over anyone who lives in Sydney. Do you concur with that assessment? Yeah, I mean, housing attainability is the political fault line in Australia. And it's more pronounced in Sydney because of the, the house prices and, and it is creating, in a cost of living environment crisis, it's creating a bigger problem for those who want to get into the market and those who want to remain in the market and those who want to upgrade their house for a growing family. The other thing about those seats is uh, Ride, Parramatta, Winston Hills, Riverstone and Penrith. There's an arc of seats. There are an arc of seats that run across and that was always a bit of a concern before this campaign. And that is showing that um, uh, to, have, to have eventuated. The other point... Sorry to interrupt, um, um, Tony. Jo John Howard's just arriving at the Liberal headquarters. See what he's saying? Body in another country that claims to be a Democrat. What do you think tonight's loss means? Oh, for it's Dominic too Carrie early. Days? All I want to say is that um, I am not here to make pronouncements on behalf of the Liberal Party. That is for the Premier. But I admire him enormously. He took over in incredibly difficult circumstances and he campaigned in an heroic fashion. He put forward ideas, he was bold, I particularly admired his stance on poker. Social evil, and I think his stance on that was admirable and he had policy ideas and what the final numbers will be, but obviously he's decided what the overall result is. And, and the other thing I want to say is I pay tribute to the civil way in which the campaign was conducted by Mr. Mr. Howard, where to? Do, Mr. Howard, sorry. There's some conjecture that he didn't stay true to conservative values. Is that true? Oh, look, I think Don uh, got the balance right. Mr. Howard, uh, where to from now for the Liberal Party? Oh, I'm too early to be talking about that. I'll have something to say. Mr. Howard, what can Dominic Carite be proud of, do you think? Well, he should be proud that he gave uh, strong, determined leadership to the party having taken over in an incredibly difficult situation. All right, we will leave John Howard there, the uh, eldest statesman of the Liberal Party, a loyal soldier too, isn't he, fronting up there at mm -hmm. the, you know, a tough night for the Liberals, mm -hmm. of course, but he did appear a few times on the campaign. He's often uh, rolled out in um, uh, well, every state and federal uh, election mm -hmm. campaign, is uh, John Howard. But Tony Barry, we interrupted uh, you there as um, the former PM was paying tribute to uh, Dominic Perrottet. It's uh, always an honour to be interrupted by John Howard, so that was good. <laughs> um, the, the final point I just wanted to make was we spoke at the start about 12 incumbents not recontesting and the value of incumbency and incumbency programs that political parties run. And by my account, about six out of those 12 have lost. So that is uh, another contributing factor tonight, along with the, the, the age of the government, 12 asking for 16 years. So there's a few forces at work that I think were contributing to that. Uh, Tony, we're looking at projections here, right? So this is not the actual count. Uh, these are projections. To what degree do you concur? And does the coalition have any room to move in clawing back some ground from some of these? Yeah, I think there's a few seats which uh, look like they're coming back. Remember, uh, there's a lot of early uh, polls to be counting. Uh, Winston Hills, Oatley, I think, should be OK. Uh, Dremoyne, Ride, Terrigal, no postal votes have been counted, is my understanding. So there's a few seats that I wouldn't quite be sort of um, writing off just yet. Obviously, a bit hard to come back from where we are. Um, so, you know... Uh, will it be a Labor minority? Potentially, potentially. Uh, Cos, just quickly, do you mm. concur with that? H how much do those postals and pre-polls matter in a race yep. where Labor's this far ahead? They do matter. So it, uh, a, a quick uh, tip for your viewers when it comes to this stage of the count. Uh, after tonight, any seat that Labor is holding in terms of a lead around within the 1% to 2% mark, is very hard to hold once they start counting those early votes and those postals. Um, and so 
yeah, that's that's almost a, a, a given for for anyone on the Labor side of politics. When if you've got about a couple of percentage points in the bank after tonight, then you're going to hold on to that seat. If it's a bit lower than that, it's going to be pretty hard. Sarah, David. Yeah, Jess, thank you. Interesting point from Tony Barry yeah. there, Penny Sharp, that uh, it, it may still end up being minority. Are you that pessimistic or are you pretty confident now that it will be majority? Um, I, there are still a lot of, a lot of um, seats that we think are too close to call. Mm -hmm. So um, some of those that are on that board, we're not ready to call them yet. Well, that, that brings us back to the very interesting questions we were asking before about, particularly about energy, because if you find yourself in minority government, you said you were prepared for the Narrabri gas field mm -hmm. to go ahead. It's, it's obviously its approvals are all through, mm -hmm. but behind Narrabri is a whole series of other projects, including coal in New South Wales. Just to be clear, will you support all of those projects that are either at approval or of where the companies have made significant financial decisions about those projects? Is that a yes from Labor? Well, no. The, point, the first point I'd make is it's a step-by-step -step process. It looks like we're very close to majority government, so we'll wait until all the votes are counted. But secondly, on that issue, it's not up to us to, to support those projects or not. They're going through an independent planning process, and some of them have been knocked back. There have been some knocked back. So we think that the independent process is important. We think that looking at the impact of climate change is also important, but that's the process that we go through. It's not a matter of us saying yes or no. It's a matter of making sure that all of the work is done in relation to any of the proposals that come forward. So will you be supporting a um, climate trigger for your federal colleagues on that? I think you probably asked me some questions. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. I'm actually not the climate change shadow too, by the way. That's actually Jihad, and I don't want to traverse him too much. No, fair enough. No, but uh, we're just waiting for uh, Dominic Perrottet. He's apparently just a few minutes away from arriving at that Liberal Party function, so we'll show that to you uh, when it happens. But a climate trigger, of course, sits in environmental law. Mm. Uh, it goes goes in environmental approvals, doesn't it, to, uh, to consider the climate impact of any project? Yes, there's a lot of work being done. I mean, the EPBC review is happening now. Tanya Plibersek obviously working with that. I have been talking to her about that. What about a state level climate trigger though mm. for you as Minister? Well we know that the government got taken to court and the EPA now is required to look into and assess mm. the impact of climate change. We welcome that. We think that that's going to be important but you know I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. Some of these things are actually quite complicated. Um, welcome to government. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed, yes indeed. indeed. And uh, yes uh, we look forward to tackling those when they a, come on a, and a quick question. Did you ever expect to find yourself on the wrong side of John Howard in relation to gambling and pokey machines? On the weak side of John Howard in relation to gambling? I've been on the gambling. wrong side of John Howard over many, many <laughs> issues over, over many, many but years. So, no, I'm not surprised. But when he's calling out a societal evil that you're only going to hold a small trial for... I don't think anyone is suggesting that um, people don't think that there are serious problems with problem gambling. We know people that have been impacted by this. We know that it's an issue. I raise this issue all the time. I've got an 18 year old son, you know, is the, the, the amount of um, advertising that he is mm. ex exposed to through sport and the, like, mm. I just think there's a big issue here. Um, the John Howard stuff, uh, you know, that's not, that's, but to, I wouldn't to the substance to of his point, there. I mean, is this result tonight in part, and maybe Ash, I might ask you um, for uh, some analysis on this before we hear from Penny Sharp, is this in part a win for the gambling lobby? Look, I don't think so. And I think Labor's approach to this the whole time was that, and I think Dominic Perrottet conceded this as well, it wasn't going to sway votes. That, that gambling reform, yes, it's a very personal issue for, for some people, but it wasn't a, a vote winner or all loser. And I think Labor did not want to get bogged down in that. They had a, a, a strategy. Uh, they, they had this campaign that they wanted to run and they didn't want to get caught in Dominic Perrottet's gambling reform. Yes, Labor did release a policy and they released it actually before Dominic Perrottet uh, did. But just in terms of gambling reform, I, I don't think it was ever going to sway the, the outcome of, of this election. But we'll say that Labor did have cover here and they are out of step with not just uh, conservative politicians or the Greens or all the independents. You know, this was all sparked from a crime commission report. Mm. So they had the cover of that. We have religious groups, we have charities groups calling out. So Labor could have done that. They, they had cover and they are out of step. Penny Sharp, when it, sorry to interrupt, Ash, but when it came to Shadow Cabinet, were you in favour of going with something much bigger, going with a a full uh, a rollout of cashless gambling? No, we put together the package and we all backed it in very strongly. 
to Ashley's point, it's not about winning votes. About It's about doing what's right. And the ALP's gambling policy uh, was nothing short of a joke. I mean, it was a gambling policy written by the gaming industry for the gaming industry. That is just it not will, true. Well, can that I is just, just not well, can true. I just say, it's and it's outrageous that you would say that. It's just not true. poker machines across not New true. South Wales will be part of the trial. That's a tiny percentage. We have the largest number of poker machines outside of Nevada. And if Chris Minns can't step up on that, the question is, what will he do when it comes to other challenging areas of public policy? I think you better come back on that issue of did the gaming industry write your policy? Absolutely or, not. Or heavily influenced? Absolutely not. It's, and what, we, what I was suggesting, could I just clarify that mm -hmm. comment, that this is the kind of policy that the gaming industry would have wanted. Mm -hmm. It's a small trial and the PBO and the budget costing said actually it won't work because it will just drive gamblers to other venues. So mm -hmm. the trial results will be null and void. We got the same information when it came to rolling out cashless gaming. We thought it could be done, and that's why we put the policy we can. But have, your cashless gaming isn't until 2028. It has massive carve-outs for the National Party in regional areas. We believe that if we can get this right, we could do this faster. Um, but we've just do, before 2028. Cashless cashless gaming 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 after the, the trial, if it works through, and again, no one talks about the fact that we've got an independent board that's going to that's looking at that. It's got anti-gambling advocates. It's got everyone on it to actually look at dealing with the issue of problem gambling. It is wrong to suggest in any way that Chris Minns was trying to back the industry on this. He's always said that there was an issue. He wanted to get it right, and our approach was to do this trial. I think there was a lot of misinformation, and people just really honed in on this one aspect of it. Our policy was very comprehensive. These guys picked up half of our policy in there when they finally actually announced Ash, it. Ash, you're trying to get in. Can you guarantee, though, that there is a will from, from Chris Minns? Because he Sorry, has been Ash, weak on just, this. Uh, we've got some pictures now of Dominic Perrottet uh, arriving there at the Liberal Party function. The, um, well, outgoing Premier is still technically uh, the Premier of New South Wales, not for much longer after tonight's result. And this obviously a difficult moment for him, the 40-year-old. Uh, the He's only been Premier for uh, 18, 18 months. months. And yeah. he's, he's there with his wife, isn't he, Ashley? Yes, That's... yes, Helen, who has been on the campaign uh, qu quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Interrupted you, though, Ash. Go ahead. <laughs> Look, just in terms of, of Chris Minns, do you think or can you guarantee that there is the will from Chris Minns as leader to want to see through some reform in this area? Absolutely. I mean, one of the, one of the, the big take-homes out of this campaign, which I think is a very good thing, is that problem gambling has been on the agenda and there is a will from both sides with different approaches to actually tackling it. And it's, a, it's, some, it's something that we will do. But what about that argument that Chris Minns has been putting forward about protecting jobs with, within the clubs? And there are big clubs in and a lot of these seats that you have just won big in in, in Western Sydney. Sure. So, so how do you juggle that? I don't think that there's anything wrong with saying we want to tackle public gambling, but we also want to understand the impact on the workers who work in that industry. That's the Labor Party. The Labor Party actually supports workers and we support people who work in clubs in regional areas in Western Sydney. There's a lot of people that are employed there. And we want to make sure that the way that we do this also looks at, at that, what happens to them. You've got to face independent screens and I think Liberal MPs are going to push for a special commission or a royal commission mm. into that. Is that something that, that Labor would be open to? Look, I think, look, I think we'll, we'll see. We've got, our own, we've got a, a very comprehensive plan. Part of um, what the independent board is also doing is a roadmap for problem gaming reform. I think we would talk to all of those people about that. The one point I would make as we go through is, is to, you know, people have had a very long list of things that they are demanding. Let's, let's see how the votes are counted and, and we'll work through that. I think we forget it's not just problem gaming, it's also money laundering. And Correct. there's a Crime Commission report that says clearly we've got to move quickly. So no one's that end, suggesting that we, that we don't take that seriously or we don't think we should no, do that. No, but that's the, the urgency to roll out a cashless gaming card. 2028 your urgency. To 90,000 poker machines. You're doing a trial of 500. Finish your 12 months. Good point, 2028. Uh, here we go. There's yeah. Dominic Perrottet threading his way through the crowd amongst his supporters. This has been his theme song at all, all launches. What's the song, Ash? Oh, I don't know the name of the song. He's going the distance. But I think well, it's sort of it. You can see... No. He doesn't look, yeah, look, he doesn't look terribly thrilled with the Philip result Ruddock. that he's um, being confronted with. But what, what's fair to say, I think, uh, and Matt Keen, I'm sure you'll agree, he's being congratulated here. Mm. Those who are applauding and toasting him are cheering him on for the, the job that he has done over the last 18 months, as disappointing as this night will be for them. Well, and rightly so. Dom took on the most challenging uh, job in Australian politics. He did an extraordinary job under difficult circumstances, dealing with Omicron, uh, dealing with record floods. 
he faced a huge challenge and got the coalition back within striking distance with just a couple of weeks to go. How would you describe that expression though, Sarah? <laughs> I think he looks gutted, actually. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? No, actually. he's uh, that's a brave face, but that's the man, I would say... Holding it together. ...just close to tears. Yeah, I agree. I haven't seen uh, that... Well, Ashley, you've watched him more closely yeah. than us Look, for the last He's about months. to come up to speak, but he's a very emo emotional man, Dominic Perrette. He, he wears does. his heart on his sleeve, yeah. Dom. He really does. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, friends, uh, thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, a short while ago, uh, I called uh, Chris Mint uh, to congratulate him uh, and the Labor Party on their election victory. No, the people, no, the people of New South Wales, the people, the great people of New South Wales tonight, have decided to uh, elect a Labor government in this state, uh, and that is a decision uh, that we respect. All right. I, I particularly, I particularly uh, tonight want to acknowledge uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, elections uh, can get ugly, uh, but I believe this election truly uh, was a race to the top. Uh, a, genuine, a, genuine, a genuine battle of ideas, and that's when politics is at its best. And in many ways, and in many ways, uh, that is due uh, to Chris Minns her, and the way that he has carried himself uh, throughout this campaign. Uh, and, that's why, and that's why I truly believe and have no doubt that he will make a fine 47th Premier of New South Wales. Well because I believe uh, that he will lead uh, with the same decency uh, and the same integrity uh, that uh, he has led with uh, so far. Uh, and ultimately, I ask everybody across New South Wales, uh, whatever your political uh, persuasion, uh, to get behind him. To get behind him. Because when New South Wales goes well, our country goes well. And that is, and that is, something, that is something tonight I believe we can all unite behind. Now, friends, it goes without saying. Uh, I think we all would, would, would wanted to have a different result this evening. But we as a party, we as a government, should be very proud of what we have achieved together. And, and I feel, and I feel a, a, a profound sense of gratitude uh, to have been able to serve the people of New South Wales. We make no mistake, uh, we have made history, uh, being in government uh, for the longest time since our party was formed. And our government has achieved so much uh, in so many ways. Yes. We have kept New South Wales strong, free and fair. Yes. Friends, New South Wales is a much better place today than it was 12 years ago. Yeah. And, and, that will be, and that will be the legacy of our Liberals and Nationals government here in our state. Yeah. Our, record, our record is one of infrastructure, of investment and of imagination. Yeah. We have rebuilt, we have rebuilt this state from the ground up with the biggest building agenda since Federation. Since Federation. We built, we built the first metros when they said it couldn't be done. Yes. Motorways that have changed the face of our city. More schools and hospitals than any government in our history. And museums and stadiums befitting the world-class city and Australia's, and, and Australia's truly only global city. We, we, we have laid also the foundations for a strong future. Yeah. With three more metros and the second airport opening soon, uh, this will turbocharge and transform our state for generations. Yeah. And, and at the same time, 
At the same time, we've transformed service delivery with record investments in health, uh, in education, in public transport, uh, not to mention Service New South Wales. Yeah. And we've done the work, our government has done the hard work to keep our economy strong, to keep jobs plentiful uh, and taxes low, just like good Liberal governments do. Now, friends, when I took this job, I said I wanted to be a Premier for families, and we have kept that promise with record support for families across the board. But we've also dared to imagine a different future, where every child gets access to five days free preschool before they start kindergarten. Yeah. By, getting rid of, by getting rid of stamp duty uh, so that we help first home buyers reach that great Australian dream faster, and a New South Wales state's budget that is not propped up by the rivers of tears from the misery of problem gambling in this state. Yeah. Friends, friends, we leave, we leave New South Wales a more stronger, more confident and more successful state than we found it. And we have, we have achieved all of this. We have achieved all of this whilst navigating some of the most difficult times with droughts and, and fires and floods. We pushed through the pandemic and led our nation out of lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. Difficult, difficult decisions, difficult decisions, but the right decisions. Yes. Yeah. I, I particularly uh, want uh, to acknowledge tonight um, our communities. Uh, who have been significantly affected uh, by floods. Uh, and I, I want to particularly acknowledge the community in the Northern Rivers. Uh, the devastation uh, and the challenges that we saw uh, will stay with me for the rest of my life. But, but, what more, but what's more uh, is the selflessness, the generosity, the spirit of service uh, that I saw of our people in those regions in the most difficult times. And sometimes it's through the darkest times that brings out the best. But the values and that spirit that I had the great privilege to witness as Premier of this state is something that will always be with me for the rest of my life. And it really shows to me how great Australia is and how great our people are. Yeah. Friends, uh, tonight, can I say I am very proud uh, to lead my Liberal team, yes. but I stand on the shoulders of those who have come be before me. Uh, Barry O'Farrell, uh, Mike Baird, uh, and Gladys berry uh, Each, Each of those leaders ha have left an indelible mark on our great state. Uh, their legacies are strong, uh, and New South Wales is a much better place for their leadership. And from my perspective, I couldn't have asked for better examples of leaders to learn from. Yeah. I want to thank uh, my coalition colleagues uh, for all the support uh, they have shown me uh, as Premier of this state uh, and during the campaign. My Deputy uh, and Treasurer, Matt Keane, my, Matt Keane, my, my former, uh, my former uh, Deputy, uh, Stuart Ayres. Uh, Stuart. It doesn't appear that uh, Stuart will have the result that he wanted uh, or that I wanted uh, this evening in Penrith, but Stuart can hold his head very high. Yeah. Yeah. He has served his community of Penrith incredibly well, yeah. and he has served our state with distinction. Yeah. Yeah. I want to thank the Deputy, the Deputy Premier and Leader of the National Party, Paul Tull. Uh, he has been it has been a real privilege serving with him. He has been a champion uh, for regional New South Wales and in what is a, a difficult night uh, for the coalition. Uh, it has been a strong night for the National Party and it, or, and it shows that the National Party is the party of regional New South Wales. Yeah. I, uh, I want to issue a special thank you to all the candidates for the Liberal Party uh, who put their hands up to run at this election. Um, I want to particularly uh, thank those uh, who were unsuccessful, but also uh, those 
uh, who have lost their seats this evening. Uh, politics is tough, uh, but each of those members who weren't successful tonight uh, have served their communities um, with distinction, and I want to thank them so much for their service to the people of New South Wales. I, uh, I want to acknowledge I want to acknowledge the Liberal Party organisation and particularly pass on my thanks to Chris Stone. Yeah. Chris is. Uh, Chris has led a great team at Liberal Party headquarters uh, and he's run many campaigns, but to be part uh, of him to be part of this team and the leadership that he has shown, Chris, uh, thank you so very much. Uh, I want to thank um, all the ministerial and electorate staff who work tirelessly each and every day for the people of New South Wales. Thank you for everything that you have done uh, over the last 12 years. <laughs> to all the volunteers, not just in the Liberal Party, but, but volunteers from all political parties uh, who today spent much of the day handing out, supporting our great democracy. Uh, thank you for everything that you've done over the course of the day. But to everyone in the Liberal Party, I'd say this. Um, this next period of time uh, will not be easy, uh, but it will be necessary. Uh, it is a time uh, to reflect. Uh, it is a time to rethink uh, and ultimately to renew. To renew. Uh, as leader uh, of the parliamentary uh, Liberal Party, uh, I take full responsibility uh, for the loss this evening. Uh, and as a result, I will be standing down as the parliamentary leader, no, as the as the as the parliamentary as the parliamentary leader uh, of the Liberal Party. It's very clear. We need a fresh start. We need a fresh start. We need a fresh. We need, we need a fresh start. We need a fresh start uh, for for the Liberal Party. Uh, I I want to thank I want to thank uh, the community of Epping. Uh, and recognise their continued support and thank them very much uh, for supporting me um, at this election. Uh, of all the 93 electorates uh, across the state, uh, Epping is the best. Uh, uh, it, is, it is my, it is my and, I, and, I've had, and I've had a few, uh, it, is, uh, it is the best uh, because it is my home and thank you so much for your support. Last, lastly, and, and, and most importantly, um, I want to acknowledge my family, uh, particularly Helen, uh, for everything she's done. Uh, I, she, she, she is a, Helen is, is, a, is an amazing support, and I, I could not do this job and serve the people of our state uh, without everything that she does for me and our family every single day. So thank you so much. Uh, to my kids, who should be asleep, um, but they're probably not, um, Charlotte, Amelia, Annabelle, William, Harriet, Beatrice and Celeste, you're not asleep, so I just want to say I love you very much. Thank you for everything. I want to finish, I want to finish tonight uh, by saying uh, that I didn't get into politics for a job. Uh, I got into politics uh, to serve. Uh, and I want to thank every person across New South Wales uh, for the great opportunity uh, that you have given me. Uh, it has been an absolute honour uh, and privilege, the greatest honour and privilege that I've had in my entire life. Thank you and good night. The outgoing Premier Dominic Perrottet announcing he will stand down as Liberal leader in New South Wales. And this campaign that's drawn to a close in New South Wales will be remembered for, amongst other things, the civility between the two leaders. And that gracious concession speech there was really a mark of that civility. Hard to recall a concession speech mm. that poured so much praise on the uh, the opponent, the one mm. who's uh, the, the victor. Uh, Dominic Perrottet talked about respecting this decision, but then he went a lot further. He said this was truly a race to the top, a genuine battle of ideas, 
Chris Minns and the way he's carried himself, he prays to be a fine Premier. Uh, he'll lead with the same decency, integrity that he's led with so far. Uh, this was effusive praise for the man who's mm. won tonight, Chris Minns, the new Premier, the incoming uh, Premier, the Premier-elect in New South Wales. But Dominic Perrottet may have surprised some with announcing immediately at that concession speech, Sarah, that he's standing down. Matt Keane, are you the next leader of the Liberal Party in New South Wales? Uh, well, it's too early to go into those conversations. That's a matter for the party room. But I just want to reflect on David's comments. That speech is a mark of a great leader and a great person. And that's the Dom Perrottet I've known for 20 years. The way he respected Chris Binns throughout this process, uh, the way he acknowledged him and wished him the best tonight is exactly why Dom Perrottet was such a great leader and great person to bring together the Liberal Party at a really difficult time. My heart goes out to him, Helen and the whole family. He's put his heart and soul into this job. He put us back into a competitive position, which should have been written off mm. months and months ago. And that's a mark of his intellect, ability and integrity. And we saw it on display here tonight. And, and, and to be fair, he, he talked about something which is the way in which the multiple Liberal governments have rebuilt the state and the city the last time. The Labor government was in power. They had abandoned infrastructure your governments have transformed New South Wales and the state? I think we collectively as Liberals and Nationals have a lot to be proud of. We've invested record amounts in infrastructure. We've built roads, hospitals, schools, things that we'd missed out on for a long time. We kept our AAA credit rating. We kept the economy strong throughout the worst health and economic shock, uh, floods, fires, and also uh, natural disasters. Uh, Don Perrottet can hold his head up high knowing that he's done a great job for the Liberal Party and a great job for New South Wales. Matt Keane, let me just cut to the chase here. Are you going to seek the leadership? It's too early to have those uh, discussions. Uh, You've thought about this though. You've been talked about. You're the obvious candidate. Will you put your hand up? No, it's too early. I haven't thought about it. You um, haven't thought about on, it? Come on, mate. You I've can't been... pretend you haven't thought about no, it. No, no. I've been thinking about uh, ensuring that we win this election. And it's been a really difficult job as the Treasurer and as also the Energy Minister at this time. I mean, we were just talking about Araring. Uh, this is not an easy portfolio. It's, you know, full of culture wars, vested interests uh, and different viewpoints. But you told us earlier you will stay for the full four years in State Parliament. That's still your view? Yes. So you're not sure whether you'll seek the leadership at this moment for the Liberal Party? Don't we they? need to see what the results are going to be. There's still seats that have been counted, as Cos was saying before. Postals, pre-polls will determine number of seats. We think that Ride is still in play. Mm. Uh, we think that Oatley is very much still sure, in play. Sure, but is there any other, is there there any other option still in that play? you can think of for the Liberal Party? There's a lot of talented people in the Liberal Party. There is definitely something that we can rebuild on. Dom's, uh, you know, ensure that people have been blooded, people have had ministerial experience, experience, uh, people will be able to contribute. I'd like to continue to contribute to our team and we'll talk to colleagues and Nonetheless, see Nonetheless, you built, you built that last budget. You talked about the way the people of New South Wales have to are your strongest asset. You've started sounding like a Premier even before the possibility comes up that you could stand. No, none of us believe that you haven't thought about it. When you watch Dom Perrottet do the job, let me ask it in a different way, is it a job that you would like to do? Uh, well, seeing what Don Perrottet has had to carry, it you know, does make you think about you know, the impact that it has on your family. It does make you think about uh, the impact it has on you. Um, uh, you know, I saw, uh, I was a junior minister when Gladys Berejiklian mm. was the premier during that campaign, and now I've been by Dom's side every step of this journey. I've seen how demanding that job is. Are and you... let me tell you, Dom has put everything into this and kept mm. us in the game. Are you put off by how fractious your party has become, notwithstanding the discipline that Perite, Dominic Perite showed, but are you are you worried? Are you put off by how fractious your party has become? No, I love my party, and it is made up of a diverse range of individuals. You know, some more conservative, some more progressive, uh, but I think it's reflective of our broader community. And when it's at its best, it does exactly that: balance as different regions different philosophies and brings them together to build more prosperity for everyone. Ash, just some thoughts on what we heard from Dominic Perrottet. Any surprise that he announced immediately that he's going? And what are the options? Is, is Matt Keane the obvious front runner right now? Look, I think it is no surprise that Dominic Perrottet announced that he would step down as leader. 
Yes, Matt Keane is, is an obvious front runner for the job. There's also Alistair Hinchkins. Uh, he has been also talked to as possible to take over as leader. But I think the Liberal Party have to work out what, what they want to do here. We have always had moderate uh, premiers or moderate leaders and they've come from that faction apart from Dominic Perrottet, who was from the right. And now he was only installed as the leader because of the support that from the moderates and Matt Keane, you were instrumental in swinging that support behind him and you were awarded, you became the treasurer. So yeah. I, the moderates are the dominant faction. Uh, you'd think that they'd want to hold on and step up in that leadership, but, it, but look, there is going to be a bit of a tussle and, you know, in the soul searching that goes on, uh, it'll be interesting to see which faction then does prevail here and, and that could really dictate who the next leader is. Should we go back to dealing with some of the seats that are still mm. outstanding this evening? I think, Anthony, you've got a group of those seats, starting with Pittwater. Yes, the, uh, this is one of those seats where there was a, an independent, and this one's is a teal independent. Rob Stokes retiring. <clears throat> Rory Amon, the new Liberal candidate, and Jackie Scrooby is running as the independent. As you can see there, the, the Liberal voters dropped below 50% to 43. Jackie Scrooby 37.6 and a smaller number with Labor and the Greens. When we look at the change in vote that's occurred, 37.6% at this stage, we're predicting that it's going to be a very close result. The Liberals are just ahead, 50.5 projected after preferences. And given how independents don't always do very well with absence and pre-polls, I think that, uh, that uh, that's probably firming up for the Liberal Party. But uh, it's one of those that will be counting for some time yet. Another one that's uh, still in doubt, the seat of Willoughby uh, in Sydney's north, the suburbs of Willoughby and Chatswood and so on. How's that looking now, Anthony? Uh, a very similar position. I think the Liberal vote's a bit weaker here. Larissa Penn there, there's a higher Labor vote, so it relies on preferences. Larissa Penn isn't getting half of preferences at this stage, 35% uh, exhausting, so that's a lower rate. But again, um, postals and absence will tend to work against the independent here. So at the moment, we're projecting the independent will have 50.2 after preferences. That will witter away with the way absence and pre-polls. That's a, a projection against Labor um, at the last election, and Labor does better on absence and pre-polls than an independent does. I think we've got uh, Woolen Dilly next, southwest of Sydney. Yeah, hasn't got much coverage. Uh, Nathaniel Smith mm. retiring. Now, this is not uh, Judy Hannon does have the backing of Climate 200, but I think this would. I mean, Matt Matt might have a view on this, but this is more of a bit of a factional dispute in the Liberal Party. Judy Hannon tried to run in the Liberal Party a number of years back, was blocked. Uh, Nathaniel Smith from the right of the party. Um, I lost those figures there, but um, the key point there, Nathaniel Smith's vote is only 32.3%, Judy Hannon 25%, the Labor 23 One Nation 12%. Um, the preference flows aren't strong because of that high One Nation vote, but at this stage we still have Judy Hannon ahead. So uh, that could be Nathaniel Smith losing that seat, but um, whether that's a major loss, I mean, it's up to the Liberal Party, how they deal with the factional issue there. And Miranda, another big swing against the, the Liberals, uh, Eleni Petinos. Uh, I should just say that Judy Hannon has run twice for the Liberal Party before and tried for pre-section that seat before. Miranda, yeah, Eleni Pet Pet Petinos is um, uh, a bit of a battle here against Simon Earl for the Labor Party. This is a seat which has been generally been a Liberal held seat. Sure. It was held by Labor for a while with Barry Collier. And um, right. there was also that famous Miranda by-election in 2013 when there was an extraordinary 25% swing, completely unexpected, but Barry Collier only held it for another two years after that. At the moment, it's still close. I would tend to expect that um, the Liberals will eventually hold on to that because again, absent votes and postals and pre-polls from outside of the district will tend to favour the Liberal Party in that sort of, that part of Sydney. So, I mean, there's a number of these seats which have ended up quite close. There's even, as, as Matt was saying, Oatley and Ride. Um, the projections we're getting are indicating they're going to lose, but I think given there's so many votes to come and it's pre-polls and it's postals, uh, then some of these seats might drift back yet. And Dremoyne, Anthony. Well, this was always a, a bit of a roughie mm. in my case. I mean, um, just as a little sidelight, John Howard was a Liberal candidate here in 1968. Great <laughs> detail. At this time in the night, I salute you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> when he didn't leave, he moved north of the harbour and started a good career from there. Anyway, um, Dremoyne was, um, at the moment, uh, of course, um, John Sadoti was the uh, ex-Liberal MP who had to resign with an ICAC inquiry, which found him, him having engaged in corrupt conduct. Um, 
Stephanie de Pasqua is the uh, new Liberal candidate. She's Deputy Mayor of Concord, the City of Canada Bay Council, and has worked for John Sedoti until recently as an electoral officer. She's well known in the electorate. Julia Little is the Labor candidate, also on the council, former Deputy Mayor. At this stage, uh, it's now firmed towards the Liberal Party as the count go on, but it's still, it's not a, it's only got 43% of the vote counted, so it's not a big count, but uh, I'd expect the Liberal Party might be able to hang on to that one. Gee, there's some big, uh, thanks Andy, some big swings, uh, Matt Keen, even in some of those uh, Northern Beaches areas. Uh, mm. Pittwater, well, Willoughby as well, not so much going to Labor, but big swings against Liberals. You might hold on to them, but they're very close, going to independence. Well, we've held on. We've held on, and a win's a win's a win. And, you know, we were expecting, you know, a disaster tonight would have been losing everything. And we've held something we can rebuild from some of these seats. There's a lot of soul searching to do, as you've just said, um, but we've got something to build from. What's the, what's the, just in there, what is the soul searching? Just uh, talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in this and what it means about the way that the next leader, whether it's you, Matt Keane, or someone else, how they need to start reshaping the New South Wales Liberal Party. Well, I think that um, take the incumbency issue out of it. So 12 years in government mm -hmm. uh, was the number one issue that was working against mm -hmm. us. Take the retirements out of it. I think we need to look at uh, things like, you know, what were our policy prescriptions around things like cost of living, mm -hmm. um, uh, Labor, uh, just hearing some of the vox pops in your earlier news bulletins, the tolling thing kept cutting through. We had a very comprehensive tolling policy um, that didn't seem to be as retail as Labor's policy. Um, so I think we need to think about the type of policies we're putting forward, how we communicate them to the electorate, because um, you know our, our, our tolling policy, for example, uh, was going to deliver for the majority of motorists, but only Labor's would benefit an extra. 2%, yet they seem to have cut, got a lot more cut through on that. That's a, that's a concession that, that during the campaign you, you may have made some wrong... There's been some wrong choices made in the campaign about the way you... At least perhaps the way you talked about the policies that you had. And I wonder if part of that is a mistake to be constantly talking about the future. The future... The, you've got your future fund, but you've also got the future of infrastructure. It's all very future-focused at a time when people are suffering in the present. I think there's no doubt that it was about, you know, people wanted to see that we were looking after their backs today, mm -hmm. helping them with those cost of living pressures, mm. but also planning for the future. Mm. All those postmortems will be done in the coming, you know, days, weeks and months ahead. Um, but, you know, as Don Perrottet has shown that he was able to, you know, put a different uh, spin on the Liberal government, show that we were not an old, you know, 10 year old government when he took over, but we we're a new team with a you know vision for the future a positive plan for the future i think we sold that very well however uh, we got run over by the it's time factor was it perhaps wrong to throw so much money at people as well you had oh here we've got the prime oh, minister sorry ash interrupting you again here's the prime minister anthony albanese back in his the warm up act for the, uh, <laughs> the newly elected incoming premier to their elders, past, present and emerging, and recommit the government that I'm proud to lead for supporting the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our national birth certificate, our constitution this year. <laughs> Friends. Tonight, the people of New South Wales have come together to choose a better future. Tonight, a fresh start for New South Wales begins. And it starts with a great leader. A leader with vision, compassion and integrity. A leader guided by fairness, equality and the fair go. A leader, a leader whose instinct is always to bring people together. 
A leader who has surrounded himself with the United team, distinguished by its talent and the trust in which they are so deservedly held. A leader who knows what it really matters to the people of this great state. That, friends, is a Labor leader. Chris Minns has been a great leader for New South Wales Labor. Yeah. And after tonight, he will be a great Premier for the people of New South Wales. And I add this, no matter where you live and no matter who you voted for today, Chris Minns will be your Premier. Now, I have had the very good fortune of knowing Chris for many, many years. And what I know without doubt is that he embodies all that is best about the Australian Labor Party. He embodies what makes us the Australian Labor Party. He is a leader whose vision is one that always has people at its heart. And with Chris, his great team, and all the energy and talent that they will bring to government. Please give a big hand for my friend, the Premier of New South Wales, Chris Menz. So there's a bit of a crowd crush there for Chris Minns uh, as the um, Premier-elect makes his way to the stage. But as you, the as you Deputy Premier, Prue Carr's there giving him a hug. But as you point out, he's not a fist pumper, is he? No, I noted Modest that. Modest in victory. He, yeah, he's um, true to form, uh, I suppose, Daniel Ashley, Wookie. isn't he, in the yeah. subdued, not subdued, but uh, yeah. Yeah, modest approach that he's taking here. Obviously a bit more um, excitement in the Labor crowd around him, as you can see. That's a long, long time in opposition, Penny Sharp. It is. I don't think they've done one of these where we've won before, so they haven't actually made the plan of how they get him to the stage. <laughs> it's like the mosh pit there it right is. now. I perhaps yeah. needed to think about that a little bit more. <laughs> but for the Prime Minister to uh, welcome him to stage, uh, a big moment for New South Wales Labor to have one of your own there as Prime Minister and now Premier mm -hmm. as well. And just this extraordinary moment, uh, a run across the country. It's not just a moment for New South Wales, it's a moment for Australia too, isn't it? <laughs> he really does have a special diffidence about it, doesn't he? 
Spent a bit of time uh, hopping in on the campaign, the Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't think we'd make it through. Friends, after 12 years in opposition, the people of New South Wales have voted for a fresh start. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and thank all of you for being here. I'd like to acknowledge and thank all our wonderful Labor volunteers right across New South Wales. Thanks for the heart and soul that you put into our party. The most important thing you can give is your Labor and to do it in the cause of something that you love and care about is a special thing. The Labor Party would be nothing without you. We owe you everything. Thank you so much. To our candidates, to our members of parliament and the best deputy leader any party could ever have, to Pruka. who will be a wonderful education minister in this great state. Thanks for everything, Prue. To all of the volunteers in the state seat of Cogra, thank you so much. Thought it was going to be close, but in the end we got there. Thanks very much. We managed to get Nicholas over the line as well, which is a big win. And congratulations to Rockdale as well. Yeah. And in particular, <laughs> and in particular, my mate Steve Camper. Thanks so much for everything, Steve. Yeah. Also, a huge thank you to the Prime Minister of this country, Anthony Albanese. Yeah. I've got, I don't know where he's gone, but. Anthony, thanks for everything. And thank you so much for putting your heart and soul into the New South Wales Labor campaign. We truly, truly appreciate it. Friends, the people of New South Wales voted to put in a government that would put people, people at the heart of all decision making. And we will not let them down. Moments ago, I got a phone call from the Premier of New South Wales, Dominic Perrottet, congratulating New South Wales Labor on its victory here tonight. And I would like to say thank you to the Premier for his service on behalf of the people of New South Wales. And I know from Anna and myself, we want to say thank you to Helen and Dominic for their service to the people of this state. I think... It's undeniably the case that this election campaign, perhaps uniquely, was a model of respect and civility. And neither party took the low road, neither political party took the low blow. And I think it can be a model for the way democracy is done right across this country. Now, I can't say, I can't say that every election campaign in the future will be conducted the same way, but from now on, no one will be able to say that it can't be. We started effectively two years ago with a promise to the people of New South Wales that we would run an election campaign asking, to peop asking people to vote a positive vote for New South Wales Labor and not just a negative vote against the government. And I'm proud to say today the people of New South Wales voted for the removal of the unfair wages cap in New South Wales. Friends, they voted for our nurses, our teachers. They voted for our paramedics and police. 
And there was a basic, a basic acknowledgement at the end of the day that during the COVID emergency, the people of New South Wales that work in our hospitals and our schools in our emergency departments put themselves second and the public first and put their own safety and health to one side to look after the people of New South Wales. So New South Wales Labor pledges to look after the people who looked after us. It's undeniably the case that today's election was also a decisive vote against privatisation. Yeah. To retain Sydney water and essential energy in New South Wales government hands. to put it into the constitution and to never sell it and to stop all future governments selling the assets that we need to live, thrive and survive in New South Wales. There are many challenges facing the state of New South Wales over the next four years, but the team that I lead is ready for the challenges and opportunities of government and we will not let the people of this state down. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge my wonderful staff, including Sarah Michael, Ed Avadia, Zach Solomon, Lockie Harris, and of course, the little general, James Cullen. My electorate office as well, Cherie, Cheryl, Loretta and Jesse, thanks so much for everything. Cherie Burton down there. A huge, a huge shout out to the New South Wales party office led by General Secretary Bob Namva. Thank you so much, Bob. And Bob's two deputies, Dom Offner and George Simon. Tireless work, tireless work, putting the interests of the party first, working around the clock, and the results speak for themselves. A huge thank you to the trade union movement of New South Wales. Men and women who put the interests of working people at front and centre in this election campaign. We thank you for your solidarity, your hard work and your commitment to your members. Thanks so much. Uh, to, my, to my mum and dad, John and Cara, and to my in-laws, Tom and Kath. Thanks for everything. And to our three boys, Joe, Nicholas and George. And thanks, Nicholas, for being the campaign spokesperson at the very end. We really appreciate that. And lastly, to my wonderful wife, Anna, who... glad she wasn't running in Cogra. I'd be in real trouble. <laughs> Thanks so much, honey. Thanks for everything. Um, look, after 12 years in opposition, I want to say to the people who voted for Labor or voted for the Liberals and Nationals or voted for independents or minor party, minor party candidates today, we've been elected by the people of this state, but we will govern for everyone in New South Wales. We know that the challenges are huge. We know the responsibilities are awesome, but New South Wales Labor is back and ready to govern in this great state. Thank you so much.
Well, he's to become the 47th Premier of New South Wales. Chris Minns celebrating the moment there with his family, politely declining the, uh, <laughs> the beer and the shoe there from one of the Labor, excited Labor faithful <laughs> Eric's wise, wise call uh, for the new Premier. Look, he too touched on uh, the civility of this campaign. Mm. Uh, both leaders have tonight, but uh, Chris Minns going a little further there, saying this can be a model for democracy, how it can run in Australia. And I think that's a really positive moment uh, for him to start his premiership on and he's come to this job without the, the the mud on his hands of having run a negative campaign and that's a great way to start as premier. He touched on the key themes of the campaign, that wages cap getting that removed, uh, the, 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 the vote against privatisation he's called this in New South Wales tonight, but also that banner behind him and the words that he closed with there show what this really means for Labor. It has been a very long 12 years in opposition. The, the legacy of all those scandals last time they were in hurt Labor for such a long time. A line's now been drawn under that. Now New South Wales Labor can move forward with a new leader. Yes, Penny Sharp, I think you have to have a word there. You just watched the thing you couldn't believe. <laughs> I have. I mean, first of all, I wanted to say, though, I thought that um, Dom's speech was extremely gracious and all class, and I want to, you know, really extend our thanks for his work. But also to Matt tonight, I've been through these elections. It is never fun having to make those speeches and seeing colleagues go. So to, everyone works really hard, so I just want to say that up front. But, yeah, I mean, I think Chris ended as he started, really. He just has wanted to be calm, focused on what he believes we need to do, but also the decency of how we should run a campaign. I mean, someone like me occasionally gets a bit up, you know, gets a bit worked up, and at various points, Chris has just always said, just, just stay with it. We're not, we're not going to go there. There's so. one this more. Is really who he is. Sorry, David. Yeah. There's one, just one more extraordinary detail. Maybe Anthony, you can, you can bring that to us. We have not look. I mean, I, was, um, I remember getting phone calls during the election campaign. Chris Minns held the Labor Party's most marginal seat at 0.1 percent, and there were a couple of people who wanted to do a story. What if Labor wins? And Chris, and he, and he doesn't win his own seat. So yeah, it's not yeah, going to happen, yeah. don't worry. <laughs> well, here's the result. Um, first preference votes, uh, he's got 61% of the first preference vote. Two party preferred. He's got a swing of 16.9%, <laughs> which is wow. the largest in the state. So let's just say being opposition leader hasn't prevented him from winning his own seat. And that's the big one of the biggest swings in the state. Matt Keane, you may or may not be uh, facing him across the dispatch box as uh, <coughs> opposition leader in, uh, in the new parliament. We'll see. Uh, you're keeping your options open there. But um, what did you make of uh, the Chris Minns uh, victory night, victory speech tonight? Uh, well, I mean, we wish him all the best, as Dom said, that, um, you know, it's New South Wales' success is our nation's success, and uh, that's something that we all should be invested in, regardless of our politics. Um, he's got some big challenges ahead. Um, this is not an easy time to be coming into government. Uh, the economy, there's huge international headwinds, interest rates are rising, inflation is on the up, and families are hurting. So uh, we'll be holding Chris Minns to account for the promises that he's made. Uh, that's what a good opposition does. And, and is this um, a new politics in New South Wales? Oh, I think that we're focused on, I mean, the Liberal government for the past 12 years has been focused on building a better state for everyone. That will be our focus and we'll be making sure we hold Christmas to account. At the same time, you know, the Labor Party is back, not just in New South Wales, but now across the country. But a shout out to the unions, a mention of putting water privatisation in the Constitution, these are big Labor points. I'm not saying the Curtis is going away, mm. but this was a Labor speech by a Labor man for a Labor audience. Well, we've got wall-to-wall -wall Labor governments on the mainland of Australia with the Commonwealth Labor government. We heard Chris Minns the, uh, tip the hat. One of the first thank yous he gave was to the union movement. Uh, so, um, you know, we want to make sure that he's governing for the people of New South Wales, not for vested interests. Ash, it's a long way from his maiden speech uh, in, in Parliament <laughs> yes. in relation to the unions, <laughs> yes. right? Anyway, what, what did you make of uh, that victory speech and how he begins as Premier? Look, it is positive and Chris Minns has wanted to be positive since he took over the leadership and he, he's taken that approach and it's filtered out through the campaign. And, and I think that is a good thing for, for New South Wales Parliament. They call the lower house the bear pit. There's sometimes very ugly scenes in there. You it's need very a new name. Combative, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> the the, 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 the bear pit. Bear pit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how that plays out. But look, this is a remarkable victory for Labor. Congratulations to the new Environment Minister, uh, Penny, Penny Sharp. Yeah, I think going into this campaign, nobody 
thought, everybody thought it was going to be tight. I think nobody thought that we'd get a majority government um, on the night. And I just think it's, my reflection is, that you did it in the end as the Labor Party. It went, you went to your roots. You did it as the, the party for the workers. You, you read the rooms. There had been protests along Macquarie Street with teachers and nurses. And I think teachers and nurses will be very happy tonight. You've now got to go into the negotiations with them. And, and Chris Minns has said during this campaign that Pru Carr, who will be the new education minister, the first thing she'll do when she's sworn in is go and start negotiating those pay deals. So we'll see how that goes. But yes, it is a, it is, it is a great night for Labor. We should get some final uh, thoughts from our panellists before mm. we do wrap things up. So um, yes, congratulations indeed for this, this Labor victory. Did you want to share any final observations on what's just happened and what lies ahead? Yeah, I mean, obviously incredibly grateful for the trust that people in New South Wales have given us. Um, we didn't know that we'd, we'd done the work to get them there and we're so pleased that we had. I think that we're very realistic about the challenges ahead and the real commitment from us is that we'll take it very seriously and that we'll work methodically through that. I think you'll find a kind of purposeful approach in the same way that Chris has led us over, over the last sort of 18, 12, 18 months. And to you, Matt Keane, you've talked all night about it's time, but you've also made a few concessions about the campaign. It's awful to lose. What's next? Well, the first observation I'd make out of uh, the speech is that Chris Minns didn't claim a majority. So I think there's still a lot of mm. votes to come yep, in. Before we get and, to next, yep. um, I think that, you know, it still looks like we can hang on in Miranda, hang on in Oatley, uh, hang in in Terrigal. Uh, so it'll be interesting. It'll be a very different parliament if Labor are working with the Greens compared to if Labor have a majority. So that's the first thing that I'd say. So there's still a long way to go with the count mm -hmm. and let's, it, the, the parliament could take on a very, very different complexion to the one that we were originally thinking about 15, 20 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I'd say is that um, I think the Liberal Party uh, will continue to uh, focus on playing a constructive role in building a better state. We've done that for the past 12 years and uh, that's exactly what we'll do in opposition. And we'll learn from uh, what's happened in these past 12 years and we'll come back bigger and better uh, going forward. Does Brand Liberal, after losing in federally, Victoria, New South Wales, need a serious rethink? No, I don't think so at all. I think that, um, you know, both federally and at a state level, uh, one of the major things going against us was the longevity of those governments. Uh, there was clearly a mood for change. They weren't waiting with baseball bats for the Liberal Party today at polling booths. That was factor. There was a lot of apathy. They were just like thinking it was its time for a change. They'll give the other guys a go and we'll see how that goes. I don't think we can call it apathy just yet until we get the final <laughs> results, but... Um... Look. These nights are difficult for the losing side, we know. So, Matt Keane, we do appreciate you uh, you joining us tonight. And, Thank uh, you. And Penny Sharp uh, as well. We're going to go to Jeremy for one last look at mm -hmm. the big board. Yes, indeed, David. Let's take a look at where things have landed. These are our projections. Labor's managed to hang on to all the seats that it walked into the election with and made some significant incursions onto the government side of the board. Picking up, we project an extra nine, which gets it over the line to that magic 47 number. It's also been fighting on another front, not just on this end of the board, but Wakehurst goes away from the Liberal Party to an independent. And Willoughby um, still wavering there. Uh, and uh, Pittwater has been going in and out of the count as well. Um, let's bring in Cos and Tony again. Tony, if we add in the Nationals here, you can see that the Nationals have managed to largely hang on to all the seats that they came into this election with, barring Monero and a very popular candidate in Steve Wan, a uh, returning former Labor minister. So if you look at the coalition in totality, this is less of a national party problem than it is a Liberal party problem. Would you agree? Yeah, look, I think some of these Liberal seats will come in. The result won't be as bad. And I think, um, uh, as has been noted, uh, the Premier-elect didn't claim a majority of victory. Uh, that said, it's not a great result and we've seen a disastrous result in WA, a cataclysmic result, a terrible result in South Australia, similarly a cataclysmic result in Victoria, uh, on top of a poor federal result last year, and, uh, and a loss tonight of what was objectively a good government. So there's clearly some problems for the Liberal Party, and whilst the New South Wales Liberal Party is certainly performing better than the other states, you know, it's, it's difficult to admit you've got an ugly baby, and I think the Liberal Party needs to start having that conversation, because <laughs> we can't get elected, if we keep on going down this path, uh, changes need to be made and we need to get back to our core values, our enduring values. Uh, we need to cast the net wide in the um, Howard and Menzies tradition and stop 
making litmus tests of what it means to be a Liberal uh, and, and sort of saying that, you know, these people don't fit the Liberal Party ideal. I want you to pick up on what Matt Keane was talking about a moment ago, about whether the Liberal brand needs a rethink here. It, well, well, the values don't. The values are enduring. I think we've strayed for some of those values, not so much in New South Wales, but as a party as a whole. Uh, and we need, to, we need to make that change and we're running out of time. And I think, you know, people like to say existential crisis. That's perhaps uh, an exaggeration, but it's not too far from that. I'm just going to jump in, ugly baby. Um, how many people are going to hold that? How many people are going to share that view? Oh, I think there's a growing acceptance in the party that, um, you know, we're, 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 the results speak for themselves. I mean, you simply can't sit there and sort of say that, you know, we've got Labor on the ropes in, in Australia. We don't. Matt Keane's not agreeing with you. He's, um, he's downplaying it compared to, compared to that really cry from the heart that you well, just gave, Tony. I, I think Matt's talking more about New South Wales and the New South Wales result was not a disaster. Mm. You know, and I think it's going to become, as I said, a few of these seats will come in. But there's still, there's still hard conversations that need to be had. And I think Matt's alluded to that. Uh, we need to pitch to a wider group. We need to speak to new constituencies. I think we're narrowing our base. Our base, as Cos has discussed a lot tonight, is uh, over 50s uh, asset owners. And, um, you know, we need to cast wider. Uh, Cos, can I bring you in on this flank that Labor's managed to pick up here? This is a whole new group of people, a whole new demographic that Labor's reached out to. What's happened here? Uh, one of the most dominant uh, worker cohorts within these seats are public sector workers. So New South Wales has around 400,000 public sector workers. 65% of them are women. Uh, a third of them are under the age of 35. They are effectively now become, across the country, but in particular New South Wales and Victoria, Labor's new working class. I know there's always a lot of attention uh, in the media and within the broader political world around what is Labor's working class. Uh, there's a slow realisation that this particular group, largely females, tertiary educated, are, are overwhelmingly the, the biggest supporters of the red side of politics. It's yet to be seen how Labor deals with this problem though, right? Because it hasn't really resolved this question of lifting the public sector cap and where does it go from there? Is it opening up expectations to a point that it can't meet? It's, it's more about if you, if you tell workers that you're going to cap their wages, you're telling them you're not in their corner. They don't expect miracles to happen. And a lot of the research we do, it tells us that. They know how hard it is for governments to balance the books. They just want you to try. And if you give up trying, they're going to punish you at the ballot box. Cos and Tony, thank you both for being here. It's been terrific having you. I just want to point out one other thing. We began the night with the seat of Cogra held by the Labor Party on a margin of 0.1%. It finishes the night way over here. Where is it? Cogra, Cogra, Cogra. I can't find it. There we go. Top of that. that right there. It's become one of the safest seats for the Labor Party after tonight's results. So a very, very good night for Chris Minns. Back to you, Sarah, David. Thank you very much indeed, Jeremy. Yeah, and we're going to go to Anthony, I think, for his final summary. And from all of us to Anthony Green, another extraordinary performance. Exquisite, fine, funny, brilliant. None of us <laughs> knows how you do it. Over to you, pal. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I'll just blush here for the moment. Mm. Um, the seats which are definitely won, we, we, we're pretty confident Labor's got 47. We're pretty confident they've reached that bare majority. Um, I think there's one or two seats there, like Ride, which might come in narrowing. But I think what I'll do now is I'll show we're currently predicting they may end up with 50. Now, I do think there's one or two seats that are coming down, but look, Labor, if it doesn't reach 47, if it stops on 45 or 46, we'll have no difficulty governing. Um, and uh, there's enough cross benches and the Greens there, they will have enough groups to work with. So Labor's definitely comfortably in office. And in some ways, it's the same position as the current parliament. The government has had a, not a particularly good parliamentary position for several years, but the coalition was able to govern because Labor only had 38 seats. In fixed term parliaments, you have to have an alternative government if you bring down a government. And there wasn't one in the old parliament and there won't be one in this one. The coalition can't get together with the cross pension form government in its next parliament. So that's the position. Now, uh, what I wanted to do, we'll do the, the votes and then the seats which have changed at this election. Um, 
It's settled in the coalition on about 34% combined, the Labor Party on 37. I can't remember which pollster had something like that in terms of the figures. The Greens 10. One Nation and Shooters, Fishers and Farmers, they don't contest all seats. Big vote there for others. There's lots of independents. And the Sustainable Australia Party managed to get to 2% of this election by standing 80 candidates. The change in vote that's occurred since the last election is that, um, come on, you're getting a bit touchy at this time of night. No, no, I don't want the black dot. Come on. No, it's not going to do it. Uh, that's what I was trying to do, the change in vote. I was hitting the wrong button. It's getting late. <laughs> Labor Party vote up, down. <laughs> Liberal and Nationals down. Rise in the others. Two-party preferred swing across the state is uh, 7%. So that's above what Labor needed. And, uh, and, and, and they've got the seats they needed. Uh, what I wanted to look at was the seats which are changing. And we've got quite a list of changing seats. We've got Labor's gained Camden. East Hills, they've won Heathcote, which they gained notionally through the redistribution. they won Monero, Parramatta, Penrith, Riverston. I think Ride, I've got a little bit of doubt over. South Coast, they've won, I'm pretty sure about Terrigal. And the Indi Independent has gained Wakehurst, that's the end of the list. And the seats that remain in doubt, it's up here, is we've got Labour ahead in Goulburn. They're ahead in Holsworth. This, that one's was, has come back from earlier. It was looking like a Labour gain. Kayama Labor's ahead, though I think they're probably, we just, we're a little unsure about that, so we've taken it out of the definite. But I think Gareth Ward is in second place, and I don't think he can win from there. Uh, Miranda, the Liberals are ahead, that's firmed up for them. Labor's ahead in Oatley, but I'm, they're not far enough ahead to be certain of winning. The Liberals are ahead in Pitwood, has improved, independent ahead in Willoughby. Winston Hills has improved greatly in the Liberal Party, and now ahead in Winston Hills. Mm -hmm. And Wallandilly, the Independent, is ahead. Uh, though that's, uh, that's going to take quite a bit of counting, that one, because the highest vote on first preferences was the Liberal. Now, I seem to remember, do I have a, a seat run? I'll ask my producers back here. We go to the map for that. There's a seat run. Yeah, we wanted to discuss Goulburn. Uh, Labor lost Goulburn in 1965 and hasn't come close to winning it since. Wendy Tuckerman's on 39.6, Michael Pilbrow 35.8, Shooters, Fishers and Farmers on 13 and 7 with the Greens. Uh, if we look at the two-party preferred swing that's occurring there at the moment, it's getting rather touchy towards the end of the night. <laughs> 3.8% swing and Labor's just ahead. So it's only 51% counting, so there's a lot of pre-polls. Uh, I, mm. I can't remember which pre-poll they counted. There's a pre-poll in Crookwell for the first time in this election. So there's a few things which might bring that one back in. Mm. We've got Holsworthy. As I said, that one really tightened up um, after looking like Labor was winning earlier. There's a 3% gap there. Depending on where the figures are from, there's a 6.7% swing. Labor is just ahead. I don't think we've got 527 You'd need to know which pre-polls are still to come in a district like that. I mean, um, because there's multiple pre-polls this time, there's pre-polls from different parts of the electorate, and they're in areas where we had nothing last time, so mm. it's a bit hard to know. And Oatley, uh, we've got Oatley as well, yes, Mark Kure. Hooray for Kure. I learned that last time off uh, <laughs> one of the previous lectures. She, he, she's, he's 5% ahead of uh, his Labor opponent. And on those raw numbers, I don't see how he loses, but I think the two-party preferred swing is 7.4. Labor's just ahead. That is an electorate with two ends. He's got multiple pre-polls, a lot of counting in that electorate. And the last one we'll do here is Kayama Gareth Ward. Now he's ahead on first preferences now, but Labor's on 34.3 and it's 12% with the Greens. That gap can easily close. Melanie Gibbons has finished fourth and 11%, uh, a late rope in there. And the two-party preferred swing is 13.6 against Gareth Ward's margin last time. So um, that's only 40%. Some of the preference counts to come are the Nowra booths. I've got the suspicion that Gareth might do better at that. No, I'm really not sure. Oh, but there's a lot more counting to come mm, on that. So there's a few of these seats where um, the count no, is fine. low, which makes it hard to be definitive mm -hmm. on a few things. Thank you. Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. <laughs> An extraordinary performance. Thank you. Well, Chris Minns is set <laughs> to become the 47th Premier of New South Wales and is vowing to get straight to work for just the third time since the Second World War. Labor has won government from opposition, bringing an end to the Coalition's 12-year reign in Australia's most populous state. The people of New South Wales have changed their government, but they've also raised questions for the Federal Liberal Party, for the Liberal Party across the country, rather, after defeats federally and in Victoria. Brand Liberal is in trouble. At a state level in New South Wales, they need a new leader. Dominic Perrottet used his concession speech to also stand down as Liberal leader. 
The ABC is projecting, as we saw, that Labor's won 47 seats. That's what's needed for a majority. Counting over coming days will determine just how big that majority turns out to be. Tonight's result means Labor is now in power in every state and territory in the mainland. That brings to an end our coverage of New South Wales Votes 2023. Thanks to our chief election analyst, the inimitable, as I said, Anthony Green. And our panel, Matt Keane, Penny Sharp, and earlier in the evening, Di Lee, Jenny Leong, as well as our state political reporter, Ashley Raper, Jeremy Fernandez at the big board, Cos Samaris and Tony Barry, thank you. You can keep up to date with the latest results on the ABC News website. And join me for a special <laughs> edition of Insiders tomorrow from 9am. From the ABC Election Centre, good night. Good night.